Do you want to be a part of the Cocoa community? Sure, we all do. So join this free weekly live talk show to find out how easy it is to watch at home and learn about your color computer. At the Cocoa Nation, more than 9 million men and women have participated in the community without setting foot outside their homes. And now at home in your spare time, you can see what's happening or even join the discussion. Choose from any one of these segments. Panel intros, project updates, acquisitions, Cocoa Thoughts, featured interviews and events, the Game On Challenge, news, Ron's Garage, Cocoa Commercials, show coverage, panel goodbyes, or you can join one of our extra shows. You can choose from the Game On Challenge Live or Cocoa Tech. Join the Coco Nation right now. Click the link for the free information TJB Chris spoke about. Then decide if you want to watch the Coco Nation Live Show, the world's leading live weekly talk show featuring the Tandy Color computer, its siblings, cousins, and redheaded stepchildren. Visit thecoconation.com. There is no obligation and no salesman will visit you. Visit thecoconation.com. The Coco Nation Show is an unscripted, live, and interactive broadcast. Anything can and will happen. The views and opinions expressed by members of the panel and the live audience are their own, and not necessarily those of the Coco Nation Show, its sponsors, affiliates, or subsidiaries. Open minds are encouraged, and a sense of humor is recommended. Thank you for being a part of the Coco Nation. Radio Shack. Uh, okay. What? The 80s called.
Welcome to the Coco Nation, the world's first live and interactive talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer and its hardware cousins. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Coco Nation show. Episode three fifty seven. Gee, I forgot. I think something it still earlier. says three fifty six in the bottom, doesn't it? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Gee, I forgot something Oops. earlier. One of them numbers. Yeah. yeah. So it's a number. Let's see. I gotta go over here, and not that one. Anyway, till I fix that. Um, introductions. Uh, today's uh, actually today we have a um, special interview with the uh, Pixel Addit magazine. And later on in the show, when uh, all of the uh, interviewees arrive, we will do that. Meanwhile, let's do some panel introductions. Yours truly in the upper left-hand corner. Then we have Rick Uland. Welcome to the Rumored Show 357, folks. <laughs> I was like, where's the volume here? Okay, next over, Ken Waters. Woohoo! I am... I've made it. I'm in the top row. Three. <laughs> That's right. And one third of the uh, Pixel Attic crew, we got Tom Williamson. Hello. Good afternoon. Or should I say good evening, everybody? It's it spans it's the globe. <laughs> or it's early in the morning. Or it's early in, in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where, where Nick is in Australia. Or it's morning in uh, Western Canada, too. So, if it's earlier see. in Australia and it's tomorrow. Right. So, uh, let's see. Next up, we get Henry Gernhard. Hi, folks. Welcome to the Coco Nation. My name's Henry, and today it's five o'clock somewhere. Yeah, where's that beer? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next over, L. Curtis Boyle. Welcome to the show, everyone. All right. And we got Jason, CocoMan.biz. Dot biz indeed, and everybody, it's time to follow your fun compass, but watch out for that magnetic flux right over there with Mr. Dave. Lab. But I've got my water, I've got my diet, Dr. Pepper, and I'm ready to start. And next over is David Ladd. Why, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's show. I hope you're ready. We're getting ready for this interview, and I hope you are ready to join us. Okay, next row we got Ron Delvo. In the nation and online. And we got Nick Morentes, not on last the, today. On the ass end of the list is me. <laughs> <laughs> now we got one more not to go. Quite. And joining us again is Bob Emery. Howdy, folks. Welcome, and I hope I can stick around. My connection's pretty flaky today. Okay. Yeah, mine was flaky a little... something you want in a biscuit, not in a... Not in a right. not in, yeah. Not in a a AT&T connection. was a little shaky last night, but I guess they got that worked out. Uh, let's see. In the chat, we got... Kevin Holloway, The Breaky, Sixy, Tim Franklin, Coco Living... Jim Rye, Martin Parker, Spenny 108, Tom Eric Gunderson, Mark Siegel, uh, Brian Weasler, who should be on the show. Um, <laughs> he's Scott he, he's, Cooper. he's on the road. He's trucking. Oh, Probably another lo truckload of cocoa stuff. I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm speculating. Okay. And then Carrie Shrug just popped up. All right. I like the fact that Sixy Karen from the UK as well is in there and saying the beer is very much ready. Oh, so he knows how to prepare yeah. for our show. <laughs> and and we have to correct yep. Mark here. It's it's Carrie Shug with no R. I dated a girl named Carrie Shrug once. And uh, you're really confusing me with that name. <laughs> I've had plenty of women shrug at me. Yeah, well, it's, it's not a show if I don't mispronounce at least somebody's name. Well, I understand, but you're getting me worried every week. She's here. Oh, <laughs> we should we should we should have a counter of how many uh how many times mark mispronounces a name although it'd be coco nation bingo type of thing you could fill a card you <laughs> win a prize i'm gonna get one of those hand clickers it's click but it only has three digits on it mark so 
just just like every time we see we facts, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Nick, Nick Morandi's, you've got this <laughs> score routine in your pinball game that rotates a counter. You could use that to count all of Mark's uh, mispronunciations. In the, in the show yeah. order. Uh, With little pinball think... sounds every time it happens. Ding, ding, I'll ding, add... ding. I'll have <laughs> to it... add an extra digit then. <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to exceed the 16-bit register? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'll so, just switch to a 6309 and have the whole 32-bit register to go. deal with. <laughs> and even then, it's kind of so-so. Oh, Sleepy just joined, too, or is joining. Yeah, trying to. Let's see. Hello, Sleepy. Oh, so Dave Veery is in the chat now, too. Okay, let's see. First up today, uh, project updates and acquisitions. Let's see, David. Hi, hello, everyone. So, yeah, I might as well start it off. So one of the things I got in this last week in the mail was um, Retro Rewind's version of the um, di diagnostic cart. And so now I've got both versions, the one from Ian and Retro Rewind. And no, Curtis, I haven't tested it yet. I've been busy with the MM1. Uh, and we then, expect a full report next week. Uh, <laughs> right. we'll Detailed right in triplicate. Okay. And then, oh, my goodness gracious, this thing's heavy. Ooh. I got another nice little gift in the mail. And that goes which it looks like a PC, at least from the front, but it's not a PC. So and then little, from the side. It's a bit floppy heavy. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> so this this showed up in in the mail, except without the floppy drives. I had to provide those. But um it's an old CD duplicator, and someone oh. print 3D printed <laughs> the filler plates. The top one's got the voltages which this one is the 12, this one's the 5, and then this one's got Dave's Grease Weasel. And then, of course, it's got the uh, weasel right there. So top drive is a 5 and a quarter, 360. Center one is a 5 and a quarter, 1.2 high density. And then, of course, the bottom one is a 3 and a half inch high density. And on the inside, I still need to find a place to stick a Raspberry Pi and a Grease Weasel V4 and F1. Ugh. And some wheels so you can roll it around. <laughs> yeah, I need that on the other uh, full, full, full tower PC case I got in the other room. Actually, I think it already has wheels. Uh, but that's that's it for now. <laughs> uh, David, David, I might as well ask you now since we've got you kind of spotlighted here. Uh, you've been kind of working on the M1, as you mentioned, and you've actually got some other people with M1s have actually been getting stuff up and running too. And you guys have been going back and forth on the M1 group on Facebook. And I'm just wondering, do you kind of have an update on on where things are at? You found a bug in OSK's RBF for you know certain size drives, et cetera. But people have been trying to make boot disks back. And any updates well, on that, or just generally where you guys are at? Well. At least in my belief, it's an a bug in the RBF on version 2.4. Um, because certain sizes of volumes, when I format it, the format utility formats the volume correctly. It all the file allocation bits are all there, the directory structure is there. But when I start copying files, they'll copy a few and then I'll get the media's full. But yet the free utility says, and D-check both say, no, uh, there's plenty of space free. So um, I've been trying different size volumes, and some volumes seem to work fine, and others don't. It just depends on the size, how many sectors it has. Um, and then, of course, the, what was the other issue? I was, oh. Um, so OS 968K is supposed to be able to support multi-sized sectors. So you can do 256 byte all the way up to, I think, 8K sectors. And 
So far, I found out that the free utility blows up with a divide by zero when it's a 2K, 4K, or 8K sectors. And I'm like, yeah, mm, that's not good. So you broke but, OSK is what you're saying. Or may <laughs> have discovered an issue. I, 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 I believe there's a quote somewhere that you enjoy breaking stuff, so... Um, well, I yeah. always like pushing things. Um, now, I do have a real Quantum 840S that I've been playing with. And since that's technically a real hard drive, I can set it to the max um, logical sector numbers in, in a group and then just, you know, format that section. And I can still get OSK to go bonkers even with with that. So I know it's not a blue SCSI or SCSI to SD issue since I can reproduce it with a real hard disk. It's just, yeah. Now, from what I saw, one of the guys there actually has a version of OSK version three, which is a, a much hyped, much improved version. I think some stuff in RBF was some of the things they were advertising at the time. Have you been in contact with them to see if you can get a copy of that and see if that fixes, or does it require the 68340 upgrade or? I don't know because I'm trying to get in contact with um, Alan. Um, I I'm bad with with names. His last name. He's at at Microware currently. Uh, Adding get, Adinger or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to see if I can get a license for the current OSK. But the issue he says is is that I need the source code to all the drivers to build them. And he doesn't have those. He wouldn't. Because the MM1 was a third party. Oh, it was yeah. the, the responsibility oh, right. of IMS to build the drivers. Now, so, David Graham, I think he was the guy who was selling as Blackhawk Enterprises after Paul Ward and IMS pulled out of it and was selling the upgrade boards and stuff. Would he have a source? I don't know. I haven't gotten that far to ask him yet. I've been... Okay. Um, let's just give you an idea. I had two terminal windows open through the two serial ports on my MM1. And I was formatting multiple SCSI devices at the exact same time, um, trying to just stress the system in multiple ways. So, um, yeah, I've been kind of... And, and so that's what you do on a Friday night, David? Oh, I do that every night. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> you're you're a scary man, so Mr. Wrong. David Ladd. <laughs> hey, you know, formatting SCSI drives, you know, you just... You, you, you just got to enjoy it. Now, if I had a Mac SE or a Mac Classic or, um, you know, one of the early Macs, I might be might be stressing a blue SCSI on those, too, because I like pushing everything SCSI. <laughs> I think we have a commercial come to, that's, uh, uh talks about what did David break today? Mm. Yeah, but the, we haven't in used that in a long time. I can yeah. hook up with a Mac SE if you want one. <laughs> well, um, like I said, we could discuss that if you happen to make it to Coco Fest. Yeah. Um, yeah, I almost definitely will. Okay. So otherwise, you know, I don't really have anything else new. Um, I've just, you know, been going through floppy... Well, re going through floppy drives to find out which ones are um, working, which ones are 360K, and which ones are high density. And unfortunately, it looks like I only have this one 360K that's working that's in my grease weasel contraption at the moment. Okay. And for some reason, <laughs> these, these flippers keep wanting to buy up all the 360K drives that. Um, the Coco Fest auction, so I can never seem to get any 360K drives. Also, I just did bring Tom Williamson into what we're talking about here because he's probably never heard of the MM1. <laughs> <clears throat> the uh, MM1 was one of the supposed Coco 4s that some third parties tried to make after Tandy dropped the Coco 3, or the Coco in general. And uh, it was probably the most successful of the three main ones that came out. And it was an OS 9 68000 base version. It used a 68070 Signetics chip and plus their graphics controller. So it actually had, you know, Amiga style capabilities. Um, the 68070 was also using, what is it, the CD Interactive? If you you guys might have had that in England, uh, might have been uh, sold there. 
Was that Phillips did it, I think. Phillips, yes, yes, we yeah. did, yes, yes. Yeah, it was basically the same hardware base as those, um, but it was meant to be running an OS nine style system, OS nine sixty eight. So it's a sixteen bit machine, was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, there was an upgrade with a 68340. Is that technically a 32-bit David Ladder? Is that still 16 technically? Um, since my backplane only has two sims, I'm assuming it's probably 16, 16 bit. Because normally, depending on the CPU, you have to have um so many you sims. Have lines for so yeah. and uh, the sims that's in this um or the four meg unit so um but yeah it's a uh, it'd be it could be like the 6809 where it's kind of like technically it's an 8-bit chip it's got a lot of 16-bit internal and it's probably the 6340 i'm guessing is more 32-bit internal than 16 but the you know the data lines and stuff are probably 16 um i'm going to go with probably since uh, <laughs> i i really didn't do any assembly at all on the mm1 i wanted to um one of the people here in Omaha that had um, the 60070 MM1, he had one of the Magneto drives, which I so wanted one of those, because they could do, what was it, the 100, 100 meg disks? And then it looked like a uh, could also read and write to high density, three and a halfs as well. Um, but yeah, he did a lot of uh, 68,000 assembly. So, Another place to look for those drivers, possibly. Maybe we should see if we can get a hold of Kevin Darling. I know he's active on Facebook. He won't talk to me, unfortunately, but maybe Scott or somebody can, James Jones, Curtis, maybe can get a hold of him. What did you do, Kevin? I have no idea. We talked at shows back in the 90s quite a bit, and I, he won't respond either on LinkedIn or Facebook now. I know he's kind of got a whole new life. He's got a, you know, a wife and kids now, too, so maybe that's just doesn't want to deal with all this retro stuff i don't know but yeah that's Thanks. also the other thing is another friend of mine here locally has a mm1 but it's got a 68 340 and of course he's got his original floppies except for the disc that would have all of all of the modules for the 68 340 and um, one of the archives off of Facebook has the different modules, except I couldn't find the kernel, the 68340 version of the kernel. So, of course, if you don't have all of the required 68340 modules, the boot ROM knows that you don't have the correct boot, mo boot file, and it will just reject to load the boot file. So... Can't get that MM1 running without, you know, all of the. Oh, I hope David Graham's the same is a person that ran Blackhawk that I'm thinking of because he probably would have have them or he'd have be the best bet to get them anyway. And he's actually active on that group. So, oh, trust me, I know. I've been getting replies on my certain findings. So okay, yes, cool. <laughs> so just quickly, just sorry, just to clarify for me, the MM1 did it actually make it to market? Or was it just a, as a number of prototypes? Um, as far as I know, there's Went probably to were a few hundred. Oh, right. Okay. So it did actually yeah, around five hundred, I yeah. think, were sold. Yeah. If I remember. Yeah, it's there, uh, there were uh, like I said, in the there, magazines. Yeah, there was three in Omaha. No. Let's hear Rich had one. So f at least four people in the Omaha area had had one that I know yeah. of. Um, I know there's some in Australia too. Uh, Bob, uh, what was his name, Nick? One of the main yeah, gurus right? in Australia. He had one too, which yeah, I think Nick actually Nick be. is in possession of it right now, except Nick's yeah. having a nap. So yeah, Nick, Nick well, fell early. back to sleep. So um, it's early there. I can give him. Yeah. Um, so right now. The other thing with the MM1 I'm trying to do is find a way that I can get video output that is clean enough that I can capture it to then show you guys. Because right now, I can't do HDMI. I've been trying. The um, Obviously, Nick has run into this issue with his one SCART monitor. Is It's RGB, horizontal, vertical sync, just like the Coco. And of course, it does not have a composite output for 
a sink. So can't use the standard SCART cables to use one of yeah. the SCART to HDMI boxes. So there's been several circuits for doing composite sync from horizontal vertical for doing a combiner. Um, I ordered Jason shaking his head. He doesn't believe you. Yeah. Oh, I I've, believe I, I believe it. We've discussed this, but it, it's just uh, with those like forty dollar range SCART boxes. They don't like the combined sync. They they'll they'll use it, but that blue display keeps coming on there because I I played around with that for a bit, and uh, maybe David will find something different. But uh, everything I've read just goes. It, I, I wish you luck, David, but I don't think it's going to work. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I also found another device, which of course happens to be in the UK. There's this uh, um, device that goes on the SCART, and it's a LM1881, I believe. And I found it on a, a, a UK site, and it's to remove all of the other composite video information and strictly filters that out and outputs a clean composite sync signal only. Um, for use on the SCART. And I looked at that and I'm like, I wonder if I could do a sync combiner and then merge it with that chip to then filter it even further to try to make it better. But that's just another chip and more components to add to do some testing. And yeah. Now, now that I would like to see if that works, uh, but uh, just everything I've read and everything I've tried just, uh, but that, it, it it doesn't like the combined sync. So maybe there is something else in there other than just plain composite sync. And maybe that's what's uh, confusing the boxes because it, it, it kind of works. Well, well, I'll just so mention, Carrie, Shug in the chat asks, you can't just get a USB device to capture an old analog TV signal. This is not analog TV. This is analog RGB, 15.75 uh, kilohertz. There is no composite. There's no TV out on the MM1. Yeah. Now there is now would, it, would an RGB to VGA like the older stuff we used to have in the Cocoa work if it went directly to VGA? Um that you should so, be able to capture, I would imagine. Well, you what? would think, but remember that one was an FPGA and it was also specifically designed for the Cocoa's resolutions. And the MM1 supports the same resolutions that the CDI did, which was both um progressive and interlaced video modes which the Coco didn't have the, the those same type of video resolutions. Yeah, without a hack. Do. Yeah. So would, would it work um, on the ones that are compatible that don't have to interlace or progressive though? Like, could you run a 640 by 200 screen, for example, using that? I don't know. I've got one of those old RGB to VGA things, which uh, I just happen to have right here. So yeah, I've got one. So just happen to have that laying around, huh? <laughs> well, it was sitting here because this is where I stole that one cable from before I got the replacement from you. <laughs> ah. So, hey Dave, but, yeah. What about one of these? An Extron uh, RGB to uh, DVI or HDMI? Um, I don't yeah. have one of those, so I couldn't uh -huh. tell you. The throw money at it option. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. I got these pretty cheap. Um, the expensive ones are like between 50 and 80 bucks, but uh, I got these for like $20, $25 each. I've got a bunch of them. Cool. Oh, Dave, cool. would you have uh, room to bring your M1 to the fest? And then if Sleepy brings one of those, you can try it out? Um, well, we'll see, because I still have to try to find out how to make a a mounting bracket or drill holes in the bottom of the case so I can mount the the blue SCSI to the bottom of the case. Because at the moment, I've got a Cyquist 44 in it, a Cyquist 88, and will be the blue SCSI, the GoTech, and a real floppy drive. So I've got pretty much every... Don't take this the wrong way. I've got pretty much every possible drive orifice filled. <laughs> <laughs> You're overshaking again, David. I I, I I would have worded that Open differently, David. Bays. <laughs> uh, 
hook up. Okay, well, well thanks for the update. Keep word. us posted. I would like to see if you guys can get OSK 3.0 running and the 6340 version. Maybe find the drivers from one of the people that might still have them. Because uh, I'd really like to see that up and running. I remember watching them at, at Coco Fest in the 90s, and they were pretty impressive machines for the time. So. Well, so would I. I need to um, at least try to get um, Eric's um, Gold Runner 2000 loaded on it and test it out since I've got the original discs that I have missing the fourth disc. And then, of course, the masters he sent me to image, which then I sent back the images to him. Um, but I've yet to actually try it out. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for the updates and all those different projects there. Uh, Mark, anybody else besides my little quick update or? Uh, no, uh, no, that's all I had on my list. Okay, <clears throat> so my update is basically on uh, Nitrous Nine Ease of Use one point oh one, which is basically bug fixes and a bunch of third party stuff added. Um, the six zero nine image is basically built. I've sent it out to three of the people that actually contributed to EOU one point oh one. So I think Fred Provencia, Wayne Campbell, and Mister Rick Euland, who's thankfully sitting down now, so I can talk to him about it. Um, so I sent that out uh, a few bit days back just for them to kind of like, you know, hit it a little bit. Uh, I've been busy with work and actually have to work this weekend, unfortunately, but then I'll be back on the 6809 version. Then I'll get the Game X versions done afterwards and then I pass the stuff off for the Matchbox, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, Rick, what's your first impressions? I, I mean, not a drastic amount of changes there, but, uh, and I know you haven't had too much time to play with it, but uh, what's your first impressions of it? Yeah, so I, I booted it up and I've run through it. Um... We've got uh, a little bit of multi-view. We've got my strange app, which is also running on it. So it's it seems to be not only does it run by itself, but I've dumped a lot of config files and so forth from the previous version of VOU onto it. And it seems to be tolerating it pretty well, except for a couple of changes that you've noted and you know, like MV file and so forth. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with the way it's going. and. Uh, like I say, everything's running. If you, if you want to bring up G Shell again, I'll just mention the one thing that you requested that's in there, and that's uh, you wanted the original icons as Tandy made them. So if you went into high-res 640 wide mode instead of 320, it kept the the get put buffers of the icons the same size, so they actually shrink you know, horizontally by half. I call them skinny or thin icons. Right, and sadly, um, I don't have the... Uh, I actually drew icons for that thin mode, but I don't have them loaded yet. It makes quite a different look. These were actually designed to be fat and chunky, and they're they're kind of they've got double pictures in the actual image, some places and so forth to, to reinforce the fat and chunky look. And uh, so they're kind of the icon image yeah. is fighting against the thin icon rendering. Uh, so she, I wish I'd got those done before the show. But in any case, um, everything seems to be working fine. It runs every app I've thrown at it. Um, so. Nice yeah, I'll continue with basic nine speed ups and stuff too. So that'll be something to look forward to for people. It it is actually um, moving at a good clip too because uh, not nice trash can. Yeah, some some <laughs> some, some talented artist threw that thing, didn't he? <laughs> and of course, now I talk about how good it's running, and it it just kind of stops. <laughs> well, it's loading those icons for the first time, so it's going to be a bit of a yeah. I haven't been anywhere yet, but uh, um, I mean, good work. It's. Uh, and did you try the new period shortcut? Oh yeah, you can get back home with just a just a dot. So, so normally to go up a directory, there's that little close box up at the top on the uh, the bar that tells you what drive you're on, what path you're on. Uh, and one side effect of having the keyboard shortcut, which I didn't figure out until I tried it just recently, is that uh, because there's keyboard buffering, if you're say five levels deep into the games directory, you know, because it goes into subgenres and level one, level two, etc. You can tap the period button like three or four times and it'll actually go back each one and you don't have to sit there and keep clicking like you would on the mouse. So you can kind of pre-buffer that and jump back. So yeah. Oh yeah. We're gonna go dot and then show me the icon for deskmate. I haven't got deskmate working yet because I got to fix the other couple modules that also break <laughs> as part of deskmate. Oh, right. That was one I was nice. planning on doing, but because uh, I thought it was just the one program, the main program had to be changed. Nope. 
Yeah, Decimate was once fixed with the House of Cards and Jello, but uh, <laughs> yeah, because Decimate's literally like ten mini apps all combined, and they keep running each other. And, right. and if I don't fix them all, they will start crashing. And if so. you fix them the way they fixed it last time, they weren't really useful because you've used up the entire Kobo just to get the stupid app running without yeah. actually doing anything with that app. So, yeah, good luck. <laughs> All right, 6809 version will be next. Um, I, my plan of release, I'm, I, I think I tentatively put in the startup file April 7th or something, because I'm hoping if I can get the 6809 version done by then, that'll be at least the two base models for the Coke SDC and the emulators. And then I'll do the Gimme X ones, because there's not a ton of people have Gimme Xs, so that can wait a little bit. And then I'll pass off to uh, Bill Noble for the Matchbox and Mikey for the uh, x Roar and... I can't remember what the other version was. He does a couple versions too because the, the hard drive drivers are different than my default stuff. And I don't have the hardware to test it here, so I let them them do does that. He, does he do the Pi? Yeah, Pi. That's the other one, I think. Yeah. It's a Pi and XOR because XOR, I believe, uses the IDE driver. And I no longer have an IDE interface what? to test that with. So Anyway, look forward to that coming up. I'm planning on releasing it not at the fest, but before the fest, because I'd like people to have a couple of weeks to fiddle with it. And then they when they come to the fest, they can ask me questions about you know actually running it rather than just what did you add. And also if there's any bug reports, you guys can dump them all on me at the fest, which I'll promptly ignore until after I get home. <laughs> I'll bring a big sack. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's my project update. Finally, it's only a you know half a year later than I was originally planning. Okay, well that was all of the uh, uh, acquisitions and updates I had on my list. anybody else have any? Just the Go one on. that I live with. Uh, uh, okay, so, so how's Missy doing? Uh, she's doing much better. Um, she uh, was released around. Uh, I guess it was about 4 5 o'clock Thursday, went to her parents' house. We stayed there until Friday. We went to the doctor for her after. Everything looked good. And uh, she came home uh, yesterday around 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock, one of those. And she's doing all right. She's avoiding uh, cameras at the moment. Understandable. Okay. So she's up in the bedroom watching TV and sleeping. Um, only real issue that she's having is she's having a bit of pain because she's supposed to be sitting up while she sleeps and she can't sit up while she sleeps <laughs> and she keeps going down, down the, I got her this big dinosaur pillow and she keeps sliding down it until just her head's on it, which bends her neck in an odd way, which is creating a little bit of pain. But other than that, she's doing quite well. Oh, good to hear. So... Uh, but she should be she should be used to pain as in the neck. Ah! No, <clears throat> lower. <laughs> oh, Even lower better. back. Yes. Lower than that. <laughs> yeah. Foot I'm pain. pain. I'm more of a pain in the higher lower than back that. <laughs> in the upper back. Oh. Oh, knee pain. <sighs> so. All right. Uh did we want to do Commercial break and then do the game on results. I, I would go straight to game on. We've only been on the air half an hour. Okay. <laughs> Seems tw at least twice as long. <laughs> yeah. Right. Let's see. All right. Let's see. Where's my button? Here we go. Welcome, everybody, to the Coco Nation Game On Challenge of the Week results video. This week we played Mind Roll. We had a total of eight players. We had Tasman with 16, Micro Hobbyist 45, Sabhead 71, Kasiran San 82, L. Curtis Boyle 103. Mr. Dave 6309, 108. Dr. Ted, 110. And this week's number one score is... K. 
Canadian Retro Things with 122. Thanks, everybody rigged. that played. We'll see you again <laughs> next week. I want to recount. <laughs> and the Cocoa Nation salutes Canadian Retro Things. Yeah, Salud. great. Salud. Wonderful. <laughs> Good day. <laughs> eh? So I've discovered the secret here. I just have to pick a game that nobody wants to play, and I can win. <laughs> Now that was one hey, low hey, scoring hey. game. Next week, hey, Predator. I, I was kind of busy, so sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah I, I honestly, it. like the, the worst thing about that game in particular, the game itself is actually good. I don't, I don't mind the game at all. Once you get the fixed version, not that stupid cartridge version. <clears throat> but the problem is, is that uh, it doesn't let keep the score on the screen when you die. Yeah. It just, it's gone. I actually yeah. scored 111, but I can't prove it. Mm-hmm. that's um that's yeah there's a few games that are like that uh you just gotta learn to record yourself playing and then grab a screenshot from that or do it live on the game on challenge live <laughs> and then you can screenshot from that that's what i did mm-hmm. but there is my tip for the day for when we're playing <laughs> games like this if you're on the game on challenge live you can just go back in the footage and get your score yeah, I remember back in the day when I played it, you know, skipping level one because it didn't work on the original cartridge. I actually got a lot better than I was this time. But there's like the key, the second level plane, I think you have to get them in a certain order to unlock the doors. And if you don't remember that, yeah. you'll never do it in time. So I've completely forgotten all of that. And if I had notes, I've lost those. So that didn't help. Yeah, the first level was the only one I could beat. And then I just uh, played other levels and found the one that I could get a few points on. And that's how I scored them. I'm trying to remember for for Tom, like Mind Roll is the name of it on some platforms in the States, but in the UK and Europe, it was actually under a different name by the same company. It's the same game. Yeah. Um, I found a website that talks about that. Um, wasn't it, wasn't it called Eyeball? There we go. So uh, QDEX on other platforms. So that game you heard of, Tom, or were you back in the uh, late 80s era of gaming? Uh, well, first, well, considering it was released the year I was born, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say, slacker. No. You didn't play it in utero, is what you're saying. No, because <laughs> so. it was on oh. Commodore 64. I think it was. Was it on the yeah. Amiga too? It was, it was on, on the, the Amiga, Amiga the PC. It sounds familiar. I might have come across it kind of in more recent times. Uh, can't say I've played it. It's yeah, and as Jason was game. referring to earlier, like it's an eight ball that you're controlling in the Coco version, but in the Amiga version, it's a literal eyeball. Yeah. Now, what I think is interesting from uh, Curtis's website here is that you included the tested by. Were you like calling those people out? Because you don't usually have a tested by thing under the author. I usually don't have that information, so I usually can't. Um, oh, okay, but this this one actually listed who the testers were, or at least there was an article I found on the web or something that did that. Oh, those poor guys, right? <laughs> Name forever. <laughs> I mean, except for the the very first level, the very first screen you get on where you get stuck forever, it you know it works. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't know, like I said last week, that might have been that they tested that level first and it was working yeah, fine. They, they found a bug later on. They fixed that, it. broke this, didn't go back to check. Who knows? But I think that's the golden rule of if you're a game designer and you fix something somewhere in the game, go back and test everything. Because Yes, regression testing is evil, but necessary. Well, let's act- actually ask a professional game designer. Uh, Nick Morentes, what is your view on that? Uh, what bugs? Don't screw it up. I get it. Good plan. No, during development, I mean, this okay. is you know, the, so what do you when mean you're by adding professional? a feature, do you go back and test the earlier parts of the game to make sure that that feature didn't change anything? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do fairly uh, intensive uh, game testing, and um, I do play it a fair bit. And then before I actually release it, I usually get someone like uh, Buck Owen or. Uh, well, who's the other fellow who's really good? Tasman. 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 And I get them to flog it as much as they can. And uh, they they often find some um, unexpected uh, Features. functionality. That Features, I'll, I'll... yeah. 
So probably so, a feature like they had on screen one of level one wouldn't have gotten by you. Not that no, no, that one's that one's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> that one's really bad. Actually, out of all the Coco games, there's, there's been a few with bugs. Like there's a, the your first version of Trapfall had a bug where if you jumped at a certain point, you would drop down about six pixels, and then the game couldn't register any hits. You couldn't yeah. get past pits. Everything else had to do one point one fix for that one. That was probably the worst one besides the one here. Because in this one, I you literally cannot complete level one. Trapfall on the version of Trapfall, you can still do that on. It's on the um, uh, archive. Oh, I and thought they, they had the one point one version there too, didn't they? Oh, I think. Well, I think they have both versions because I think yeah. somebody was playing it during the game on, and uh, they got trapped in that. <laughs> yeah, because we we bought that one originally for our computer club, uh, Saskatoon Color Computer Club. So we actually paid for it and got the buggy one. So that one I was quite familiar with. Has anyone done a deep dive into uh, the uh, cartridge version to see what the actual bug is that causes it to not? I haven't had time. Break? I don't know if anybody else has. So okay. Obviously, somebody did because they fixed Go it. Go ahead, Sloopy. Right. It's been fixed once. So I don't even know who fixed it. Like I, I, I didn't know there was a fixed version out there until you brought it up, Ken. Yeah. I had no idea. I didn't know there was a broken version out there because I'd never tried the cartridge version before. <laughs> As far as I know, every single one that Radio Shack sold uh, was buggy. <laughs> All right, well, uh, tips and tricks for the game. Obviously, you just have to learn the levels. Yeah. So Now, I do have one question for you, Ken, because um, I was trying it both ways, and I'm kind of undecided. Uh, it has the option for both keyboard and joystick controls. And there's a bit of momentum to the ball. Like, you can't stop on a yeah. dime. You can't turn on a dime. Um, I did find, for me personally, I think I would favor the keyboard a tiny bit because I seem to have a bit more accuracy, like let go of the key and slow down rather than, you know, move the joystick, which seemed to have a little bit of analog controllers to it. So it might, you know, go faster or slower rather mm -hmm. than come to a stop. What was your preferred way of playing? I never tried the keyboard. Um, I was actually playing it all on the uh, on VCC. So I was using um, an Xbox controller. And that way I could just use the thumbstick, which I found really quite easy to control it with. Okay. I, I was using my deluxe joystick and it, it, you know, the craft joystick clone and it, 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 it felt pretty good, but I was really having trouble ones with those flashing squares. You have to like yeah. you go and hit in a time limit type thing. I was, or even that slalom course in level one, like I was having problems it overshooting is... all the time and stuff. The keyboard, I yeah. seemed to do a little bit better. Um, I, f I found with the thumbstick, I did, I think I, when I first tried it, I used my, I played it on real hardware um, on my uh, Color Computer 3 and using a Tandy joystick. And I don't think I did nearly as well as with the uh, thumbsticks, so. Okay. So, I don't know. That's just, I'm fairly comfortable with playing with either version, but. Um, I did not try the keyboard. Okay. Uh, and then a second question, because you're allowed to start on whatever plane you want, you don't have to start on the first one and work your way through, which is damn good because otherwise I wouldn't have played it at all back in the day because I couldn't get past level one or zero. Um, did you skip ahead some of the levels, Ken? And if you did, yes. what was your favorite, either thematically or cool? Or um, whatever? The only other level I could beat was level seven. And so one and seven were the only ones I could beat, but I could never do them con consecutively. Okay. Actually, if you want, bring up uh, my page, because I think I have screenshots of at least one screen off oh, every okay. level just to show uh, people what it is and you kind of explain it. Where did it go? There we go. Um, so seven is... That one, I think, yeah. This one right, right here? The pinkish one. Yeah, I think that's the one I was playing. Anyway. Um... So there's a whole bunch of goals, and I think you had to try to avoid hitting them because you had to collect things or something? I can't even no, remember. No, that, that wasn't the level I was playing then. Okay, it must have been level eight. Oh, okay. That I beat. It's the one where you had to race the uh, the floor was disappearing Oh right, thing, <laughs> and you had to race around. Yeah, I remember that one now. <laughs> so I, 
beat that one a couple of times, but uh, only if I ever started on that level. And then I got, because uh, as I talked about last week, an interesting thing about the game is that it actually consecutively gets harder. So the, it's always the, um, like the difficulty ramps up as you complete levels, not by which level you're on. So if you played level eight at the beginning, it's a lot easier than if you played it as the fourth or fifth level that you were playing. Okay, so it ramps up as you continue on. Because one thing yeah. that I forgot about and confused me at first is I completed Plane Zero, the fixed version, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it took me back to the main menu, and I thought you you only saw one at a time, and then you're done the game, but it actually carries your score over when you pick yeah. the next plane. So you can actually play the planes in any order you want, so... Yeah, and if you have a Coco 3, like most of these screenshots we're showing here at Coco 3, you can see there's, because this is running in a four-color mode, you'll notice that it's using different four colors for most of the levels so that you have yeah. some differentiation and themes. The Coco 1 and 2 version, which you can see right near the top, uh, the second row there, um, that's just using artifact colors. You're kind of stuck with black, uh, orange red, blue, and, and, and white for all mm -hmm. the levels. I, don't, so I quite like the game. Yeah. It's very low scoring. You can even see on the screenshots with the score. It only gives you three digits for scores, so they're not expecting you to get very high scores either. Yeah. I think the highest you can score is not even 100 points on each level. So, Anyway, um, yeah, so it's definitely a different style of game. It's more you definitely have to... Uh, solve puzzles in it rather than just straight up action so it's definitely a better game than what it it was when i first saw it anyway yeah it's certainly a game that um uh, i guess you could pick up and just play a level and spend some time trying to figure out how to beat it and whatnot yeah. and it, if you not... like a combination of arcade and puzzle yeah, it's, it's it's a good combo. Of those I, I don't even really know if it's all that much arcade. It's more. Yeah, well, like you're racing against a, timers, so there's that. You're racing you know, against time, yeah, but it's still just solving a puzzle. True. A time limit puzzle. Yeah. So yeah, that that's that game. Anybody else have any thoughts on the game? Who's, who's tried it either in the past or during the live game on challenge, which we'll be getting into shortly. Well, I, I don't work, this, didn't have time because he was away. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, I was going to say, um, from what I've seen just from the screenshots, uh, visually it does actually look very nice. I do like those games that present very well, and even with the limited color palettes, still do very nice, quite crisp graphics. And I can think of yeah. one or two like that. I've seen on various platforms that kind of take the limitations of the platform and do really nice things of it. And I think that's definitely one of them. So, yeah, I would agree. It's actually, it's one of the the most uh, visually striking games, I think, on the Coco 1 and 2 level hardware. Because uh, it gives get, you get the whole shadowed 3D look type thing. Mm. And it's, it's quite well done. Okay, on to the right. uh, live. Uh, well, no, first we'll talk about nope. the other game we Ooh. played, which oh, was right. Starblaze. So... As we had the wonderful reading of the instructions on the live game on challenge, then uh, it allowed people to figure out how to play the game because you have to use both the keyboard and the joystick for this. So it's kind yeah, of for those like who have not played it, it's kind of a limited Star Raiders, but instead yeah, of going Star to a 3D Raiders space, you're playing Defender. <laughs> Defender, yeah. So you're hopping from area to area and you're going along in just shooting all the aliens and trying to protect your uh, fuel depots and repair depots, which you need to use a lot because yeah. it's a, also a resource management. Cause I know like when Jim Rye was playing it on the live show, he kept running out of fuel cause you would forget to go and fill up and then you're dead in the water. Yeah. It, it was an interesting combo of those two themes, defender and uh, star Raiders. And I quite liked it. I think it's one of the most better games. <laughs> and it doesn't look too bad, even with the uh, four color standard yeah. four colors. It's actually quite well done. I like the way that uh, 
it's kind of like the split screen and your ship changes color when you go from the ground to the uh, sky. Yeah. yeah. That was actually one of, that was actually, I would say my favorite Coco game, that and uh, the Polaris clone that it had. Um, Star Blazer was, or Star Blaze was like by far my favorite one. I enjoyed the strategy of it. I enjoyed, um, you know, the fact that, that although it was a pew pewer, it wasn't all about pew pewing. And I was like 10, so it had warp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, for strategies for that game, as if you um, were watching the live game on show, um, I did give a really good strategy to the people that were watching, and I'm not going to tell you about it here, because if you weren't watching that show, too bad, you suck. Yeah, you should go watch it then. <laughs> <laughs> to, to the three or four people that were watching. <laughs> no, the good strategy is that if you ever get hit... Like, uh, you've got a shield, which will slowly go down if you get shot. But if you get hit by one of the alien ships, like if you run into them, your shield's completely gone. Immediately when that happens, hit the W key to warp out of there. And if you land in another sector that's got bad guys in it too, just warp out of there immediately. Because they will kill you while you're looking at your overhead map to try to find a place to go to repair. Yes, they will. So get to a clear area and then go into your map and then warp yourself to a repair station. Yeah, and and as you mentioned before, don't forget to refuel. Yeah, and those are two separate stations. You refuel at one location, but your repairs at a different one. So you can't do both at once. And That's you've the only got management. a couple of fuel stations. You've got a lot of repair stations, but only a couple of fuel ones. So protect the those. If there's aliens in those sectors, go to those sectors first, because if they blow up your fuel depots. It's gone forever. You're gone. Yep. <laughs> yep. They will they will destroy your fuel depots. So when fact, you, you watch on the radar screen, you can see you see them when the alien gets right near it, it just sits right beside it, just pounding yeah. it until oh, it just dies. shooting at it. When you warp, you it's not a random warp, is it? You actually choose only if you warp without going to your overhead screen. If you ah, just hit okay. W without uh picking a choosing a place, you randomly go somewhere. Right, but if you yeah. uh, choose the place, you go to that. Yeah. Right. So, so if you warp from the map, map you get to choose yeah. where you're going. If you warp without bringing the map up, it's random. Yeah. But definitely, um, randomly warping somewhere because they cannot shoot you while you're in warp, but you can shoot them. <laughs> so that's another thing that I was I was uh, hint, hint that I hint that I gave. Was that when you're warping, if you line yourself up on your radar screen with ships and you start firing, you can shoot them while you're uh, leaving the planet or whatever the sector that you're in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, Jim Ryan, the, uh, the chat says my shield did not go down slowly. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you if you use your ship as a battering ram, then your shield's going to go down quickly. <laughs> And of course, as as explained earlier, uh, Sloopy was not able to participate in the in the uh, the challenge this week, so Ken was hosting. So thanks, Ken. I think was oh, Jim kind of co-host. Actually, or? Mark Mark was a hosting. <laughs> I was just there. Oh, okay. Well, then, thank you, Mark. Given, you you guys don't trust me. With Screw the keys Ken. To the thank you, Mark, for hosting. The show. No, I'm just kidding. You guys don't trust me with the keys to the kingdom. I can't, I can't stream. I don't have access to that. Hmm, we have to fix that. Oh no, no, that's fine. <laughs> 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 all right well how about we talk about the live show then so um it was fairly quiet um mostly Did somebody was... picked starfire by accident <laughs> yeah no bob couldn't get um uh he was having trouble getting that... anything to run yeah, he couldn't get he was having a lot of trouble getting anything to work on his computer so but he came up with some very interesting um, screens. Let's and I took, uh, I took snapshots of them. Yeah, so you got stuff like that every time you tried to load the game. Wow. Well, there is there is a problem with the original uh, disk image. I think it does not work in a Coco 3, and you had to download one that had been patched. Oh, okay. I had that issue, too. Not quite as spectacularly as his, but... So... 
Yeah, um, there's just a few of us playing. We got the instructions read to us professionally by Mark. We found a few bugs. In yeah, the, we found uh, a few bugs in the, uh, in, uh, in the instructions. Um, so that's surprising. There was bugs in a Tandy product. <laughs> After that week with Mind Roll. Anyway, <laughs> we even though it was... Uh, Small, but it was fun. Definitely a good one. Uh, it uses the four colors quite well. Yeah, yeah. And the sound, I think the sound is fairly fairly good too. Yeah, it's not like your one bit style. It's actually using some of the six bit DAC properly. So there you can Engines see engines roaring, etc. Yeah. Up, up the map to choose where you're going. Yeah, no, he did a good job with this one. Did you say this is his first? Um, well, radio. I think it was his first one for Tandy, not his first game. He did yeah. uh, several for American small business computers like Packet Man, Defender, which was a Defender clone, um, Space War, which I think got renamed afterwards to something else. So he did a few others for other companies first. And then I think, I think this was his first Tandy release. Right. And yeah, by far better than his previous ones, honestly. So um, Thursday nights at five o'clock my time, which is the East Coast of, or West Coast of Canada. So whatever time that means for you guys, that's when we do this live in Discord. At eight o'clock Eastern. Normal. Eight p.m. Normal people time. Yeah, and for anybody who wants okay. to join, you you can do it on a real hardware. You can do it on an emulator. You can even do it online on the Color Computer Archive, which actually launches the X4 emulator in your browser, so you don't even have to set anything up. You can play it directly on there. Yep. I also want to mention uh, our one question I have because we have multiple UK viewers in the audience in the chat here. Like, I like we got Julian and Karen and Tom Eric Anderson, etc. I'm wondering, did you guys get Starblaze in either Europe or the UK? Because that was a Tandy cartridge. I don't know if that's one of the ones that they actually sent over to sell at Tandy stores in the UK. So, in the chat there, if you guys want to let me know if that ever showed up in your catalogs, etc., if you guys had ever seen the game before. It came I'm here just, in Australia, so I would have thought it it would have, would have went to the UK. Yeah, it's one of the ones that you you didn't have that problem with artifact colors not yeah, showing up it, on PAL. So right. it actually <clears throat> did have color. So I just have never heard Karen or any of the others actually mention the game before, so I don't know if they got it or not. So I'm kind of curious. Well, Julian Brown says never heard of it before. Tom Eric Anderson says no, can't remember. No, so maybe they didn't. That's a bad choice, Tandy. That should have been one yep. of the ones over there. <laughs> So I guess absolutely. The, the programming note for next week is the game on challenge moves from 11 p.m. GMT to um, midnight British Standard or something like that. British summertime. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be an even midnight next week for you Brits. <laughs> didn't Didn't you try a, a European version of the game on challenge live stream at one point? But you didn't. Don't think anyone. Yes, played we, it. Did. we did yes. try it. Yeah. Yeah. No a, one uh, showed up. But oh. Yeah, we did the the co the uh, the uh, game on challenge matinee edition, so that it was mm -hmm. uh, around uh, between seven and nine p.m. in the UK to Netherlands, mm -hmm. and we didn't get anyone from over there showing up. It was just people that were from the U.S. and Australia. So. We have had people from the UK and Europe send us scores and screenshots of the scores. They just oh, yeah. play whenever. I mean, they you don't have to do the content. live show to participate in the uh, game on That's challenge, true. but it's just fun. And hey, if it's midnight in um, Britain, then like the pubs are just closed, so you can. Uh, <laughs> it's a great time to come and Nothing play video better. games when you're half in the bag. <laughs> yeah, the problem is you don't get. You don't get very good scores after the pub is closed. Yeah, who cares about the scores? Hey, I know some people I know actually play better when they're hammered. So, did you ever see that episode <laughs> I of KRP where they're doing the uh, the uh, reaction test when they're drinking? <laughs> all right. Yes, ding. <laughs> after all, that's the whole basis of Tim and AJ's show. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should ask what day and and times would work best for a uh, European audience. Uh, we did, and nobody showed up. Seven p.m. Yeah. 
yeah, they were like Tuesday or Wednesday and and right. it was like we did it here, I think it was two PM Eastern, so that would have been seven PM on uh mm -hmm. in the UK. So by the way, uh, Sixty Karen in the chat says, "I don't recall seeing any Tandy carts in our local Tandy. Did see some non-Tandy tapes. Now I, I think they did have some carts because I remember we went through one of the UK uh, Tandy catalogs and they had some of the carts in there, from what I remember. But it sounds like they only got a certain subset of, of the ones that they had in the states, in Canada, and, and Australia." which always seemed to be pretty close to on par. I can't recall any Tandy cartridges or Tandy software that Australia did not get, though they did carry their own stuff made in Australia that never got sold up here, which is a dumb mistake of Tandy's as well, because uh, they had some pretty good stuff like Nick's or um, who's the guy that did uh, the other ones? Well, Tom uh, Nick's Craig, Craig Stewart. Dilemma. Yeah, Craig Stewart. Yeah, they didn't bring Neutroid. I'm so disappointed. That's why I didn't have. Well, that that was a proper filtering um, there, yeah. but. <laughs> but yeah, Tom, if you uh, ding, Nishroid has been mentioned. Yeah, if you want to organize a game on <laughs> challenge for uh, for over across the pond, all you need is like just two people that are willing to show up to play. Uh, mm. and I'll stream it again. Um. Well, I'll think about it. We'll see. Yeah, um, that's. <laughs> That's what everyone said. Well, I, <laughs> I, well, actually, on breaks, I have a a, a live stream, uh, sort of my own that was running sort of round through the winter and over Christmas. Uh, fortunately, actually, time wise, it clashed with you. Uh, cause I came on a bit late, about eight o'clock yeah. in the evening GMT time, but of course, your show was sort of still on. But uh, we got a few people through that into the kind of the evening. People generally like uh, the time wise kind of like after tea. So from 8 p.m. through until about 10, 11 o'clock at night, yeah. uh, generally people are kind of more available and more able to do stuff. Yeah. I mean, Especially we don't if it's have a any, weekday. Yeah, we don't have any set specific time. I mean, you want to come up with, you want to get some people together, see what time works best for them, and just let me know. Uh, they never let me out of my dungeon, so I'm always here. <laughs> so I can, I can stream anytime. Well, there's a, there's a couple of names, actually. If I just bring this up quickly in the chat at the moment, um, Martin Parker and where are we? And uh, Robo Nuggie, who have uh, who have, uh, usernames I recognize. They're people that actually have come over from my own channel. I've been posting on social media that I was going to be here today. So it's great to see those guys come over. Uh, it was a little while ago they put in the chat, but uh, I think they're still there, hopefully. Oh, thanks. Thanks for inviting them. Hope they enjoy the show. <clears throat> hey, and by the way, uh, Karen's uh, translating for us uh, Americans and Australians. He said, uh, when you said after tea, he said he means dinner. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I was wondering about that. I'm like, yeah, geez, I have tea, to have here tea is like at 8 o'clock in the... Yeah. <laughs> I'll just yeah, slip into my colloquial way. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. Please continue. Yeah. We have to put up an Australian from Nick here, so that's no problem. Oh, yeah. We've had to translate from Australian to American, so why not? <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> See, the, even the Canadians use different words for different things compared to... Well, America, we spell like... properly like the Brits and the Australians. Yeah. That's one well, thing. Well, like the, like the, the, uh, what, what the, like the, they would call like a public toilet. We call a restroom and the Canadians call them washrooms. So there's a, there's, there you go. <laughs> Localization well, because at its who wants to go into a public space and rest while you're doing anything in there? Those <laughs> places are not disgusting. Of, there's not a lot of washing going on there either. I mean, I hope you're, you're gonna. Wash I hope you're washing your hands <laughs> after that. Yeah, well, well, you know, it sounds like you're gonna take a shower or something in the washroom. You're not. Are you gonna go do your laundry? Well, no. You no. You got to understand. In uh, like many European countries, and I believe also in Britain, it is common to have the water closet not be where the shower is so you do have a bathroom which is where you take a bath and then you have the loo or the water closet which is where you go mm. right. yeah or the bog mm -hmm. oh yeah the bog i forgot about that one <laughs> right <laughs> all right uh we're getting a little boy this show's here. going down the toilet yeah right to the bog. <laughs> off the rails now everyone enjoy so, who wants to know what we're playing next week it better not be Outhouse at this point. Yeah. <laughs> We've already played Outhouse, so sorry. It's not Predator, is it? 
<laughs> um, it's, okay, so we are definitely playing Star Blaze for one more week. Mm. And this is our other game, which we'll be playing is for it a Mr. couple Mr. James weeks. Frogger? No. Oh, I know this one. That was familiar. I can't remember the name uh, of it, but I haven't played this in forever. It's it's a uh, clone with some changes from an arcade game, and it, yeah. oh, if you have the cartridge, it only requires a 4K Cocoa One to run. Is it Androne yeah. or and nope. something? No, Androne. You're Andron's on the right track. Are, You're on the yeah, right track, Margaret. but was it a Radio Shack cartridge? Yes. Yep. 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 So which yeah, game it's actually one of the first cartridges I ever owned when I was just a wee yeah. little lad. And those robot and those robots cheat. They can they 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 post up right next to the wall and they shoot through it. You can yeah, do can that too, though. though. You can, right, you, down, left, you can shoot up, down, left. If you're not exactly, you're not exactly there. You die. Yeah. You can shoot. It's up, pretty left, easy. Hold down right. the fire button. Just let it go and quickly press it back down. You can inch up to a wall. You'll never die. Yeah. If you go so, up, left, or right, you can shoot through the wall. But if you go down, you hit your it, your knees hit the wall first. And you die. Yeah, yeah, that's true. This kind of. Looks I will like say, a I highly wall. recommend a self centering joystick on this one. Yeah. <laughs> So, so it looks like Berserk. So is it? It does. Look it like is a Berserk, Berserk style game. And now oh. it doesn't have a title screen, so I just made one. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Just made it up. <laughs> is that cheating? Ah, oh, yeah, Monster Maze. Yep. Monster Maze sounds like a Pac-Man clone. Oh wait, I think there is one. Now this does steal something from Android Attack by Spectral. It's basically Berserk. You wander around the maze, you kill robots, um, but you actually have to pick up these little. You know, triangular shaped piles of gold bars to get extra points, yeah. which Android also had crowns to do that. So that's one difference with Berserk. You're not just shooting stuff, you actually have to try to get treasures too. Yep. So you and it's very generous with free mana, if I remember. Yes, every time you beat a level, you get a free mana. So as you can see, it it expects that you might get up to 999 mana game. <laughs> it's got three digits for the number of men that you can get. <laughs> well, so it was made by an optimist. Yeah. Mm. Anyways, it's a it's it's a fun little game. Um, it's not a terribly hard game, so people shouldn't get frustrated with it. No, I noticed the borders, the top and left border, is right up against the white border, so you don't yep. see the uh, the border as clearly as you do the uh, the right and the bottom. Is that right. the way it is in the whole game, or? Yeah, you can <laughs> still see the door. You can still see where the exit is. Yeah, you can. But I thought, from a cosmetic point of view, it just needed to be shifted down and to the right by one. Why did Tandy do that? No idea, Curtis. Why did Tandy do <laughs> Not that? Not a clue. Not a clue. <laughs> I'm sure yeah, it just, saved money somehow. Of course, right. if we could turn the border off to black, it would have fixed the problem. Right. <laughs> <laughs> No one would know. And who wrote this game? Was it Image oh, Producers? I can't remember that's now. That's a good question. Just let me just look that up real quickly. If I don't think I ever figured out the actual author, but I think I my go to my go to uh, site, this L. Curtis Boyle person. Oh, what does he know? Yeah, um, he's, he's a he's a schmuck. The, sometimes the stuff that he has in here is correct. Not always, but um. But he's got his name spelt right, right? And the author is here. question mark, question mark, question mark, image producers. Yeah. I even asked Glenn Soggy and a few of the other guys at the image producers, and they couldn't remember which one of them did that one. So obviously it wasn't too high on their list of favorites. So the, here, here you go. This is uh the author is question mark, question mark, question mark. All right. Calling them out like that with their first, middle, and last names. That's not very nice. I don't even know if they have a middle name. This well, came out in 83, was it? Very, very uh, beginning yeah, of 83. 1983. 4K. If you're using the cartridge, works on the computer one or on the color computer one, two, or three, and requires a joystick. There's a little bit of artifacting, but not enough that it's actually really required. So this is one you could play on yeah. PAL fine. Everything's black right. and white except for you, your orange and blue. Cool. So, so that's our okay. two games for the next two weeks. Yep. Hopefully we'll get some more attendance. I should be able to attend this next one unless I get another surprise job and I'm not expecting, but 
because I, I was all planning it going. I was caught up in work, and then literally the afternoon of the game on challenges when a big hunk and job came in. So. Okay. All right. Let's see. <clears throat> With that being done, um, do we want to go to Marco? Yeah, I think we should do that. What? Where were you last week? Uh, I was lost. <laughs> um, no. It was part um, of your detention. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was late. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. I was not feeling good, actually. I'm still not feeling good. So I didn't have the energy to try to get on and talk to you guys while I was there. Um, I don't have any hard numbers um, other than to say this uh, interim computer festival. Um, basically, there's a local um, kind of like a local classic computer group that gets together and meets. And uh, so um, them and another entity that's starting a museum basically are trying to start up another computer festival thing like BCF, Pacific Northwest was. And so they did this last um, it was, I guess, September and October, the end of September, beginning of October, straddled the two months. And then they did it again now. Uh, basically, VCF Pacific Northwest has usually been done in March. So kind of in the same time slot as that. Anyway, so uh, I guess there were a few more exhibitors this time. There was 19 that signed up, but I think pretty much everybody made it. It was pretty crammed in the little room, but it was pretty cool. Um, you want pictures. Was, uh, you want pictures. Oh, um, <laughs> they, they this is a, a visual of, show also. The, the guy <laughs> have running video. It, take a bunch of photos. I don't know if he posted up the link to it yet or not, but uh, <clears throat> I'll look, see if I took any, but I can't guarantee I took many. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's a good I, quote. I, anyway. I'll look to see if I took any, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. I, I, I think, think you, you're really living up to our level of show prep. That's I'm I'm that's good. <laughs> and I think you hey, caught what I'm I had just, last week. Yeah. I'm just lucky I'm here. Like I said I got yeah. Sorry, sorry to hear you're feeling bad. Feeling, that, that stinks. But. Yeah. Right. I went home on Saturday evening and like slept for 10 hours. I went back to my motel room and slept for 10 hours. And then drug myself back to the event. So yeah, I'll get some photos here. I know there's some gonna be some links to the stuff, but Okay. Yeah, I anyway. think we showed one photo last week. Uh, one of the guys took one, you know, on the Friday before the show officially started because the banner was up and stuff. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll see what I can find. Sorry, I haven't prepped at all. So, anyway, um, yeah, that fits come. right in. No prep. That's that's how we roll. Yeah. Okay. All right. Why don't we take our uh, commercial break and then figure out what we're going to do next. Hey Taylor, we're watching the Coco Nation show. Yeah, we are. Woo! You should too. Everyone, it's your good buddy, your good pal, Amigo, and joined by that dastardly The Brent from ARG Presents. You're watching Coco Nation. I feel like that should have been longer. The Coco Nation show would like to thank the following patrons Alex Gayer, Brandon Donahue, Brian Walsh, Brian Weezer, Karen Ascom, Coconut Bob. Daddy Burrito, David Ladd, Derek Smithson, Diego BF109, Don Barber, Eric Canales, Frederick Sigard, Glenn Hewlett, Graham Wabke, Grant Leedy, Henry Strickland, Justin Larson, Ken Reichard, Kevin Holloway, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, R. Allen Murphy, Retro Tech Time, Rob Binman, Rocky Hill, Steve Batson, TJB Chris, Tom C, Tom Gunderson, Tom S, and William A. Thing. Thank you so much, patrons. Welcome to everybody's favorite segment, Who's New to Discord? Charles says, Hi, 
First name is Charles. I'm an electronics geek. Like hardware. Worked as programmer since 1978 until last job 2013. My first computer was a Tandy TRS-80 Model 1. I chose the Model 1 for more characters per line than Apple's 40. But eventually I wanted color. Coco 1 gave me what I wanted. Coco 2 was smaller, lighter than the 1, with better keyboard. And I could not turn down the Coco 3. That's 4 Tandy computers in total. Found the Coco Nation about 1-2 to two months ago and found an interest. Tech Guy Life says, first name is Robert, I recently got a TRS-80 color computer model 1 early version with the 4K RAM bag on it, my first ever Coco. It didn't work when I first got it and I am in the process of restoring it. I have a YouTube channel where I document my repairs. For years I did mods and repairs on things and just started documenting things on YouTube since last September. Found out about this Discord from a user on another Discord server. Bradby says, Hi, I had a Coco 2 as a kid, and just recently got myself another 2, as well as a Coco 3. I've got a ton of projects on my plate but soon I hope to get more into these systems. Chess Mess says, Long ago, in the 80s, my mom and dad gave me for Christmas a TRS-80 color computer 1, with 4K and chiclet keyboard. It was a wonderful Christmas, and by that night I had already written my first program, ran CLS, color, and random sound, 30 go to 10, and as awfully annoying as it was, I was hooked. I miss that computer, and those days. Call me Chris. WRM says, hey all. Let me see. Wooter if you need my real name. Been messing with 6800-6809-68k in pretty much that order since 1980, thereabouts. I have a website out there with all kinds of stuff. Never had a Coco, did have a Dragon but passed that on. I do have a 6809 box with a Sam in it though, but graphics is via a 7220. Got pointed here from Facebook. Jose R says, Hello. I am Jose. I am a Coco enthusiast since the 80s. I own two Cocos and have probably own a total of four Tandy computers, including an MC10. I miss the rainbow. The previous bios were edited for time. Thanks to, Boysen, Glenside Computer Club, Micro Hobbyist Frederick, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, Tandy Color Computer 3, and the Coco Nation patrons for boosting the server. Please consider joining Discord and visiting the welcome section to read these bios in full and see what the community has to offer. Just go to discord.thecoconation.com. See you on Discord. All right, cool. And we're back. Whether you like it or not. That's right. <laughs> You've been warned. Remember, you have choices. <laughs> All bad, and you've and you've <laughs> you've chosen poorly. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. We got links to cat videos. <laughs> so, Mark, did you find uh, any any photos from the show? Or <clears throat> excuse me, no, I haven't found any yet. Not that are officially put up. You might find something on Facebook from somebody who was there, but I don't see any official ones yet. I found some on X here uh, from a site called Retro Usk. Oh, okay. Then I'll let you do the commentary on them because obviously Good, I wasn't there, so I have no idea what I'm looking at. Oh. As long but as is in Marco in any, right in any of them? Right. I might be. <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, Next Step. Running on both a Next Step and I think it was a HP workstation. So I didn't okay. really talk to the person that uh, did it. But, uh, you know, Next Step, of course, was what Steve Jobs did when he bailed from Apple and then brought back and basically became Mac into OS X. OS X. I bet the yep, ghost of exactly. Steve is so PO'd about his uh, software running on an HP workstation. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, at the end, Next Step was being sold for PCs and all kinds of platforms because he was okay. going broke yeah, on they, the hardware. They ported it to oh, okay. i386. Yeah. I was thinking it would be more like, you know, going after Franklin because they sold Apple clones. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> anyway. That right there is actually from my area. The uh, the guy that has it uh, actually went to high school with one of my children. That is a dual core itanium server that was gen, gen donated to the Gen 2 project for porting Gen 2 Linux to uh, itanium. So it was mounted in a rack at what was called the uh, Open Source Lab at Oregon State University, which is you know seven miles from me. And so it was basically went to a scrap and it was you know bought bought from the scrap stuff. So, so people <clears throat> actually bought itaniums? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, this one was given. 
This one was given to the. <laughs> no, I meant back in the day. Project. It was, was kind of a by, flop. Oh, well, probably. Yeah, but if yeah, you needed definitely. Zeons, this, this, this is, is a Dell. You know? Yeah, if you needed Xeons, this is what you had back then. You didn't have Xeons, you had Itanium. So. <laughs> Anyway, there's a reason they nicknamed it Dietanic. Right. <laughs> anyway, it's got bulging caps. It needs some work. No memory in it. But they're hoping to get it up and going. Anyway, um, let's see. More silicon graphic workstations. And uh, it's a portable uh, plasma. I think it's a compact portable. Uh, fourth from the left. Um, this is from Sunday because that machine on the far left, <clears throat> they picked it up at the local like uh, computer restore. It was just a system they found they're going to load um, millennium edition on it uh the worst worst uh <laughs> windows os i guess <laughs> and uh the guys to the left you don't see there they had a bunch of systems that were networked when they're playing descent so i think they were working on getting that up and running with millennium and getting it on the network okay um person now at the end is macintosh stuff so you've seen the eye color color the imac and the, the old style mac so yeah, I say sort of a, like a classic or an SC here, and then one of yeah, the classic, other yeah. IMAX, probably the 333 megahertz versions. Yeah, those are like the ones oh. I think that came out right when Steve Jobs came back. They came in candy colors. That was the second batch because the first ones were just Bondi blue. Oh. That was the only color you can get. That's, then, Bondi, that's right, Bondi blue, right? Yeah. Then they got the, the five or six Max. lickable colors, I think, as Steve called them. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they start bringing in the patterns like Dalmatian puppy spots and you know all the weird Indeed. stuff, flower power. And, I want the ugliest <laughs> computer on the table at SG Workstation there. This one right here? That one right there? Uh, yep. That's my boy. I want that there, were, there were quite a few workstations there of different sorts. Now, is that because of the proximity of the university you guys had that many? Because that's not something a lot of people collected um, back in the day. <laughs> they were too expensive. It could be. Right. Also, you know, there's actually a lot of businesses in Seattle. Uh, I mean, if you leave out Microsoft, there's actually a lot of other businesses that do stuff too. So there's bound to be uh, uh, localized uh, engineering companies or specialized companies that would use things like that. So this guy, I guess has been at um, VCF Midwest. He has a whole phone PBX system. So those are basically uh, um, answering machines for taking voicemails and stuff. And he had multi-line set, multiple phones strung up around the room. So these are all versions of answering machines. Yeah, there's types of answering machines. And <clears throat> I know one of them <clears throat> is actually very specialized in that it basically met AT&T's criteria for attaching um, such devices to phone lines. Basically, there's an isolator. So it doesn't have it. It's galvanically isolated. So there is like a AT&T certified physical connection to the uh, phone port. And then there's like a um, um, magnetic coupler, basically inductive coupler. So it goes to like a transformer and then it goes to the answer machine. Yeah, because I remember before the 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 bell breakup, the antitrust thing, I think mm -hmm. ATT was rather infamous for not letting anybody else's yep. hardware onto their system. Exactly. That was part of the reason for the bringing the Sherman yep. Act against them. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So one, one of those machines, at least I know, has that isolator on yes, it. Yes, so and it, it costs it was five compliant. times as much as the rest of them. Mm -hmm. Probably did. <laughs> <laughs> And those things on the top shelf are answering machines? No, those are interesting. They're some sort of, uh, you'll notice they have lettering, like the one on the top left. They yeah, have so some sort of like projector, and it projects out onto the surface, and it rotates. So it's like a sphere, and it has rotating letters go around. So these are on the wall somewhere or something. Mm, they were just sitting in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. So unfortunately, that's all this person out. uploaded, but at least it gives us a little bit of a snapshot. And it does look a little more crowded it, than it did last year as far as exhibits go. So it, it was pretty jammed. It was pretty jammed. I, I would guess they're going to be looking people. for a bigger venue uh, next. Uh, did you hear anything after the after the show was over about them actually getting VCF certification or whatever they call that? No, they I didn't, actually call didn't hear anything about that. Um, but um, see, the, see the guy in the middle that there's two guys through the rack. The one on the right is Michael Brutman, and he's the guy. Um, yeah, the one on the right. Yeah, up there. Yeah, um, had you can see his head there to the to the right of that guy right there. Um, he's the guy that actually managed and organized the VCF Pacific Northwest. His name is Michael Brutman, and I found out when he was there that he had spent 18 years in Minnesota working for IBM. He actually worked on AS400 systems, and the guy that has the Itanium. Uh, to a core itanium system. He also has an AS400 system without the terminal. So it's not booted up yet, but Michael was taking it apart and says, 
yeah, I recognize this model. So, <laughs> it's always funny to say, hey, I have code in there. <laughs> cool. Well, it looks like a good show. What was your general uh, opinion of the show compared to last year since you actually went to both? I didn't make it to both. I was, uh, Ken was at last year's. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. There's Ken. Year, so. Right. I was yes, scheduled I was. to go, but things came up. So, um, this one <clears> looks like it definitely had a lot more stuff at it. I'm just unfortunately bad weekend for me. I couldn't make it down to it. So, yeah, it looks like a pretty good show. Was there, was there any Coco Dragon MC10 representation at it? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> which which one Coco did you show? Mm -hmm. Coco, I, uh, Coco 3. I was bouncing back and forth between uh, Nitrous 9 and uh, the, the yeah. game that I've been working on with Brett and stuff. Hey, why, did you, why are you trying to scare people off with Nitrous 9? I was about to say the same thing. Nitrous 9 is probably the worst thing to show somebody. No, I had more <laughs> than one person, probably about a half dozen go, what? I think it multitasks? No, no they, people want games. That's why you want to put Nitro on there. Now you you got to remember, Grant's IQ is a lot lower than the average computer goer, so that's kind of why he's sticking with the game <laughs> stuff. Keep it oh, up, Curtis, shit. and I'll put your table in the bathroom. Hey, <laughs> although it's a I restroom. Have to say, Nitrous Nine does have a bunch of games built right into it. Yep, so. there's yep, a few I more try, on the new version I did too. Fire, try firing up King's Quest, I think. So I think I got a little bit of ways, but no, actually, you know, for a place that has a lot of silicon graphic workstations and you know, next steps, you know, there were people that are impressed with. You know, eight bit system that can multitask. So you're doing that on a toy computer, exactly. Yep. Well, you got to yeah, remember, as, Microsoft locally too here actually was trying to buy Microware after seeing some of their demos. As soon as Curtis gets Nitrous Nine ported to the MC10, that'll be really impressive. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'll be really <laughs> impressed that I managed to do without actually working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I said the organizer actually took a whole bunch of photos and he said he'd put them up. There's links to last last year's, but I don't see any for this year yet. Okay, well, maybe last we'll follow it up. Then, like, if they get the po the pictures yeah. up uh, next week, we'll do a more full report. But at least this will give people a little bit of a glimpse. <clears throat> and uh, hopefully, they become an official VCF. There, um, I would that'd be kind of cool because they they were one before. So, sorry, you weren't feeling well at the thing. That would have been nice to have a bit of a live mm -hmm. show. But if you're feeling sick, I fully understand. Yeah, I would have. Yeah, I was barely keeping up with what was going on. So. I would have just started my IV coffee drip like I do at Coco Fest. I, I would have slogged through. But I'm an idiot, so. And then speaking of shows, uh, how about if we go through the upcoming shows that will be happening over the next six or so months? Once I figure out where that window went. Nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. Ah, there we go. Share that. Actually, before I do that, uh, Grant, you had, did you already go through the updates on the public part of the show? I know you were talking about during the, the commercial no, no, break. No, no, nope. I just uh, put a couple quick ones out there. I was able to talk to the uh, hotel, and they are extending the uh, rooms uh, until April the 17th. So you have until the 17th of April to get your rooms booked at the uh, block rate. After that date, they'll go up to the regular price, which also would be a little bit higher the regular price because – there's not many rooms uh, left in that hotel because <laughs> there's other people booking as well. Um, and then also people were asking about the T-shirt that Salvador did. Uh, I have finally gotten that back up uh, on the uh, spreadshirt.com backslash Glenside store. And um, they have not taken it down. And it's been up there for a week now. So uh, we do have his design up there. So people Please can tell us that. Forward slash. It's a URL. It's a forward slash. <laughs> Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So anyways, those are the two and, updates I have. So, Well, you had one other update you mentioned, too, and that was how many hotel rooms have been booked for Cocoa Fest, which was surprisingly high. Uh, 102. 102 rooms have been booked. Which is all uh, by pretty, Grant Lady, which is pretty good. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, a lot of people go and, and like you will have a couple of, you know, you'll have a roommate with you because, uh, you know, it's just cheaper if you, you know, share a hotel room type thing. So that indicates i think we're already past last year's attendance yeah it's good good indication and that's the other thing too don't forget to uh, pre-register because we will be giving away a prize um if you pre-register online it kind of helps us keep track on who's going to be at the show and and everything like that so um is there a count on how many have pre-registered 
Uh, yes, but uh, I don't have it at the at the helm right now. <laughs> well, then what do you saw you, Grant? <laughs> so He's maintaining uh, our show preparedness. And also, yes, uh, yeah. April seventeenth will be the last date that you can also book a table. So, because on the eighteenth is when I have to give the numbers to the hotel to uh, uh, rent the tables and so oh, forth. Yeah. So, yep. So that will be the last day for pretty much everything. So, and I'll get Sorry you for the, the echo there. My cable can. And I'll give you a quick. I'll give you the quick number here, real quick, if I can get in. Seven. And and, and last you talked uh, last week, Grant. I just want to remind people 42. too, for people who want to tour through the VCF. Uh, warehouse you're going to be doing that both friday night and sunday night this year right yep so friday night we'll have to go over there and pick up the stuff so if you want to go over there and take a look at the warehouse you can go with us at that time and then we usually go back over to take the stuff back uh after the dinner on sunday when we go out to lunch after the show or yeah so and jason says we were able to do both of those so awesome and what day are you going to go? You can, so you say, okay, you can't go on Friday, so you'll be going on Sunday then, right? Yeah, I don't think we'll be back in time for it on Friday because uh, it depends on how long the interview we're doing, Ken and I are doing, it's going to last. We've actually been going back and forth with uh, uh, Robert Kilgus for that interview, which you guys will be seeing on the show eventually. I'm not sure if on this show or on Ken's own channel or maybe both, who knows. <clears throat> but uh, he's actually both. found some more stuff that uh, uh, he still has so we'll be get grabbing that mostly just paperwork stuff but there's some more interesting cocoa bits in there cool uh and you won the number we are at 85 people uh pre-registered right now does that mostly people that actually have tables in or uh that or they purchased dinners okay yeah so and that's and that's higher than it was this time last year too so right i was gonna say you have 102 hotel rooms registered and you only got 85 people showing up to the show that's kind of weird yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> Darn it, lot, people like us. <laughs> but you got to keep in mind too. A lot of people, we we have some some of those people who do not want to put their information out there on the system. So you know, right? So have, and you don't have to buy a ticket, so just show exactly, up. And, exactly, exactly. Right. Because you'd be amazed how many people do refuse to use Facebook, refuse to use email, and refuse to use uh, PayPal. <laughs> you know, it's like how you function in life nowadays. But yeah, people don't uh, don't want their information out there. So. Yeah, I guess that's understandable. There's must have been so many security breaches the last few years that uh, I, I I can understand people being a bit gun shy and doing that. Yeah. So, but yep, that's all I have right now. i uh, be looking for the uh, schedule to be coming out. I'll be working on that this weekend. So uh, you'll probably have that for the next week's show. Now, one last yeah. question, because you'd mentioned there's going to be a signed guest register book. Does that apply towards getting in the draw too? So that people no. that do have that privacy thing want to sign up? No, no. So if you you have to pre-register to get this prize that we're going to be giving out for the uh, pre-register, and then there's a uh, the SDC which we'll do on the sign-in. Okay, but, uh, so people that uh, are retro- super private can still try to enter to win something if they just sign the guest book. Exactly, exactly. Yep, and then which also is- don't forget there's also um, uh, if you do the Star Wars decorations at your table or dress up in a costume, there'll be prizes for that too as well. Yeah, not doing that. Yeah, kind of. Me neither. <laughs> I'm bringing my tricorder. I, I can I can breathe heavy or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just yeah, I just I just bought my I just bought my shirt and that's fine. And uh, people say that I do a pretty good Darth Vader, especially my daughter who I scared. <laughs> Didn't hear anything. And we didn't hear. Yeah, anything. that was that was that well, was that's great. probably because I got that. That's probably all for the better anyway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the background noise said your background noise and cut yeah, you right that, out. That was great. Here it goes. Goes. And then no sound, just the hands. That was awesome. <laughs> well, that's be- that's be- that's a beautiful thing. That's, yeah. Actually, Darth Vader is dead, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly how he sounds. That's what he sounds like. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Okay. Well, I'll get into the, some of the other shows coming up here. Uh, I think this is the right window. Okay, so the first one is actually happening next weekend, and that's the Southeast Michigan Vintage Computer Club, and they're having their swap meet meeting here, as you can see the details on the screenshot here. And that's from 12 p.m. till 4 p.m. Uh, it's ran by Adam of Commodore Chronicles and sponsored by Retro Rewind, who's also sponsoring our show. So thank you to Frank and Retro Rewind. And this is at Grace Chapel's Gymnasium, <clears throat> at 2515 North Williams Lake Road in Waterford Township, Michigan. 
And the swap meet means there'll be a whole bunch of retro hardware for all kinds of systems available. Uh, so if you're a collector, this might be a good little show if you're in the area to go check out. Next up after that, the following weekend, April 13th to 14th in Indianapolis, is the Indie Color Classic Computer and Gaming Expo. This is actually co-ran by uh, Randy Kindig of the Antic and Floppy Days podcast fame. And uh, it, I think, just started last year and it had a pretty good attendance and looked like some pretty interesting stuff was at it. So it's uh, looking good. To, this year it should be bigger and have more attendees as well. Uh, this one actually costs $5 per person or $10 per family. And as they say on their website, only 14 days until the show opens. And uh, anybody in the Chicago area that's gone to VCF uh, Midwest and gone to Coco Fest, you know, Indy's not that far. It's like a four to five hour drive or something like that. It's pretty close. So not even. Worth... Yeah. I, what? I, I used to drive, I used to drive from, um, from Louisville to, from uh, Lexington, Kentucky to Wheaton. And it's like, once you hit Indy, you're like three, four hours away. Yeah. I seem to remember four, because I've done the trip a few times myself, because I used to have one of my clients there, but. It's been a fair number of years. So I can't remember the exact time, but except maybe if you hit rush hour, then it might be longer. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, next up after that, and thanks to Sloopy for reminding me about uh, VCF East a couple of weeks ago. So this one is happening on April 12th to 14th, the same weekend, basically, as the Indie Computer Classics of so your in New Jersey area, rather than the Indianapolis area, this would be a good show to go to. And you, um, you will see me it, there. You're going to be there? Oh, awesome. Cool. Yes. That's at the Info Age Science and History Museums in Wall, New Jersey. Um, no, I'm trying to remember, Sloopy, is this multiple buildings that you have to go between? Is this the one? Yes. Know? Yes, there's uh, several buildings. It's actually and does it look like, I don't know, I, I was just very, very briefly at the site here. Do you know, are they expecting bigger attendance, more exhibitors as well this year, like others seem to be doing? Unfortunately, there there's no room for expansion there. Oh, and right. So it's not like they can get much more people in there. Was it was they, this an old army base, I think? With, yeah, yeah, it was originally the, um, uh, the transcontinental uh, wireless. This was the uh, U.S. side of it where uh, okay. where they would uh, transmit messages across the Atlantic over to the to the Europeans. So this is the one you showed last year or the year before with a bunch of buildings, no parking, you're just plopped in right. the city and good luck with all of that. Exactly. Okay. Now, I mean, because they're pretty well maxed out capacity-wise, are they looking at moving to a different venue so they can actually get the show a bit larger? Yeah, that... Uh, Jeffrey has said in the past that uh, they were looking. Uh, part of the problem is that the area is not um, is not inexpensive. So, because of their the uh, low cost of being here, that's why they've stayed here. Um, this is actually the original VCF. Um, VCF Midwest was actually an expansion. Was the first expansion beyond this one. And I think that if they would have opened it up to more than just this location, they would have grown to the point where they were like similar to VCF Midwest in size. But because they're staying here, they haven't been able to grow because there's only a limited amount of space that they can have. Yeah, it looks like they've got quite a few exhibitors actually up and, and talks here already scheduled too, so that's good. Yeah, that's pretty they interesting usually ones, are actually. pretty full because a lot of people, especially from... Um, over in Europe and and such will come over because this is the closest one to the East Coast. So you get a yeah, lot that of makes sense. There. Not to mention, it's only like an hour, hour and a half drive from Philadelphia, uh, yeah. and less than an hour from New York, which have both both have big international um, airports. So it's very really easy for people that are flying in from out of country to come here and i'm one one of the uh the uh, seminars i want to mention here uh the fujinet the la first five years um actually will be showing the color computer prototypes it's mentioning here too so mm -hmm. and demonstrating also the compact mac version of fujinet which of course started on the atari 8-bit machine so if you are in the air and you want to catch some cocoa stuff uh, there's actually going to be a demonstration of the fujinet using the cocoa as well
Okay, next after that is the big one for us. Uh, that's Coco Fest, the 32nd annual last one, which is probably very confusing for Tom, but that's just kind of a weird tradition. <laughs> I have figured it out by now. I've been listening and watching the show enough to figure that one out. But yeah, oh, okay. it's, taken, it's taken a couple of years, but yeah, I'm there now. <laughs> <laughs> We're sorry you've been watching this long. <laughs> yeah. right. Our apologies for your mental health. Um. So anyway, that's uh, May 4th to the 5th, which is why the Star Wars theme this year for May the 4th be with you. And as, you know, basically Grant already gave us an update on, you know, the room situation. We've got the rooms at the cheaper rate still booked until April 17th, but we've sold 102 rooms already, so there's not too many left. So don't wait if you're planning on coming. There's going to be a lot of unique stuff. If we had Brian Weasler on, we could talk about that. The deluxe color computer that actually has the advanced color basic ROMs will be there if you want to actually see it in person. And we'll have some other stuff that Brian's got, too, that we haven't actually mentioned on the show. So we want to keep a few surprises to entice people to come down. But that's a pretty big one. And we'll probably be doing a seminar on that as well. Yeah. You and know. one other thing, too, I forgot to uh, mention. I, I got a uh, message from the person who is going to be bringing three Cocos to the show. Uh, that person may not be able to show up to the show due to a family emergency. So I need to ask the community, see if anybody has an extra cocoa to bring to the show that we can use on for the game on challenge if that person is not able to make it. So uh, let me know if you got an extra one because uh, it would be greatly, it will help us greatly. Because unfortunately, the uh, Glenside doesn't have any extra ones. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, they sold all their stuff. <clears throat> okay. Is there any in the auction we could use that, you know, on Saturday and then, and then you know, sell in the auction on Sunday or something maybe? No, we, we probably could, but I'm sure. But we can probably find three people to bring, uh, you know, three cocos. So right, I'll, I'll rummage through parts and find at least one. Yeah, and, and, do, and do we need models? coco threes? Like depending on the game selected. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask no. Ken. Do we know what game we're playing yet? If it's going to be a coco two or coco three game? I will get back to you on that. I've uh, shortlisted the things, but um, I'll just see which uh, hardware I will definitely need in the next okay. couple of days. All right, awesome. You should have said something, Ken. Why? <laughs> what? I might have one or two extra cocos sitting around. Oh, cool. So you're willing yeah. to bring them for the I game? Mean, I, can, I can work with what the hardware is going to be. So, yeah. Yeah, I could, prob I mean, I I could can, probably do a, uh, some as well. I can definitely bring a couple extra coco ones and one or two coco twos. Yeah, probably well, coco twos is what we want to use. Coco sure. twos, probably, yeah. Yeah, I, even if we do a mixture, we'll have like one or two Kogo 3s set up and the rest can be Kogo 2s for any other games if there's multiple games going on. So Yeah, I th think I could do a one with composite. Do you do you need monitors and stuff then too? Is that a person going to be supplying uh, monitors? So for the monitors, um, uh, Brian Weasler is going to help me on the monitor situation. So, cool. so okay. we, should, we should be okay on that. But I will... Um, I'll reach out to him too, just to make sure. So, Brian Walsh in the uh, comments says that they can bring a Coco Three. Okay, cool. Good and Karen yeah, just so asked, why can't you just build a few using Pedro's boards or something? <laughs> soldering oh. in the corner before the game start. Yeah, I'll let you do. I'll let you do that soldering there, Curtis, before the show. <laughs> oh, good. We'll have that all ready for uh, Coco Fest 2095. Yeah, well, and we'll have the fire department there too to start to kick off the show. <laughs> well, well, we, we need to follow tradition. Challenge. It's not Coco Fest without the fire department showing up at least once <laughs> with axes. And speaking of the floor plan, so this is the original floor plan, which is you know has been sold out for a while. So Grant was graciously with talking with the hotel, and we've got hallway space available for those. And we also have a second auxiliary room. And the hallway space has just got one that's forgotten machines uh, available. But if you take a look in the uh, secondary room that's actually starting to fill up pretty quick. There's only two mm. out of eight tables left. Where's the yeah. diagram for the for the additional room? We don't have one for that because we don't know how the tables are going to be set up until no we get there. No one knows what mm. it looks like yet. Yeah, <laughs> I know what the hall looks like, but I don't know where the tables are going <laughs> to be. Long and skinny. Yeah. We're going to be t stacked on top of each other. <laughs> oh, bunk bed yeah. style. And I see, uh, Ken, you've got the game on challenge. Yes, yep. I. Worked really hard on getting that um, put in there, but uh, okay, yeah, no, I didn't. Yeah, know that yeah, was I stuck happen. that in there because I think it's very important for us to have something to draw people into that room to make yeah. sure that those people don't get left out. So that's why. Yeah, I, and you don't want it overcrowded, which is why we didn't put nitrous nine in there. Yeah. So I understand. Yeah, that's and I and I personally think we can probably get more more than nine tables in there, but uh, I'm at the whim at the hotel, you know, 
at this. So we can probably, I think next year we can probably squeeze more, more people into that room. So if we need to. Okay. Cool. Well, it's, it's good to hear that you've sold over a hundred hotel rooms. It's good that the, the secondary rooms only got two tables left. Yep. Um, it's it's going to be and a I'm fest. Sure, and I'm sure after the uh, Glenside meeting that we have here in April, I'm sure that some people will be like, Oh no, I need to hurry up and get some rooms. It always happens every, uh, last month everybody needs somebody needs a couple tables so i'm sure yeah this will get well some people have to wait to see if they're gonna have to be able to get time off work and you know whatever else exactly too, so. exactly so uh can i give you a couple of dates for cambridge sure yep yeah. so uh this is cambridge england the center for computer history uh they're having the portable computer festival which is going to be the 18th and 19th of may that's the smaller of the two main retro festivals they now have per year. And the smaller one, which you have in uh, springtime, so May, is kind of the themed one. So they have a theme for the whole event. This year, it's uh, portable computers. So it's luggables, early laptops, that kind of thing. Uh, the main one, which I don't think they've formally announced yet, but I have the dates here. It's going to be, this is the Retro Computer Festival Cambridge. And that'll be the 9th and 10th of November. And that's kind of like your kind of British version of the BCF type thing. And I'm going to be, or I should be there exhibiting at that one. Uh, they'll probably make a formal announcement and confirm the dates probably a month or two's time. But those are the big ones, both happening at the Centre for Computer History in Cambridge, England. Um, I didn't go to last year's, but I think last year's they actually hit capacity for the building. So they uh, violated fire eggs and couldn't let people in and all sorts. So. <laughs> uh there was a queue to get in basically last year apparently so it's uh it's and if uh, i remember correctly the the dragon meetup i was also at cambridge at the museum yes. except the roof was getting repaired but that was in october yeah i don't seem to have a date for that one yeah it's it's normally yeah october just before the main uh festival itself but there's always um there's always cocos and there's always dragons at the show and there's always um tony jewel who i think you know Yep. Or know the yep. name of yeah he's i mean tony actually organizes the event now so he's at the very least he's got his um modified dragons are normally always there exhibiting um cool that is a show yeah. i do plan on attending sometime in the future once uh, i was gonna say are when, when are you gonna come and visit you've got to, you've got to come and visit at some point it's a flying to yeah London, well, I'm, I'm told yeah. i have to come to the dragon meetup for sure <laughs> at the very least so well come for the dragon meeting and then just stay over and then <laughs> If you yeah. can get them like one weekend apart, I can make it like a holiday. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that might be a bit much, but yeah. <laughs> but those are the so those will probably be popping up on the various social media and also on the Sense of Computer Histories website. Um, I just I've got them here because I'm on the uh, the Discord for the sort of exhibitor Discord. So yeah, should be fun. Cool. Actually, uh, since we've usually had Karen and others, you know, kind of like live stream from the show on our show, you know, at the tail end of the evening for you guys. But, uh, you know, they kind of walk around the tables and kind of show what's all there at the dragon meetup. Would you be interested in, in maybe trying to arrange something like that for the, the main retro show? Uh, yes, I've, I've done. It that doesn't have before. to be you personally, but if you yeah. arrange with somebody, uh, no, I, I don't mind. I have done that before on my own channel, um, where I sort of live stream during the day. So yeah, we could probably, I mean, I have a better phone now and uh, I think there's better connectivity because the problem with Cambridge was, or um, uh, cellular um, connectivity. And I think yeah. we've now got Wi-Fi codes or keys for the building, so we can actually hop onto a fibre network from phones. So, yeah, I should be able to do something like that. Okay, because I'd be interested in just seeing what 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 your your VCF equivalent looks like in at Cambridge. So it's, I mean, it's not as big a show uh, because the, I mean the venue you've got a museum already in situ so you have to sort of squeeze into the in between the museum's content uh, which is kind of a I suppose it's like a blessing in disguise because you've always you've always got the base of the museum there open yeah it reminds me a bit of, of the way VCF West works the one in, in Silicon Valley because that actually is at a computer museum as well it's exactly the same sort of thing um, I mean the only thing is we don't have that many shows here in the UK I wish we had more but we don't so it is kind of the kind of catalyst show and uh, it does get cramped very, very quickly. Um, so it's it's popular, but it's kind of, I have said to Tony before, and there's actually, there's an interview I did on my channel uh, on the recordings of the live stream where I said to him, you know, rumours are we were going to move out to a larger exhibition centre. 
Uh, this was actually before COVID and um, it hasn't quite happened yet, but that's the big risk. The next thing for them will be to, can they risk hiring a venue that doesn't have the support of the museum content and knowing they'll be able to fill it enough with uh, exhibitors like myself, you know, and we'll be able to bring enough crowds in. So that's the unknown and uh, we'll have to see what happens, but it's getting to the point now where people are having to be turned away or queue up outside. <laughs> you think mm, we might need a bigger space. <laughs> Okay, cool. Tom, if you want to send me either in the uh, the Zoom chat or in Discord or something a link, if you guys have a website for that particular show, and I'll uh, start including I'll that as well. What's, yeah, I'll see what's gone up online. Just bear with me. I'll get back to you. Yeah. Anyway, next up after that is Boat Fest. So this is the third annual Boat Fest. Of course, is run by the people at the Amigos channel named after uh, John Schaller's nickname. This is June 14th to 16th at the Solstice Event Space in Hurricane, West Virginia. And uh, so is this get your some type of marina? <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's, it's a fun one. Uh, Ken and I are planning on going this year. So I think a few others on the panel are thinking about it too, or some other people in the Coca community to get a bit more Coca representation out there. I'm going to see if I can fit a uh, DICOM uh, Sega Master Gun adapter in my carry-on luggage there, because if I can, I'll take that down, and as long as somebody brings a Coco 3 and an RGB monitor, I should be able to play some light gun games on the Coco at the show. So hopefully that all works out. I might even just bring the interface, because I think some of the guys there actually do have Sega Master systems with the light gun. They can just bring the gun. It just plugs right in. There's no modifications to it needed. Hey, good time. It's a general retro computer show and retro video game console show. It also sometimes throws in like video pinball machines and some other stuff too. There's some live game on challenge type things too that are a lot of fun. And usually some people that are visiting from over the pond because the Amigos have a huge audience in the UK and Europe bring you know, all kinds of interesting foods and stuff for us uh, Northern Americans to try. And that exact same weekend, is VCF Southwest. This is June 14th to 16th at the Davidson Gundy Alumni Center at the University of Texas at Dallas. This one actually has a separate little Tandy assembly meetup that's happening that same weekend. And you'll see a lot of the alumni of, of Tandy itself because, of course, Tandy was based in you know Fort Worth, Dallas. So uh, Mark Siegel's planning on attending it. Uh, Chronological Games Game is going to be there. Boise's giving a presentation. And then a lot of the other people that were involved in making a lot of the computers we know and love from Tandy Radio Shack will be there too. So definitely this is one to check out. This is one I also do plan on attending within the next couple of years um, just to meet some of them, you know, while they're still around and be able to you know, get stories. Maybe we can set up interviews with them too. So that'd be awesome. After that is VCF West, uh, which they've kind of, it's not officially announced yet, but it sounds like it's going to be August 2nd to 3rd, which is a Friday to Saturday, uh, not a Saturday to Sunday, a little bit odd at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, which we were just talking about. Uh, this year is a bit of a change for them. They're actually now a full partner with the museum so that the admission for both the museum itself and the VCF show can be done in one purchase at the uh, the kiosk for the museum itself. So you don't have to like deal with two different entities while you're attending and you get to see the whole museum at the same time. So the Computer History Museum is located at 1401 North Shoreline Boulevard, Mountain View, California. And uh, once I get you know more stuff officially on the site here with some you know schedules and exhibitors and stuff here, we'll get into a bit more detail on it. I'm hoping Mikey Furman, who lives in the area, and maybe a few others will be down there too to you know represent the Coco. And uh, Mikey, I think was in the chat earlier. I don't know if he still is, but if he is, let me know if you're going. And uh, he's done some really cool. I think last year is when he did his Flex uh, special, where he's showing off the you know versions of Flex, like Frank Hogg's Flex, and stuff for an alternative operating system for the Coco. And then the biggest of the uh, retro shows, period, worldwide, as far as I know, um, is VCF Midwest, which is uh, their 19th year of doing this. And it's at the Renaissance Schomburg Convention Center in Schomburg, Illinois. It's literally a few blocks from where Rainbow Fest was back in the 80s. That is September 7th to 18th. Or say 18th. Yeah, it might get that long eventually. September 7th to 8th. Um, September 6th, the Friday evening is basically reserved for vendors, et cetera, to set up. So if you're a vendor, you can, you can get in early, kind of get some visiting in before the crowds hit. 
because this this has attendance in the thousands. So I mean, basically, if you're stuck at a table, you won't get to see too many people, you know, during the actual show. So it's kind of like a pre meetup. Uh, Ken Sloopy and numerous other people on the panel have been to these shows before. Um, they've outgrown the previous location, which they were only at for a few years. So uh, it's going really, really well. The new venue is quite a bit larger. Um, Ken or Soupy, do you have anything you want to say about VCF Midwest? It's oh, a please. lot of fun. Go. I highly recommend it. Okay. I don't know. Uh, like, how would you rank, rank it compared to a Cocoa Fest, for example? Obviously, besides size. Um, massive. <laughs> Yes, massive. Even though you didn't ask me. Yeah. I wish Jason. you guys could have been in Rainbow Fest in its heyday. That would have been an interesting compare. Yeah, those were nuts. Yeah. Yeah, I don't Except think Except as far been. as I can tell, I don't think the VCF Midwest matched the attendance of the Rainbow Fest at their heyday. The first what was ones the I um, Rainbow attendance? Uh, I think the biggest one was around 12,500. Uh-huh. Well, we'll see this year because uh, the I'm expecting it's going to be a lot bigger than last year, and we had quite a few thousand last year. Yeah, I think it was around four, so I'm expecting at least five this year. At least. I mean, we had people in the parking lot. Yeah, there was people <laughs> yeah, set vendors up in the parking, in the parking lot, lot. <laughs> vendors in the parking lot, vendors outside in the courtyard. <laughs> they had to get rid of the um, auction space they always use because it filled up with vendors, so they had to move the auction space into the basement. Yeah, I, I know when they put up the, the rooms for sale on that one, too, the first block sold out in less than three hours. Yeah. So that is another one I'll eventually make. It. I'm going to eventually make it to all of these, but I'm just not sure when yet. Someday. <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm doing two a year right now. I'm doing Boat Fest and Cocoa Fest. So that's the first time since Comdex days I've gone to more than one computer show in the same year. I tried to do Cocoa Fest and VCF Midwest and... Maybe, just maybe, I will try to go to Boat Fest this year. We will see. It's it's only about four hours from here. Oh, you, you should. It, it's a lot of fun. You'd have fun there. And yeah. it's not that far from West Virginia's only amusement park. So I, I think I might uh, double dip. Oh, on Camden that Park? Yes. Yeah. 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 And, of course, actually, you can see the Mothman statue, too. So why wouldn't you go? Yes. I was so happy when Camden Park showed up in uh, Fallout 76. <laughs> Because it looked exactly like it does in real life. It does. <laughs> yes, I, I, I am I am prepared to be completely underwhelmed. <laughs> no, you'll anyway, be you're gonna go to Boat Fest or yeah, I'm gonna go to Boat Fest. Oh cool. We'll get a whole cocoa. There we go. The cocoa there. people are taking over. Hey, there was actually Take it over. I, I remember As a it fairly be. active uh cocoa uh cocoa community when I was a kid. You know, I didn't That's the funny thing, because Aaron doesn't remember that at all. Mm. <clears throat> Maybe it's just because Hurricane itself or something, but uh... yeah. Or we could have gone across the street to Ohio. I'm not sure. Oh, well. yeah. Well, it'd be interesting to have the two of you meet because you're both, you know, kind of grew up not too far apart there, and you guys had quite different experiences in the Cocoa community. So that's kind of interesting. <laughs> and the last one <clears throat> I'll be mentioning here is Tandy Assembly 2024. This is September 27th to the 29th in Springfield, Ohio. Um, at the courtyard by Marriott. Um, now they've started actually posting exhibitors on their website here, so we've actually got some updates here. It's a thirty dollars table entry fee. Um, so Peter Satinsky will be demonstrating the Model Two ArcNet system. Ian Maverick from Australia will be doing a whole bunch of stuff. He's got that diagnostic card that David Ladd talked about earlier. He also sells like RS-232 pack replacements for the Cocoa and stuff too. Plus he has a ton of stuff, the Model 134, et cetera, as well. Uh, another West Virginian, Robert Harden, will be there uh, demonstrating the Orchestra 90 and 85, I believe, as well as uh, the Cocoa 3 DAC sound, um, AdLib clone, and the Sensation. So he's doing a whole Sounds of Tandy thing here where it's covering a lot of the music and sound hardware that was available. For a variety of tandy machines. Matt Massey of Ironton, Ohio, will be demonstrating the F-256 Junior Nitrous 9. That's the one that Boise's been helping import Nitrous 9 to. So that's a more modern FPGA version of uh, Nitrous 9. Uh, Michael Hill will be doing retro products from the Tech Dungeon. 
Jay Newerth of uh, NewSoft will be there as well. Um, selling power supplies for Model 3, 4s, etc. Case badges, RAM badges, drive sleds for GoTex, and for HDs as well as custom cables. So they've got a pretty good start to their uh, exhibitors. And then remember, this is this is like half a year out yet too. So this is pretty early to be getting that. I don't think they have any speakers scheduled yet, but I'll just get a quick check. No, nope, not yet. So hey, that's the uh, the other one coming up. So that covers all of the upcoming shows. So you want to do a quick commercial break? I'll come back and I'll, I'll start covering a little bit of the news. I think I'll just do the game on stuff because by the time that's done, our other guests should be here, I think. It's about okay. half an hour, right, Tom? Roughly? Uh, if you said 8.30, then yeah, we've got about half an hour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'll work. Hi, this is Rick Adams, author of Temple of Rom and Shanghai, and I, like you, am a citizen of the Coco Nation. This is not the Joey Serial Switch. This is the Joey Serial Switch. Control up to three serial devices. Order yours today at cocoman.biz. The music is back. For many a year, peace has reigned throughout the realm. In the forest, nothing but ruins of an ancient fortress remain to fuel the myth of the evil wizard. Tales of your ancestors' quest are met with laughter. Mockery follows your warnings. But you know what awaits. When you want the latest in TRS-80, Tandy, Dragon, MC-10, and all of their hardware cousins, no matter what it takes, or where news breaks, from around the world, to your nation, Coco Nation News with L. Curtis Boyle. One of the days I'm gonna have to come out of that com commercial with a like a skull cap on and like wisps of smoke going on or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if we get the shot on a on a key, we can make it work. <laughs> right? Hey. The highlight at Coco Fest. Yeah, watch me getting totally chased by people with lighters. Like, <laughs> we can I can totally see the... it up and make it real cheap looking. <laughs> I I can see the game now. You have the El Curtis Boyle soldering challenge game. Yeah, can I solder even one pin onto one wire in less than <laughs> half an hour? That would be the challenge. oh that oh 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 and and, and right. you don't have in the in the uh, the metric instead of having lives, it's how much hair you have left before you lose. Yeah, that'd be, a, that'd be a good prop for the uh, Coco Fest. You can pick up your free 
hair on fire cap, like a little yeah, cardboard. To snap, but... <laughs> yeah. It just poofs flour out every once in a while. Yeah. I wonder if I'll have my everyone, OS done soon enough. Everyone's to write that. walking. Everyone's walking around at the fest with this fire on their head. Like, like this, like uh, Disney ears. Yeah, yeah there we go. Yeah, a little butane <laughs> lighter, just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> All right, oh, so to cover a little game on uh, news here, there's not a ton of it, so hopefully it'll time out well with our expected other guests coming on. Jim so the first Gary. one is from uh, Guess Who, Jim Gary, um, who converted. Uh, there was a basically the ten liner basic programming contest that was recently had. Um, one of the people that was in it was a guy nicknamed himself Nano Chess. And he did a 10-line basic program called Tetris, which is a, obviously a Tetris-style game. And so Jim decided to make it to work on G uh, on the MC10, converted from the original G-Wiz basic, as we nicknamed it, uh, from the IBM PC. Now, unfortunately, because of the way he had to do semi-graphics and stuff a little bit differently than the PC would have done, he wasn't able to fit it in 10 lines. It takes a whole 20 lines on the MC10. And these are not like crammed lines, as you can see in the listing here. There's some pretty short ones. Um, but basically, it, it plays a decent one. Now, because he's using set reset graphics, it's a little bit slow moving pieces, but it actually gives a kind of a neat animated effect, I think, quite by accident. Um, you can kind of see it looks almost looks like it's streaming down type thing. So it runs, you know, fairly slow. I, he could have optimized this if he, you know, took the time to replace these with, you know, character string values rather than set reset. But uh not bad for a quick little conversion of a 10-line basic program, you know, as basic scoring, et cetera. So that was kind of cool that he converted a 10-line basic program from a IBM PC to the MC10. Next up, Renga in Blue. Now, this is a site, I think I've covered it before, because they basically cover all interactive fiction, all text adventure games. And uh, they've done some other Cocoa stuff way in the past. We haven't uh, had the, seen them do anything on the Cocoa for a while because they cover every machine. And of course, text adventure games have been around as long as, you know, like Star Trek games and stuff, you know, from the 70s on mainframes and minis. So this one here, you picked one that's fairly rare. I don't think I even have this one on my site yet either. So I'm going to have to catch up on this. But uh, the company PAL Creations, I am aware of. I have seen some ads for that in Rainbow. And I remember that the game Eno itself, I don't really remember all that well. Uh, it's a bit of a different one. It's kind of like a cross an adventure game in Clue. Um there's the artwork for the dragon version of it. And once again, the dragon had way better artwork than any of our stuff. Ours was just like a single piece of colored paper with black Xerox on it. And here you get full color. And it was created by Paul Austin and Leroy C. Smith. This particular version that he's playing here is distributed by Dragon, which is probably, I don't think the Cocoa version is actually on the archive. I remember seeing it advertised. So now that I know the dragon version exists, I'll have to go grab that and then you update my site and add this one to it especially considering I thought it was done, all this stuff in 1982 that actually I could find software for. Obviously, I missed one. And as it describes the premise of the game here, the game itself, it says your eccentric aunt has just died and left you her estate. She had millions. If you find it, it's yours. Your only clue, living room. Good hunting. That's not too helpful at all. <clears throat> so you actually kind of mapped it out. The entire game takes place in the living room. But the living room is divided into 18 different subsections uh, like by the TV, by the fish tank, by the love seat, et cetera. So you're kind of figuring everything else there uh, based on the, it's a single room adventure, but not a traditional one where you have a bunch of objects you have to manipulate to solve some puzzle. It's actually divided the room into subsections that you can wander between. And these got various screenshots and kind of explanation of it. Um, basically playing it. I think it's a 32K basic game, if I remember correctly. But he goes into, he, like like some of the other people, like the Wargaming Scribe, he goes into deep dives. Like he tries to play the game to the finish to see if he can actually win it. So it's not just a quick little, you know, 10-minute review like, you know, I would do type thing. Um, quite extensive. Um, I thought I would mention a little bit of the review at the end here. Um, he said, despite the lack of a save file system, the game being very, very short means it doesn't matter. It's more polite than a Super Mario troll level anyway. In the very specific circumstances here of a reduced verb short game where you hand wave over realism, it works. Just in the context of the early 80s market, there isn't much it fits with. The only slightly comparable game I can think of is Mansion Adventure, which had its difficulty in clue interpretation rather than the object manipulation. And he mentions that we'll be seeing more from the authors of this game, including the other half of the commercial package, Stalag, because this was in, in the UK was sold as a, a dual game cassette. 
Um, but next up, we're heading over to Australia for some Doctor Who, which I'm not sure what platform that's on. But uh, it sounds like it was a fairly unique style of a text adventure game at the time. Um, so I, I, this is actually one I, I, I'm kind of interested to give it a shot and actually maybe try it a bit more than I normally do just to get a quick you know entry on the game page site. So once uh, Nitro 9 EOU is completely released for the main four platforms that I do myself personally, I'm going to be getting back onto the game site because I have to catch up on stuff for Chronological Gaming. And I had one that I was actually halfway through and, and haven't finished yet. Um but yeah, I'll have to backtrack and get this one here and see if I can find that other one they're mentioning, Stalag, that uh, is also available. So thanks for him for doing such great reviews of text adventure games and deep dives into them. Next up, uh, this is a uh, Russian uh, gamer, retro gamer here that I've covered before on the channel. And he did a couple more Dragon and Coco games this past week. Now, unfortunately, the uh, I think he's using an older version of x which really had that problem with the sound popping and not you know running right under windows so unfortunately it, the sound's going to be kind of crap you um normally the game this particular one laser run by believe computer games has nice four voice music of the star wars theme playing a little bit and then it's a basic game other than that the only machine language it's in here is to play music and uh, it basically it's it's more similar to advanced uh, star trench warfare another basic game on the coco that came out a couple years earlier than this but as you know, page flipping animation draws TIE fighters and stuff like that in basic. I'll play a little bit of it. I'll just give you a quick blip of the sound. You can hear it all distorted as it is. And then I'll fast forward a little bit to the actual gameplay a bit. But you can hear that warbling. <laughs> anyway, that's enough of that. <laughs> Didn't hear anything. Oh, did I forget to share sound? Sounds great. Do that. No, I have to stop and restart here. It's sick. Yeah, I'm just thinking it didn't sound that bad. Right? Yeah, I did forget to check it. Look at me being sloppy. Ah. Check the check that's what box. happens when you don't come to rehearsal. <laughs> Beauty. Ooh. That's not how it normally sounds. That's an emulator issue. Which from You'll see here in the news here, it sounds like uh, 60 might have actually got that fixed now, too. Or greatly improved, anyway. Very sputtery. So, wait, like I said, the game itself is written in basic. There's no ML in the actual gameplay, so this is just using page flipping techniques, a lower res mode. I think it's 128 by 96 for color. Um, joystick controls. And here it's drawing all the background the animation for the trench. Which I'll skip because obviously it's boring. Oh, there it is. Now, this one looks like it has a bit more control over what you're doing than Advanced Red Church Warfare because that one was just too random. I mean, it visually looks pretty cool for a basic game, but uh, it was so random. It was just literally, you know, like rolling dice whether you'd hit something or not. This seems to have a bit more, you know, playability, but it's a, a little bit slower too. So that's not one I think we've seen on the channel before. I don't remember showing this one before either. So um, when I get to the 1984 part on the website, I'll definitely have to put this one in there as well. And then the other game that he decided to play is uh, another Star Wars theme one. And this is Return of the Jedi, which I'm trying to remember if Ken's still on here. I think we played this one, the game on challenge a long time ago, but I didn't get a chance to look for the show. Um, but basically, it's by Thunder Vision, and they had a couple games for the Coco, including another Joust clone that we've never seen, because I've never been able to find a copy of that one, um, which would put our Joust clones up to, what, four or five now? Um, but this one is actually is, is, is nice in that it's not... The, the first level of this is very similar to... Um, well, it's a Spectrum game that got ported the Coco in 2009. Uh, Death Chase. And so it's the first level of this is very similar to that where you're going through a forest and you're trying to shoot things and and, and you're also trying to rescue Ewoks technically. <clears throat> and you have to dodge logs and trees and stuff, which are all done in a 3D you know, perspective. But unlike that one, which just goes between two different patrol times, like there's, a, I think the Spectrum version had a night patrol and a day patrol. The Coco Dragon version had a regular patrol and an ice patrol just to fit the palette change. But this one actually has two different additional levels of doing other things where you have to fly through this 
you know, set of walls with one little opening you have to get to before you run into it. And then the third one, you have to shoot the dead center of a satellite tower and uh, to, to blow it up. So you actually have a couple different things to do. So for those of you who have not seen it before, I will play a little clip of each level so you can kind of get a feel for it. And this uses some um, higher semi-graphics on the text screen. So it'll look weird if you play this on a Coco 3 for the text screen that has the intro and the high scores. But the actual gameplay screens will run fine. So you can see it's kind of the 3D perspective of trees coming and you're flying around on Fessor a little bit because he's on a low level of skill, so stuff doesn't show up till later. So these uh, other cyclists, they will start uh, trying to ram you a little bit till you hit a tree, but you can also ram them into a tree, which is very satisfying, I might add. Or you can shoot them because after a while, they'll start driving off into the distance and you can shoot them off there. And then you occasionally get the little sound signal to tell you there's an Ewok you're trying to rescue. There's a Ewok on the left or the blue guy. So that's pretty similar to Death Chase um, in gameplay and even color look if you've seen the Coco version before. But then when you get to the second level, now you got to navigate through these walls and you cannot slow down or speed up. You have to steer left and right to get to them. It's actually not that hard until you get to the harder skill levels, but... Uh, a little bit of different play, no shooting, no no getting enemies or anything like that. And then after that is the satellite, which I will fast forward to the second game he played where he actually did manage to kill it. So basically you're zooming up on this satellite building. You have to shoot that little dot in the middle to blow it up. And then you just cycle through at a faster speed. So it's actually a fair bit of variety. It's uh, 16K RAM required and on the Dragon. Obviously, you came with 32, so they could have improved the game a little bit, but it was converted directly from the American one. Um, so it's using, because of the you know amount of code and, and stuff in there for all three levels, it can't do double buffering. So you'll see a little bit of rippling, like it's not as smooth as it could have been you know, on, say, a 32K machine where you could have double buffered. But still, I, it's a fun game. It's got a couple different levels, which are a little bit different in gameplay each. So that's... Uh, it's, it's one of the better ones. If you had to pick a Star Wars theme game that's on the Coco, this is probably be my favorite. Uh, I was going to ask anybody in the panel who's played any other games that are kind of Star Wars really. We have Intergalactic Force and a few others where you're in the trench as well. Uh, Advanced Star Trench Warfare, which I mentioned earlier. Does anybody here have a favorite Star Wars themed one since that happens to be the theme of Coco Fest this year as well? Or have you guys played them? There's even a Star Trek adventure game including Nitrous 9 if you want a text adventure based on it. Sazigi by Spectral Associates is kind of a semi real time through uh graphical adventure game that actually has some star wars stuff like you get to could do a real time uh lightsaber fight with Darth Vader in the dark it's another bit there too but uh out of the out of the people on the panel is anybody or in the chat for that matter has anybody played any of the other star wars games related games for the coco and what did they think of them compared with this one or have they played this one yeah. have you played this one rick or no, I was just thinking, Ken, we need a fest game theory um, theme. <laughs> I wonder what fest game theme we might use. <laughs> Ken, is this one on your short list? Assuming Ken's at his desk or even awake. He's warped away. <laughs> I'm taking that as a no. Nick, have you ever played this one? No, not this one. Was there any um, um, space simulation attacking TIE fighters type games on the Coco? Uh, well, if you play Intergalactic uh, Force by Antec, it, it's basically in the trench, but you do have the, the Star Wars, you know, TIE fighters and stuff coming, and you got to shoot the, you know, the holes in the bottom of the trench, and you got bars and stuff you got to fly under over too. I was thinking something more like um, the old Starfire type games. 3D in space type thing. All right. Just yeah. Space wars in general. It, like, yeah. I mean, technically, I guess Project Nebula kind of has TIE fighters. It's part of the theme. It's a Star Raiders clone, but it has TIE fighter ship that you're attacking. So that kind of. Mm. Though it doesn't try to play off of Star Wars like you know some of these do. I'm trying to think of any others. I can't. 
We've got like three trench games, I know. Right, which I guess we can blame Star Wars for inventing the trench game. Um. <laughs> I was always more into Star Trek myself, so I played a lot more of those, but. Yeah, me too. And that one we just covered recently on the Game on Challenge, the uh, Star Trek Simulator clone from Spectral called Space Wreck, actually is quite good, even though they stole the Star Wars theme to play music there because they wanted to get hit with double copyright hits. Right. <laughs> All in one game. <laughs> now, Sixie's mentioning Dark Star. That was a dragon game. I've actually played it. It's been ported to the Coco afterwards. That's actually a pretty good one with some TIE Fighter stuff on it, too. If I remember, if I'm thinking the same game. I think it's a PML3 style, which I don't think we've played that one on the thing. That might be one to throw in the game on challenge, too. I know Ken was at one point talking about trying to get multiplayer games because it's a lot more fun. You know, we're all at a fest in person, you know, to be able to play head to head, you know, simultaneously on certain games. And there's certain games in the Coco that actually allow more than two players um, with, you know, combinations of keyboard and joystick controls. Rampage. Yeah, Rampage, Gantlet, Gantlet Players. 2. Um, and a lot of two-player games that can be played simultaneous. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure what he's going for the theme. It sounds like he has stepped away, so we'll have to revisit when he's back. But, yeah, maybe we com combine and do uh, multiple games where we do both a multiplayer theme and a Star Wars theme simultaneously so people can mix it up. Next up after that, uh, Sibling Rivalry, AJ and Tim. Uh, this is episode 128. They decided to play Fighter Pilot, which is actually one we did play on the Game On Challenge not too long ago, about a year ago, I think. Year and a half. And uh, AJ did pretty good. She didn't quite win, but she didn't lose by much. And uh, she beat Tim's original score. So Tim had to kind of come back to, to, to play better to get it. And uh, this is kind of a... Sort of a clone of 1942, the arcade game. Not quite, but pretty close. So I'll just play a little bit of it here for those who have not seen the game. Mm. Not that bad. But it's right about my speed, so I kind of like it. Mm. And this is really one that if you have a Coco 3, if, if you yeah, find the gameplay too game. slow, Thank you. Uh, you can do the double speed book and it literally doubles in speed, so it'll we're, we're kick it in over there. We're going through the dregs. What does that mean, the dregs? Anyways, usually it has their, uh, you know, flipping humor and, you know, trash talking each other the whole bit. So it's a lot of fun to watch. They do, you know, respond to comments quite well. So if you have any sarcastic things to say to them in the comments, feel free. They will respond usually within 24 hours, if not less. So uh, it, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I look forward to the next batch of Coco Games, too. They've done a couple of the last uh, few shows here. So that's that's been fun. And then the last one I got for the game stuff um, is a release that just happened this morning. Actually, Paris Rat, uh, of course, is famous for doing all the AGD ports from the Spectrum to the Dragon and the Coco. And he's also got that little side project where he's been doing updated versions of those games for the Super Sprite FM Plus board, which is basically MSX hardware on a card that you plug into a Coco Dragon so that you get a sound chip that does background sound. You have hardware sprites. You have uh, way more color on the screen, et cetera. So he's converted... Pack number 10. So this adds four more games. So if you have a Super Sprite FM Plus now, uh, you've got at least 20 or 30 games now that can use, actually more than that, probably 40 to 60 games that you can use that, that takes advantage of the hardware. So this particular pack here, now I will mention, he posted about this on the Dragon Group and Facebook, and it's available for the Coco as well. Uh, but for some reason, he could not upload it to where he normally does on the World of Dragon forums. Um, he said he got a permission denied type thing. So I'm um, hopefully I'll get fixed soon. But he's actually posted it on a Spanish site right now, which is where he's from. He's from Spain. So if you want to download it, you can get the Dragon, the Docs, and the Coco version here. And of course, it requires a super, super Sprite FM Plus board by Dragon Electronics, Dragon Plus Electronics. John Whitworth, uh, he might be in the chat too. Um, the, the four games that he's converted this time around are Astronaut Labyrinth with music, Doom Pit Part 1, Doom Pit Part 2, and Doom Pit Part 3. And as usual, Pear has been really good with doing screenshots. You can kind of see what it looks like. And this runs on a Coco 1 or 2 or a 3 with this upgrade card. So you don't need a Coco 3 for this. And you can see already there's a lot more color on here than you'll ever see in a Coco 1 and 2 normally. 
So this is Astron Labyrinth. You can see the actual you know, intro screen there, and then you can see some of the gameplay here. Uh, he didn't make any videos this particular time, but we've seen a few of them before. It's super smooth because it's Harbor Sprites, and it's got you know the three voice music going in the background. And uh, this one looks pretty pretty decent. A nice platformer. Here's Doom Pit Part One. Which is kind of almost reminds me of like Mine Rescue or Super Pitfall, the way the screen's set up. Looks like you have ladders and stuff you can traverse and go between screens up and down. And you've got baddies and stuff to pick up. And it's even got like underwater levels here where it actually changes the color. So you actually go down. I don't know if you have air you have to worry about in that level. That'd be pretty interesting to try that one. And there's Doom Pit uh, Part Two. And the color scheme on this one almost looks like it was designed for the Cocoa with all the green. But then the game gets back to normal. But basically, it looks like it's, it's, Three games that are using the same basic premise, the same basic graphics, but just adds more and more levels and stuff to go through. So um, I'm not sure what the white areas here. I've seen that on a couple of the screenshots on part two. And then you got Doom Pit part three. And and as with all the AGD games, there's both keyboard and joystick controls. So you take your pick which way you want to use. So it's it's really good because of all the we've got several different third party hardware add ons that you extend the graphics, extend the sound on a Coco one, two, or three. Um, Tandy themselves put out the speech sound pack, which added three voice music as well. Uh, but there wasn't a ton of support in the sound speech pack. I guess had about 30, 40 games. Unfortunately, most of them just use the speech part, which is honestly the speech sound pack's weak point, not the strong point. Um, but uh, you know, since uh, John Worth brought out the Dragon. Plus electronics, uh, MSX, you know, hardware to the Coco and the Dragon here. Pair has been actually pretty good about putting out, you know, these packs every once in a while so that you're getting a whole bunch of new stuff to play. And these would take a while to convert. So uh, my hat's off to him. And uh, glad that he brought another four games to enjoy on this hardware. So that, now this is now, I think, pretty well officially the second most supported graphics and sound extension upgrade card you can get for a Coco 1 or 2 or a Dragon. And it's got, you know, a numerous number of uh, games for it now. So a lot of stuff to fiddle around with and have fun with. And that pretty well covers the uh, game news this week. I haven't had a chance to check to see if our other guests have shown up yet. Doesn't look like it's quite here. I don't really want to go into full-blown news. But, uh, Tom, maybe we'll just get you to help with a little bit of the intro stuff out of the way. Uh, yeah. Before we get there, can I just ask a question? Uh, sure. Sort of generic dragon coco question mainly about the games okay okay what is the deal with this green background because that's is the, the most off-putting thing when it comes to looking <laughs> at the dragon and coke and some games seem mm. fine and others just go oh here's the default vomit green background and it's just like that's what you get why why yeah. welcome to the beauty of the motorola 6847 video right. display generator you go yes, to the war to with me. the colors yeah. you have not the colors you want yeah, this is a very old video chip. It actually predates the Coco, which came out in 1980 by two years. It originally was like on the Fairchild Channel F and some other machines in the late 70s. And uh, yeah, they picked it. Actually, well, we covered one thing in the news here that uh, there's a bit of a theory as to the pastel color set, which most of us view as even worse than the vomit green that you're talking about. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Ooh, yeah. But, but in, in North America, we got lucky that we got artifact colors on NTSC, just like the Apple II did. So we actually have a mode that has white, red, blue, and black. And also, you can sneak in some greens and purples and stuff if you do some cross-hatching techniques and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, that does not work on Palo. You get uh, some yeah, really hideous yeah. purples and yellows kind of scattered around. looks like crap. So on the Dragon, most of the time, they picked one of the pure color sets, which is either going to be green, yellow, blue red or white cyan magenta orange um oh, yeah. that's the one we nicknamed the pastel set or you they can do black and white which is what a lot of the spectrum you know conversions do they just say screw it we're just doing 256 by one and two black and white or black and green if you really really like green you have that <laughs> option as well but to, um, to not joke the the whole problem with ntsc ne never the same color they called it is that it is not a digital in any way thing to do so you can only do phase changes digitally by certain fractions of a wave, and you're going to get certain colors for that phase change. And you just have to live with those because there's no way to do 172, 374 digitally. <laughs> so, so you get the colors you get, and uh, you pick the best you can. 
Now, one thing I will say in the Dragon's Defense, they use the higher semi-graphics modes, and that's a unique thing. The VDG itself doesn't do semi-graphics modes normally. Um, you have to have a SAM chip as well in conjunction with it to get that. And basically what that does is it takes, like there's a low res mode on the Cocoa and Dragon, which has nine colors at once. All the colors I just named plus black. Um, and it also allows you to do text. Now, in the higher modes, basically, it just takes all the scan lines for all those individual things because they're character cells, and you can split them on each scan line and then switch the next scan line to have totally different characters. So you basically get the equivalent of a 64 by 192 nine-color mode. And the Dragon used this mode a lot more than the Coco did. We had some pretty good Coco games using it too, but not as many. The Dragon, I think, did it a lot more. And that actually starts to look like decent. You can actually get blacks. You actually get all the eight primary colors that the, the VDG supports. And there's even a few others you can sneak in if you switch color sets in a text mode. So those actually those actually don't look too bad, but they look like Atari 2600. They're really fat, wide pixels yeah, and really okay. short. Yeah. yeah. Um, as to why you guys didn't get as many of those as, as you probably could have, I think a lot of the stuff was ported from NTSC in the States. And your choice was to try to dumb it down to a P mode three, which is basically those four color, pure color sets, which mm. sometimes look like absolute crap. Um, but a lot of the American companies were kind of lazy and didn't want to change all the code to you know, make it look better, pick the colors a bit differently. They just you know, dumped the entire thing as it was because it, it, oh, it will map the same right. on the screen. Okay. So yeah. they just kind of okay. left it. Yeah. Uh, or they went, you know, the option of just playing black and white with, you know, vertical stripes for yeah. blue and yeah. red type yeah. thing. Which is kind so, of what happened with the original uh, Apple IIs when Apple II first, sort of the first imported ones came over here. And of course, as you know, they relied on NTSC Artifact for the color generation. Yeah, yeah. So it was actually strict, it was exact same strictly thing a black and white machine until they had the, the Euro Plus, which had the adapter board to sort of generate PAL colors. Yeah. So yeah, it's, so I'm familiar with the concept. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah and just, there are some black just, and white games that actually look quite good. I mean, that's what the Mac started with. Yes, yeah, it's yeah, good games too. Thing. So yeah, yeah, it's just it's the one thing uh, since since being in sort of retro scene, um, especially the last sort of decade or so, is when I've seen dragons and cocos. It's just why that background is. You know, it just yeah, we, we just, nicknamed it, it nuclear it. green because it burns your yeah. retinas out. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you what it is. It just it was whenever I saw a version of Chucky Egg playing. Now I know Chucky Egg from the BBC Micro, okay, and I saw Chucky Egg playing. I think it was the dragon version. Yeah. on this default background and i was just like you have got to be kidding me that can't be a thing <laughs> right. <laughs> yep so that's kind of my starting point you know so. and as nick likes to complain because it had pal down in, in uh, australia too is yeah. that yeah you 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 could pick you know if you had to use those those four primary colors the green yellow blue red mode there are some good things you can do with that but you had no control over the border color the filled in border outside the main graphics had to be green so yeah. that kind of people filled in green as a default background because it made it seamless. Otherwise, you have this green block around oh, your actual graphics. So it just looks crappy. So that's why Nick always bitches that the VDG did not have border control. Because uh, yeah. he said you could have done a lot better, made it a black background or made it you know, one of the other colors or something that would have been a lot better. Well, I have seen, again, Tony Jewell at the, one of the last Cambridge festivals. They actually had a, I forget, you, you mentioned it on the show a lot, some VGA card or something, which he had fitted. Uh, the Coco VGA. That's it, yes. Yeah. And he had one of those. I think it was actually fitted to one of the Dragons or something very similar to it. Yeah. yeah. And he yeah. showed me a version of Chucky Egg, and it was running with black backgrounds. And I went, well, that's brilliant. Why couldn't it do that by default? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's because of that really, really old video chip that yeah. yep. Motorola made. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's that chip bit... came out a year or two before the Atari 8-bit machines came out. That's how old it is. Oh, it's... God. Exactly. Right. So what are we talking? 70... 78 is when it came out. 78, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that is early. Yeah, because even the Coco CPU didn't actually go on sale to the public until, you know, 79, 80. So it mm. was a year or so afterwards. So, yeah. And now it looks like uh, our other two guests have shown up as well. So we'll introduce them as well. So first of all, Tom Williamson, who we've been chatting with the whole show so far. We also got Paul Monaghan who is Mono. the editor, and Ian Griffiths, otherwise known as Pixels at Dawn, if you're on the Amigos Retro Gaming channels. And uh, I've been, I've actually, Nick and I both have been on with him on the International Computer Club. There's another one of those coming up soon, too. So Definitely welcome, is. everyone. Hello. Evening or afternoon. Uh, it's probably <laughs> afternoon for all you guys. Maybe, maybe uh, Nick, I think it's still evenings. morning, Nick, in Australia. Still morning. Of it's course, of course. In the morning. <laughs> all time. I'm though. sorry, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> He gets up at like three in the morning to get on our show. He's insane. I'm oh, awake wow. now. 
<laughs> it's late in the day, 5 a.m. <laughs> so is it, it like obviously with such a uh wide panel of uh guests and things to take it? We've got soft drinks, liquor, <laughs> diet coke, coffee, you know. I've heard our show is better to listen please. to with liquor. I have heard that. That's uh... <laughs> Just oh. soft drinks for me today. <laughs> oh, see, I've got I've got uh, coffee and diet coke, so that'll keep me going for a bit. Yeah. Okay. Now. Yeah. So, hey, welcome, oh, no, welcome you to you all. all. And I, <laughs> I, to get started, I wanted to go in a bit of a history of the magazine and the other magazine that kind of started all. I think there's just two magazines that are regularly published, and you got some yes. laughs that you guys do. Yeah. yeah. So, um, the first one was Amiga Addict, and that was started about what four or five years ago now, I think. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, three, it's three, getting three, four, yeah. Three and a half? Three and a, three and a half, that's about. That's Almost. About right, yeah. We kind okay. of started it off at the, the very tail end of 2020, so. Um, now, were the three of you involved at that point, or did you guys all join in later? I um, wasn't. Uh, sorry, I've got to let Ian talk on this bit. I'm so I can't sorry. remember, sorry. It's, it's as well, well as he did. All right. Sorry if I, right. Tell me if I get any of this wrong, only because I mentioned it on another show. <laughs> Basically, I mean, I remember because I'm into my games magazines. I remember seeing a post to say that a new Amiga magazine was coming, and it was going to be. Um, they just needed, you know, that initial um, purchases up front to obviously get it funded, like most issue ones do. Uh, and that must have been about October 2020, because right. it was just before. I turned 41 because I wasn't, I, I, I bought the magazine because I was like, oh, wow, a new A4 Amiga magazine. And being away from the Amiga scene for so long, um, I was like well behind on what had happened. In my eyes, most of it had just ended, you know, late 90s. Um, but then I remember um, Jonah asking me, do you want to write something? And for someone who's always wanted to write for games magazines or something like that, um, what happened was he he says, well, you know, write something. So I wrote a first piece um, about my history with Amiga magazines. And that was just before I turned 41, because I always said I want to write something and get something in a magazine or at least pitched while I'm still 40. So it must have been just before hitting 41 when I sent it yeah. to Jonah for a future issue. So but is Jonah then, the founder of this whole yes. enterprise? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's uh, my boss. Um, so, yeah, so, <laughs> uh, you know, at the time, it was a monthly magazine. And for the first, I'll probably say the first five or six issues, it stayed monthly. But it's very, very hard to do um, an A4 magazine, even at 60 pages. Well, I think it started off at 56 or something, just under um but obviously with a lot of people doing it in spare time um or part time um yeah it soon it soon was going well tell you what should we just do this every six weeks and do eight issues a year which is still a big ask but even if things are running a bit late we've always got it to the um you know on sale date deadline um and that's like i say it's it's three and a half years which sounds absolutely crazy that's the first piece i did yeah that's um, an issue two yeah mark yeah. if you can zoom up uh, ian's uh thing there we can kind of show it at the amiga Attic magazine looks like so oh that was, Marcia, um, i can't spotlight him any higher than that i know it's sorry <laughs> but taking the rest basically, what that showed was I, I I I can't remember how many words I did. Probably about four thousand words, just about magazines. And then um, back then, I didn't do any editing, didn't do anything like that. I was just a fan. Um, so that was sent in, and then they showed me it when it was all laid out. So I didn't even take any pictures, and we just went, okay, well, we're gonna show a few pictures of these magazines along the top of the top of the page. Yeah. It shows things like Amiga format the one Amiga, Amiga Action, um, CU Amiga. There were so many UK Amiga magazines at the time, as well as the multi-format uh, computing magazines. And then also you had um, the proper serious things like Amiga Shopper, you know, for all your hardware and all your, um, telling you more about all your graphics cards and all your upgrades and external drives. And, you know, as a 14-year-old, that didn't do anything for me, you know, um, so yeah, when it, when it showed me that, I went brilliant. And then I joined the team on issue three, 
Uh, and the first piece I did was about a UK weekly games magazine called Games X, which is one of my favorites. And that only ran from 1991 to 1992. Um, because when I've interviewed people who worked on the magazine, um, including uh, Gary Witter, who then went on to write Book of Eli, Star Wars Rogue One, um, After Earth, and many other various films and screen, you know, screenplays and things. Um, everyone said how hard it was to make a weekly magazine, you know, even back then, you know, having to get the news, get it all printed, and, you know, sometimes like a five-day turnaround, you know, so... Um, that's something that I've learned um, as an adult. <laughs> that even at six weeks, it can be a uh, can be quite hard. But then you know, joining the team properly on issue three, because like I say, Ian was there from the start, and I'm going to let him chat in a minute because <laughs> we we all had ideas what we wanted to cover. Because while it was, while it was still early days, you think um, you've got like a hen entire blank slate of your classic Amiga things. Um, which everyone likes. So what I class more is like your clickbaity type subjects to go, oh, look, sensible world of soccer, cannon fodder, um, you know, gods, monkey island and things like that. But you expect them to be covered. And then from my point of view is, and this is something we'll come on to with uh, Pixel Addict and Tom, um, I've now got to the stage since doing this, I've got a much more understanding and need for knowledge about learning new things because on the game side, I'm good. And now like I was listening to uh, your last your show last week of um, Coco Nation. I was like, okay, I'm learning things. And I'm, I'm going to sound a bit daft saying this, but I was quite proud of myself because I actually understood a little bit of it. But a couple <laughs> of years ago, I, I, honestly, a couple of years ago, a lot of it would have gone over my head. So, you know, there's things like when you talk about the Apple II VGA cable, and I was like, ah, I mentioned that in the magazine, you know, and stuff. I'm just going, oh, yeah, that's quite a cool piece. And just like all these little things now that I'm picking up. So I have my list of topics and ideas I wanted to cover. And then um, Ian's into a bit of everything. And then you've got people like Ravi on the magazine who's like, yeah. oh, have you ever seen this? And you're like going, what the hell is this hardware? I've never heard of it. And then I'll tell you about it. So that's where the curiosity comes in. Because again, I'm going to say this quite a lot, but the day you stop wanting to learn, you've given up, man. You really, really have. So I'm I'm picking up new things. And the big thing for me is what happened for the Amiga between, say, 98 and now. So you had this 20-year gap where, you know, um, there was obviously still, you know, Amiga hardware being used here and there. There were still people making games. And I feel like, Amiga Addict came out at the right time, back where the scene is relatively healthy. And in regards to software coming out for it, we're almost back to the, I'd probably say the 96, 97 era of, of Amiga software releases, where so much is coming out of different quality. And, you know, some are like nice quick games, but some have got so much work going into them. And because now we're all hitting the age of say thirties and forties and grew up with these machines. You young You want to sort of get into the nitty gritty and find out what's what's going on and how can I do this? How can I do that? It's it's exciting, honestly, it really is. But yeah, I will let uh, Ian say more about Amigo Addict. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. you know, I was kind of wondering like what what brought up the idea to actually publish. Like this is a for those that don't know, this is a physical magazine and also an electronic download. But yeah. bringing out like almost all the computer magazines, at least here, have just died off. You can't even you get most of them on shelves anymore. Yeah. Um, what made you guys decide to actually bring out a physically printed magazine in 2020? I mean, uh, there's still a little bit of a legacy of magazines still in the UK. There's a, there's a, as much as the US things have died off, but you can still fill a couple of shelves in a, in a, in a news agents with a, with computer magazines like, uh, Retro Gamer magazine is very popular in terms of games in the UK. There's still, uh, I think, Linux user still going. Yeah. There's Raspberry Pi magazine. Um, um, so Edge has just yeah. done 30 years. Edge has been around forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so they, they still exist. They're certainly, um, I wouldn't have said struggling, but it's certainly a harder, uh, harder market than it's ever been before. Yeah. Um, but people still love to have a physical magazine. It, even more so in these days, I think that there's definitely 
a lot more of a precedent uh, even in the last sort of five years for people to even even young people should we say <laughs> young people um to to um to get physical media uh things like vinyl things like cassettes and and uh and um and yeah, because vinyl outsold like CDs this last year. I just heard that last exactly, year. Exactly, so. exactly. Because it, it, I think people have have a little bit of a fatigue in in terms of quite everything being digital. Uh, yeah. And the, and then if the company yeah. that made a digital thing disappears, all of a sudden you can't view it anymore. Yeah, don't even start me on that. We'll and it, we'll eat into that six hours in no time. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But it, it's there's a there's a ability to to step away from the digital world or whatever. We 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 frequently have people sending us pictures of them lying on a lying on their towel on the beach reading the magazine or uh, or just just sat in the back room with a a cup of coffee or a cup of tea just uh just taking an issue because it's just that separation and switching off. Uh, and, and being able to uh, to use now, do, do you that think way. launching it, you know, right right before COVID really started, hit really helped that because a lot of people well, went back in nostalgic because <laughs> they're trapped at home, they're bringing out their old equipment and trying it out again. Do you think that really helped? It it probably helped in a way that that it's um there's there's pros and cons, shall we say? So yes. so it was definitely it was it definitely beneficial from in terms of yeah, people were isolated and and were looking for to take in media. Um, but equally, it was difficult to get things out to people as well, um, yeah. because yeah. Um, especially because we we ship magazines worldwide, um, it was very difficult to get magazines even across the states um, because a lot of the post goes in the back of passenger flights. So if Which there's no passenger exist. flights, <laughs> there's no shipping basically. So, yeah. so yeah. either it was taking ages because it was going on a on a on a on a ship, or or it's or occasionally it would get an airmail or it gets stuck somewhere in a, a post office in, in deepest Massachusetts or something like that. Um, I'm having horrible flashbacks to to, <laughs> to, to uh, messages and things like that. Yeah, I know yeah. one thing you've not touched on there, Ian, was like oh. here in the UK, in the last few years, we've had, and this is what Jonah always bangs on about so much, it's a nostalgia side and... Um, what what we have like as a limited choice of magazines in certain topics so we still have like a couple of horror magazines dark side and um shivers uh, which have both been going for some time we used to get fangoria over in the uk yeah. and i know that ended for a while and then i think it made a bit of a comeback um as a us print magazine which sometimes you saw it over here but then also we have things like classic pop magazines, you know, like looking at 80s music and stuff like that. Because also with like the vinyl revival, you've got um, artists like your Banana Rama, Tears of Fears, um, you know, Duran Duran. And all these artists are like really popular. Yeah, they're really riding second or third wave of popularity, you know, throughout their careers. So as well as actually wanting something to hold, I think it's that sort of like warm, fuzzy feeling as well of, um, you know, granted, it's not three pound an issue or, you know, a, a few dollars an issue anymore because obviously printing just costs so much and even paper <laughs> and stuff like that. But Yeah, paper I went think, nuts over COVID. Oh, crap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then again, like you said, when, when we were all in lockdown, we were buying anything, you know, because... I bought an entire box of Cadbury's cream eggs when we went into lockdown. I think I actually <laughs> went insane um, because I just went, I'm not going to be able to buy chocolate, you know, and go to the shop. So mm. I had Amazon deliver this box of Cadbury's cream. I'll, I'm so I will sorry. Just, I will tangent. just warn you, Paul, confectionery is a bit of a sore topic on this show, especially for Curtis. <laughs> so just do be, do be warned. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> but but I'll, I, I will, I will not want to move on. But, um, you know, I just, I just think like, um, people people want to, you know, not just with magazines, but with games as well. Um, I read today, what you touched on before, Curtis, was when you buy a game digitally, it's not there all the time. And the right. WWE... And they can revoke uh, it at any time. That's the oh, worst no, part. Oh, exactly. The, the WWE 2022 game has just been taken off the servers and also delisted. And you think that's only two or three years old, you know. And right. then I've got, say, my Super Nintendo games upstairs or we've got like Commodore 64 games or, you know, 
Coco games and stuff, and you can still play these from 40 years ago almost, you know, 30, 40 years ago. I would more or less bet when I look at my PS5 just to write to me, even in 10 years' time, there's going to be a load of games I've bought that I can't play anymore. Now, that makes right. me quite sad, you know, because it's erasing that history. And this is one reason why we're all here today to talk about, you know, history. And this is what, you know, you and the guys do every single week. You know, it's like, look at this that I've made. Look at that. But that's just come out. You know, let's, you know, see how it goes. All these different projects. People yeah. want to celebrate history and also preserve it, you know. I think the, but the anyway, benefit, I'm sorry. The what benefit of what you get in terms of um, um, modern things coming out and retro systems is um, is those sorts of things and the communities behind them are there to preserve those things. So even if the author of, of that title goes away, leaves the scene, doesn't come back, those titles will still get preserved. They'll be kept somewhere. Someone will have a copy yeah. because... We all, uh, as opposed to in the seventies, eighties, and nineties, we all know how important preservation is now. And uh, so yeah. back we, then, we, we were just dirty pirates. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Whereas now, whenever we see something online, it's like I need to stash that somewhere just in case. <laughs> so yeah. it's going to be on my hard drive, and if anyone needs it, it's there. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, um, so getting getting further into the the physical media yeah, uh, versus you know electronic media, we were just talking about the games and and, and software in general it doesn't have to be games per se. Um, what kind of divide do you have in the publishing of the magazine? Like you obviously uh, digital copies is quite expensive to shift to North or ship to North America or Australia or something like that. So I'm wondering what kind of a balance, I know you guys don't want to get into specific sales figures, but what kind of a balance percentage wise do you sell physical magazines versus digital and how much does it vary by region? Um, Again, this is where we probably need Jonah. We, we do ask him at times. Now, one thing that did change in the U S we did have the magazines for sale um, in Barnes & Noble for a while. But then Barnes & Noble really retreated on a lot of titles, like like you mentioned. And that was a bit frustrating because not everyone is obviously wanting to spend, say, what, $10 shipping and then 7 or $8 on a magazine, you know, because then you're spending almost $20 on a magazine. You know, now obviously we do still have some subscribers, you know, from various, you know, uh parts around the world you know us we've even got um an amiga addict uh reader over in japan which was absolutely crazy and that was quite early on because i thought someone in japan's actually reading stuff i wrote you know it's it's, um, cra it's crazy the ones we get i mean we we had a a shake over in saudi arabia i think who contacted God, yeah. jonah and said i want you to send me everything you've got all the merch all the magazines just put it in a big box and send it to me. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's crazy. We, we don't see many people in like Russia, say, um, or China, but I, I think we have had one or two. Uh, that We've had up. Sweden and things as well. Yeah. And Australia's always been, you know, fairly popular. Um, but again, obviously you have the cost of living ongoing fiasco but you know so it is a bit of a niche thing and some i know some readers have gone well i'm just gonna go digital for a while you know and um again it's it's just like i always like it at people actually reading you know what we've what we've wrote you know because there's a lot of thought that goes into it as well with like topics and stuff and we always try to alternate between a more serious um techie type topic or you know um serious software and then more of your game type thing as well. So, you know, one minute you might get, again, sensible soccer on the cover. And then the next minute, like for this one, Scala. Um, and it's sometimes just like covering the ones people don't expect. Again, like Scala, you know, which uh, magazines in the late 90s, like, you know, Amiga Format would touch that and stuff like that. But I think that's just it. I want every single reader to be looking through every issue and at least learn one thing new. Sorry, I sound like I'm lecturing people <laughs> or a teacher, but I just think there's enough stuff in there and enough variation that you should be able to take something out, you know, new. Because um, we've had quite a few um, comments as well with people. Again, I know it's jumping to Pixel Addict a minute, but again, with the Tandy cover, everyone's gone, oh, wow, that was actually interesting. And then, like as an editor, I've just gone, ah, oh, <laughs> finally you know yeah. that's all i want to hear because you're also here eh, it's not really me that one and all it takes 
like anything, you hear one negative, and my God, that eats away at you. You could have a hundred positives. That's why I don't read YouTube comments. <laughs> like, oh, no, I don't. no, oh, God, no, I can't. So, obviously, Amiga <laughs> Attic was enough of a success. You guys decided to do a second magazine, yeah. which was Pixel. Now, how long has that been going on now? That started um, late 2021, going into 2022. And again, that originally was I mean, more or less went straight into that six week cycle. Um, so this issue one here now I've, I'll yeah. hold my hands up. I've, um, sort of gone from Jonah's brief several times because he says it's going to be digital, uh, well, basically digital history and, you know, things like, uh, the computing and also a bit of tech. Um, and then there's sometimes where I've been ventured a bit much into gaming but then the next issue, I'll weigh it back onto more of a tech and computing type side. So this is where uh, Tom's going to come in in a minute. So you have a look at issue one. We cover quite a lot of Acorn and stuff like that. But then you've also got things like the Sega Dreamcast in there as well. And a little bit of arcade gaming. Arcade gaming, I think I've only touched on one, is one issue that I was editor of. So this um, is much more oriented and, towards home computers and consoles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, well, we're working on issue 20 now, so you think that's that's a fair few issues. So I took over as editor properly on issue four, um, and we had quite a few regular writers, some people really into the, um, we'll say the hardware failures and things like that, which, again, these are what I find interesting. So we've got a guy, Huxley, who some of you will know. I can't pronounce his surname. Um, this will come to me in a minute basically it's the guy who's wrote the tandy piece um so i'm probably gonna butcher this is that just like um dunsani uh, dunsani anyway huxley um so he's every issue been writing about you know technology failures computing failures and then uh, like for the issue 20 that i'm putting together at the moment he went oh yeah the turbo graphics and i went that was a failure you know really and then he goes, yeah, because when it got to America, this is why. And I was like, okay. So again, I wouldn't something. have called it a failure. It wasn't as popular as some of the other ones, but I mean, yeah, I had one I know, in my apartment yeah, with my roommates. So. But the way, no, 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 no. But Curtis, I, exactly. That's what I was thinking because here in the UK, we touched on it a little bit on things like um, a few console magazines. And then I suppose, like you say, compared to other machines, it's obviously not done as popular, but by going into the figures and everything like that, he made the argument because at first I went, okay, you know, a bit puzzled, but we'll roll with it. Trust you. You've never done me wrong. But then he showed me things like, you know, we've had pieces on things like the Palm Pilots, various ones. Um, the, um, oh God, what was it that was mentioned on the Retro Hour this week? The uh, next um, workstations, right? Like next computers. Yeah, Steve Jobs. Um, yeah, computers. yeah. So we've we've covered like Jobs' history a little bit. Um, I know this is going to be probably hard to see, but the one that I mentioned was uh, issue 17 with uh, the connection machine. And that was probably the biggest curveball because some people went, what the hell is that? And I was like, right. This turned into it says six page feature and turned into a ten page feature because it had such a history behind it. Um, a guy Danny Hillis came up with the idea with like a load of um university like MIT students, and then it just went on. This was about nineteen eighty four, maybe eighty five, and uh, we we got such a good insight as well from um the guy who did that piece. He interviewed um Tomiko uh, Thiel who designed it so obviously she gave some great insight into like what they were aiming for and why um and i was like this is amazing you know and that when i when i put that on like um my, my linkedin page people are like what is it and i was like well this is why you need to buy the magazine you need to read <laughs> this story you know um but then again we'll have something like um the tomb raider issue you know which was 30 years of Lara Croft, going from 1994 when the Tomb Raider games had work just starting out on them at Core Design. 
and going up to the remasters, which came out last month. But we do try not to go too games heavy. I think I've had two um, console exclusive type covers. A lot of the time, it's more of your, um, you know, classic computing, you know, so. So when, like when you do maybe, a games issue, do you basically pick something that became a franchise as opposed to a single game? So at least there's some history to go through or. Well, I, I always personally prefer a franchise because I think, again, I like seeing how a franchise evolves, you know, over the years. Um, I think if it's if it's going to be a one-off game, it'd have to be something really, really special, really special. Yeah. You know, um, I've had like a couple of people pitch ideas and like, well, one, one that we have got coming up um, is going to be looking at 40 years of Elite. Now, I know, obviously, Elite has been taught a lot. So I've asked, please try and get something new. And let's try and get some new insight. You know, I always need to get that hook, <laughs> you know, uh, because there's certain games which have been talked about till the cows come home. So I've got to be so careful. And we also want to be different to Retro Gamer. So I've had many phone conversations with Tom. And Tom's given ideas and I've, and he'll agree with me in a minute. And <laughs> I've said to Tom so many times, I am not techie and he's pitched ideas and I've gone, I'm understanding parts of that. And he'll go, well, it's just this and this and this. But one thing Tom has said, I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, Tom, um, as a look oh, down. Go on then. Go on. Screen. This will be interesting. Um, go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, because he always goes, what I like about Pixel Addict is it's got a bit of everything and it's not just games, games, games. Because retro game has been going for 20 years. And it's been going for 20 years for a reason. So you need to be looking for a different market. You know, yeah, you're, now, you want to be a clone see... of an existing product. Yeah, no, exactly. Stuff. Exactly. You're just going to try and cannibalize each other. But then, like, so obviously, um, retro game would cover Tomb Raider. And I know they have done. But then, like, I don't think we'd say cover Tandy's history and things like that. They might say have a spread on you know um, a tandy system you know just with a few specs like a little specs chart or something like that but we wouldn't go into great detail um so i think that's that's where basically with you know some very knowledgeable um like fanatical people out there fanatical in a good way um, yes <laughs> yeah you know it's uh, it does a job but you know tom you know why do you like it sorry it's gonna sound like i'm blowing me on trumpet but Tom will explain better why, you know. So can I ask a question here? Yes, yeah, sure, go ahead, Rick. Okay, so for instance, in the, the problem with digital music is you only listen to the hits. Yes. And that's it. Where a vinyl album, you're, you've got so much invested, you're going to listen to the whole album. Oh, yes. So a print, out, a print magazine is pretty much the same thing, right? Yeah. People are going to read everything you've presented in the magazine. They aren't going to just look at the cover ad and, and walk away. Is yeah. that kind of no, what that you're going makes, for? That makes sense. I mean, one thing I've tried to do, So some people have said certain um, sections need to be grouped together a bit better. So at the, <laughs> amazingly, in issue 20, I've gone, right, I've gone 100 miles an hour to free up a little bit of time to go, right, let's see what we can do to try and have the computing stuff together. Like a bit like using um, Amiga format as a bit of a template because they used to have like the game section. Although I just want to have all reviews be a because we're getting more and more book review uh, books sent to us to review. So we've got things like uh, what what's the one what's the Amiga and ST one that came out Flame Wars uh, the, the Flame Wars which is yeah. on my copy table yeah, so, that's actually yeah so that's <laughs> that's coming up. Uh, and then there's uh, eight bit stories coming up from uh, Mike uh, Nunnery, no, um, yeah, who does a load of stuff with. Uh, he's done some uh, a pet um, projects uh, about maybe a year and a half ago now, about a year ago. Sounds about um, right. He did, yeah. It, it must have been maybe last summer. Anyway, I know he's talking to events and stuff, so he's working on another a pet as well. Um, I should have just had a picture just to hold up or something. But anyway, <laughs> so um, so I want to say if it's games or hardware reviews or book reviews, keep them all together. Because um, like like you were just saying there, I want people to look through the entire magazine and go, oh, okay, 
that page doesn't necessarily interest me, but let's see what's next. What's to come? I know you've got the contents page, but then again, on an album, you've got the track listing anywhere in the back. But I want people yeah. to look at it and have like a bit of a eye-catching layout as well. Because sometimes, like, I think this is my age now at 44, almost 45. But when I look at Edge, and obviously Edge is a big deal because it's been going 30 years, which is really, really good for um, a games magazine. But the text is so small. I'm almost there with a magnifying glass. And sometimes <laughs> it's just like columns of text. I'm like, Jesus, it was last week when you all got your magnifying glasses out. And like, I was like, there you go. I'm just going <laughs> to, this is what I need sometimes, <laughs> you know, but I feel like we're trying not to shove as much text onto the pages now. So at 600. Yeah, from what you've shown, it's a very visual magazine. There's yeah, full color yeah, spreads we, and everything else. So we, we tried to make sure that there's like um, three or four pictures per page. And, you know, it's not just say six paragraphs all in the column because no one wants to read that. It gets boring and it hurts your eyes. Well, it hurts mine. Again, the we got used to it in the old days, but yeah, the market's <laughs> oh, different yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> it can be, yeah, exactly. it can be a bit intimidating as well because people people have said to us in the past, like I picked up the magazine, but and I'm flicking through and it's like, oh, there's so many words here. How am I going to find the time <laughs> to read all of this? Um, well, especially if they want, do and that's our education cover. system summed up right there. No, <laughs> well, again, I've, I've said I want to try and have a couple of quick quick win what what i've nicely crudely called just toilet reading where it's just a quick one page you never list called of five my stuff things. that before it's what you never called my stuff that before <laughs> 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 oh now it comes out great yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> but you know do you know what i mean so i've got like i'm trying to get that mixture of things because i think it, it's like you've got the big um, serious pieces and then also you just need to sprinkle in a couple of you know the smaller ones ideally as well but I think there's just so much out there and again with, with Pixladdit because I'll always want to cover the computing stuff and it's not I again I've said I'm not that technical I'm learning but I'm learning as I'm going along and for example when over on Amiga Addict when we've had the uh, Amos tutorial uh, done by a guy Keith He's now done eight issues, I think it is. Uh, and I've I got went, like oh nine my parts of it yeah. already. Oh, you've got nine <laughs> parts now. But I was like, oh my God, I understand this. It makes sense. And he went, yes. And I was like, you know what? If I had Amos open, I could maybe try to program something, which would be infinitely better than my awful, awful attempts on shoot em up construction kit at the age of 11 on the Atari ST. And I just went, what the hell am I doing? And turned it off and then loaded up a game <laughs> instead. You know, but no, um, it, it's it's hard. So when I speak to people like Tom, who's really, really techy and he's got so many projects on the go and he goes, I'm doing this. And I go, tell me about it. And then a quick five minute phone call turns into about 50 minutes a lot of the time. We, yeah, we've talked. Yeah, easily an hour. Yeah, well, it's kind of like little our little show. Little. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. All right, a couple of quick questions on, on the magazine format for Pixelatic in particular. So, um. How much of it is like one shot pieces, like on a cover story or something like that, versus regular columnists or, or regular columns? Like it could be by author, like they you continuously yeah. talk about stuff each issue, or maybe a certain subject, like you maybe have a, I don't know, a BBC um, micro corner or something where you talk about that. Or if it's so, sometimes people like, for example, we've got a uh, NES Assembly series going on at the moment, um, and that's been going on for about five issues. So talking about, you know, the whole coding with uh, NES Assembly, because the guy who's done it, a guy called Chris uh, McCauley, he does um, so much stuff. Honestly, this this guy is, uh, again, um, don't know where about St. Canadry lives, but he's originally from, I think it's Belfast. But anyway, sorry, I'm just babbling on there. And this guy is always doing project, 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 working, script writing for different TV shows. And he goes, oh, I'm teaching myself all these different coding languages. And I was like, oh, that sounds all right. You know, he goes, right, I've got an idea. I'm going to show you this. So, yeah. So what um, Ian's just put up at the moment. Again, oh, yeah, no, Nintendo assembly language, it looks like. Yeah. So quite text heavy, but it's still quite easy to read because we've printed the code and the... the 
instructions and everything like that. So if he just turns it over a sec, Ian, I can. Um, <laughs> you'll see there's a couple more pictures. So, you know, it's not too um, visual, this one, but it can't be because you need the space yeah. for the actual yeah. code. But I feel like because we've done the Amos guide before this, um, it makes more sense. So like when we speak to Josh, who lays out the magazine, um, we can say, make sure it's laid out this way. And then the way Chris will do it is say going, so type this code in and then it'll do a couple of paragraphs to go. And now this should be giving you blah, 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 blah. And then more code. But then people like, again, Huxley and like Tom and people like uh, Roy Templeman, uh, there's a page, uh, Templeman's Treasures. This guy collects hardware. And we're not just talking like hardware people have heard of. It's stuff like, oh, um, Roy, what, what are you going to cover this next issue? And he'll go, oh, it's this one. It got released in France. And, um, you know, it, it sold like about 2,000 copies. That's it. So... I can't remember. Is this it? Multitech one. Multitech, yeah. Yeah. Right. MF2 Multitech. M MPF2. Okay. So I, I'd never even heard of this at all. And again, I think he always laughs because I always go, how many games did it have? Because sometimes he's put machines in with it, which come with about four titles, you know, like in its entire history. Some parts have then obviously gone, oh yeah, they stopped making the machine. Instead, the components were then used for I don't know, like some, you know, other version, some other technology thing. And this is what I mean. I like it because I'm learning new stuff. So Royal will have something different every every issue. Um, and then you yeah, have got people, what, like say with the NES stuff, where it's a case of this has got seven or eight parts, you know. Um, and then, you know, it'll have a bit of a rest, you know. So it's, it's just, it's a good mixture. But then like the cover, the cover thing, I think one or two times, for example, um, say we had a, we had a feature on, I've not got it down here, the Silicon Graphics uh, workstations. So that was a cover feature, Silicon Graphics workstations. And then I think the issue after, we just had a smaller feature just on a bit of CGI in film, just like a two-pager, three-pager, you know, instead of your usual six or seven. So sometimes you do get that sort of like epilogue almost, because you you can't have 15, 20 pages because you're absolutely screwed if someone's not into it, you know. So, for example, I'm not just saying it because I'm on here tonight. I'll be looking out for more Tandy stuff to cover because, obviously, I'm seeing how popular it is. And then, again, it's sort of like getting that respect for machines that you're not too up on. And, again, I'm not just saying that because of my audience. God, I feel like I'm pitching for a job. <laughs> yeah. But... But, you know, it's. I think that's just it because there's so many machines out there and you yeah. want to do something different, but you also want to sell the magazine. It's, honest to God, it's such a fine line. You know? Yeah, but that's something different. Like if you do something like Randy Cape Digg's, uh Floppy Days podcast where he's kind of historically going through all the machines from every country yeah. and covering them. But he can do that because he's not trying to make money off of it or you know break yeah. even. He's just doing it for the fun and the information of it. You guys are actually a commercial enterprise, and you have to worry about paying people, you know, to write and yeah, and and to you know publish and ship and everything else too. So you guys have to take that commercial aspect of it and, and keep that in mind at all times. And that part just gets you know harder and harder, you know, with with obviously like I say, I'm cost of living side, but I just always feel like there's plenty to cover, you know. Yeah, you'll so never you run out because it's an ongoing industry. I yeah, mean, what's yeah, retro? Exactly. Tomorrow is what's current today. You know, if you're still no, going no, in 10 exactly. years. Yeah. Exactly. They, they, I'm going to say it because my wife mocks me for it and all they mock, they all mock me for it. But with uh, Amigo Addict, I always said it's like, here we go, Ian, past, present, and future of Amiga because you're talking about the past, what's obviously in the past. <laughs> See, I could just feel my wife upstairs just probably cringing, just going, Jesus, Paul, why are you doing this? But then because there's so much stuff coming out, it's going to give us more stuff to keep covering. And like you say, same with Pixel Addict. And again, if someone, say, like like Roy, chooses a console, I go, do you know what? There's more to cover there in more than a page and a half or two pages. I need more on this. 
you know, so again, things like Jobs is Next and stuff, I would not, I, I probably never even, you know, gave that a moment's thought before. But then there's certain topics I think you can, you know, return to and you go into more detail, you know, or like you say, you go to cover features and just do like little spin offs. You know, there's, there's a lot there. And you never it also know. depends. Like if you end up contacting some of the people originally involved, like maybe you saw the issue and they write back in, oh, I know some I background history you didn't know, you might say come that. back. I was just about to say that because you never know. The, the, the longer, you know, you go in and like say people see it and go, oh, wow, yeah, I remember this. And oh, I worked on that. And you go, what? Okay. Um, can I chat to you? And they go, yeah, sure. Like um, we went to um, the opening of the Northwest Computer Museum in Lee in the northwest of England, um, which is about five miles from where I am. And I went there with my son last summer. They were about to have their first birthday in um start of July. And um Dr. Steve Ferber was there uh doing opening it. And we covered Acorn a little bit. And I went up to him with an issue of the magazine because Jonah absolutely worships him. I went, Hello, sir. Sorry to bother you. Please can you sign this magazine for <laughs> my boss? And can I get a picture as well? And I was just like, Yay. So he can't make, sadly, the, year, the year's anniversary, but he will go there again because he's still local in Manchester. And I think those are the sort of people, when you've actually proven yourself and people then know who you are, like you're not just like a fanzine. You know, I'm not belittling fanzines. You know, it's like a, it's, it's a high-quality product as well, and I know that's what I keep banging on about. Um and I don't know. I feel like that's where you get the bigger names involved and stuff. And, you know, like when I used to do, when I had more time to do the um, podcast, I did Maximum Power Up. All I did with that my, on my episodes was interview um, X Games journalists. So starting with one, that built up to 49 different people, including some really big name, you know, guests and stuff who've become authors or we've gone into the games industry so i that's why i feel like everything we do is building blocks so be it you're working on projects and then that gets you known or you know a, a podcast hobby has led to this in my 10-year journey it was end of 2013 i did my first ever podcast talking about the atari st and games magazines, ironically. Um, <laughs> and then 10 years on, you know, I'm I'm here. You know, this is all I wanted to do uh, as a teenager. But back then in the 90s, if you told your teachers you just wanted to write for games mags, they just laughed at you, you know. Yeah, um, when, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. But then all I did, I spent all my paper round money on games magazines. You know, I spend money now on games magazines. Like... I showed these the other day, like the other night, just through the post again, just old Amiga magazines, quite rare ones because they're like end of the life, 1995. So I look at this and some of these now cost so much money. Like oh, this one, like, you know, you're probably looking at 20 pounds because it's like 30 pages right at the end of the Amiga's commercial life. But I've got this morbid curiosity to see, you know, like these magazines that have gone on a extreme diet. Of, um, yeah, our, our, our biggest magazine, Rainbow Magazine, ended up being published as a newspaper. It was actually starting to lose money, but the original publisher, Lonnie Falk, who also ended up being the mayor of his town later on, oh, wow. he, he so loved the platform. He just wanted to keep it going. Even though it was losing money every month, he kept it going as long as he could, you know, shrinking it, then switching from glossy pages to newsprint. You know, just trying to keep it going, and it went twelve, yeah. almost thirteen years. But wow, I mean, that's just it. It's it is a niche thing, but I just think like I, I think it's needed. I mean, like I say, when you do go into WH Smiths over in the UK, because even news agents tend not to have you know independent news agents tend not to have magazines anymore. They just sell vapes cigarettes chocolate and drinks <laughs> i think that's more or less it you know yeah. you don't go in and like again like say back in the 90s when i had paper rounds you used to have so many rows and yeah. rows of magazines the Every computer section thing. was like an entire wall i remember oh, that really? at one of our amazing. bookstores it was absolutely amazing i mean uh, like even when we used to get a few of the uh, us magazines in like game pro and egm 
and like you know i i sometimes bought those but only because you guys got a lot of games that we never got in the uk you know so when we go to our game shops the independence and we'd have uh import titles and you'd be like i've never even heard of this one you know because sometimes the uk mags didn't cover it and again now this is one good thing about the digital age things are a lot more accessible you know um unreleased games are being found again and put out yeah, you know we like, got a few of those too you know that's that's so important and again new games are being made for old systems and that's something i absolutely love you know um one of the things again in pixel addict is uh homebrew heroes and that's looking at the homebrew and indie scene for things like games on the mega drive the nintendo game boy uh you know more of the consoles um and it's just i, I didn't think you would have this many games coming out for old systems you know, like if you'd have asked me even 10 years ago. So let's go back to, like, let's say go back to 2010. You know, I didn't think it'd be this healthy. You know, you've got now things like, you know, the Spectrum Next and so many people obviously coding different titles for that. And, you know, obviously it smashed its first Kickstarter. It smashed its second Kickstarter. You know, there's rumors they're going to do another Kickstarter for it as well. You know, um, I, th I think what has helped, if I can just butt in there, um, yeah, is on, especially in the UK, but also globally is we've had the kind of the raspberry pi revolution which yeah. happened around that's kind of when i started to come back into things around uh yeah, things like the mister and stuff too yeah. yeah yeah and that just people suddenly became more interested now in the uk it kind of sparked off a lot of enthusiasm for uh the bbc micro which we all had in schools as opposed yeah. to apple II. we didn't really have the apple II in schools it's bbc micro here and that for me sparked off and people suddenly could take the pies and uh, the British government then decided we were going to have a second computer literacy age. Back in the 80s, mm. uh, the whole reason the BBC Micro existed was it was a government commission to ACON to make a government issue computer they could put in schools to teach kids how to program. That was the, the point of the machine. And although it wasn't officially done through the Pi Foundation, the Pi Foundation launched their product. And then the government said, actually, we'll sort of jump on board this in kind of one scheme or another. And then, so coding became compulsory in British state schools again. How successful that's been is another argument for another day. <laughs> but it did it did open up the whole sort of psyche. And then people, well, basically adults, got hold of Raspberry Pis. And then we figured out we could start emulating games on them. And then suddenly there was interest in the retro hardware. And, oh, I remember that. I'd actually quite like a BBC Micro in my case. Or people started digging up ZX Spectrums. And the next thing you know is we're getting new generation hardware being created. And it all kind of sparked off itself over the last sort of 10 years or so. Um, Yo, so oh. coming in with the magazines when you did kind of literally sat on top of that wave of interest yeah. that was there. And uh, you've got like 3D printing as well. Like, you know, I've got a friend who just makes uh, 3D prints joysticks and joy pads as well and things like that and replacement parts. So I think, you know, the the technology available you know yeah that, that's that been a definite boon here like for making replacement cases for cartridges yeah. and all kinds of stuff so yeah you know i think it's it, i think it's as much uh a cycle thing as well in terms of just where people are in their lives um you know people may have a bit more money than they had when in their in their teens disposable their income disposable <laughs> income so, so people can go, i'm gonna go i hear so myself. much about as many cocos as I can find, or I'm going to go and buy a. a, a yeah, Brian a, didn't make the show today, unfortunately, or... but yeah, he could have talked about that. But yeah. do you know what? <laughs> I, I, again, I say this to Ian. I know this is on the Amiga side, but um, there's a guy, uh, Dominic, who made the um, the Go uh, the Go Drive. Is it the Go? Um, yeah, yeah, the Go yeah. Drive. Go Drive. Yeah. And basically, to a uh, not not technical learning. And this this go drive for the Amiga, he showed it me at this um, Amiga meetup. This was uh, February last year, and he goes, "Oh, Paul, this is what it does." He goes, "So it's like a bit like a GoTek drive, uh, but also you can still use your original Amiga drive as well." Was it? Yeah, and yeah. it just sat on top of the um, the casing, and then the ribbon just, you know, slotted through. So he's like, "Okay, just unscrew your um, floppy drive." Put this in here, attach this here. There you go, floppy drive back in, fasten it up, and this just sits on top. And there you use a little digital display telling you which of the 14 files 
well, you got more than 14 files that you fitted loads of different games and programs on. But the actual like uh, little digital display held up to 14 titles. And I thought, this is brilliant. And I'm understanding it. And you've got such a healthy scene. So again, this is on Pixel Addict as well, when people have got projects. So when I mentioned Mike before with his APET, he did a free art um, uh, series of articles going from making the actual shell himself and, you know, like molding out and battering out the metal casing and then putting it all together and then going up to taking it out on the road, you know, and getting feedback on it. There's just so much talent out there. Well, now, some yeah. of it, uh, you know, look, it's always impressed me because, you know, this is something I was think I couldn't do that. But then you go, oh, could you? And for me, it's like not having the time. You know, we've got two small kids mm. and then again, work, magazine and things. But the idea of actually, you know, getting, I don't know, like an old 90s PC and getting that back working again, you know, and it sounds like more and more tempting. The more I do of this and the more you hear a project. So like I mentioned a couple of times, like the uh, Hackaday website, you know, and you go on there and you say, oh my God, like someone's like just mashed up this amazing piece of kit and it blows my mind. You know, there's a lot of talent out there. And again, 10 years ago, I don't think, well, we didn't hear about it as much, you know, but then again, you see how much technology has changed so quickly. It It you is know, where like we are. Few... It is where we are technology wise as well, because yeah, a single person at home can design a PCB and send it off to a company and then a load of PCBs come back. I mean, you couldn't... Yeah, before you had to make them that. all individually yourself, yeah, which is a yeah. lot right, of time or, and labor. Or so. hire a local. But isn't that the point? The, the retro machine <laughs> is the game. Yeah. And, yeah. and if you can write games on the game, well, that's that's just an extension. But it's not it's not the tool anymore. It, it's the game. Yeah, I yeah. mean, the thing yeah. is, and, well, Patrick, you've got stuff like... Maybe this is how I'm starting to see it more, you know, with these like retro projects and people like years ago, you had like our parents and they'll go, oh, I bought an old car and I'm going to basically take the engine right. to pieces, rebuild it and things like that. So it's no different really in a way, you mm -hmm. know, we, we it's just mm -hmm. like that sort of geeky, nerdy hobby where you're the, rebuilding the of, something. The amount you of know. hotel receptionists that I've had to explain mm -hmm. when we I've been to various shows like small conventions and things. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm checking in or checking out in the hotel. Some of them are actually like in the hotel. And basically this, she looks at me and goes, could you just explain what it is you're actually doing? <laughs> she, she's like, I know it's a computer show, but what I don't get it. What is it? I said, right, simple thing to explain. You know how some people like classic cars or steam engines, steam trains, things like that? Yeah. Well, some people feel the same way about computers. And that's what this is. Oh, I see. Here's mm -hmm. your key. Don't talk to me ever again. But <laughs> no, no, I didn't remember that one. <laughs> but how many but, but... times have, have we been there? And um, I've been at, um, say, weddings and things like that and engagement parties. And this is like going back a few years. And we go, so, Paul, what do you do? Oh, I do this. And I've interviewed such a games writer or whatever. And now we're right on games mags. And we're like, oh, do you go out with that? And you're like, what? No. <laughs> well, didn't you go out of films? Did you go out and listen to music? Did you? It's like, for God's sake, it's like, you know, a, a hobby and a passion and also for some of us work. So no, mm -hmm. don't grow out of it. If anything, it gets more interesting because you get learning new stuff all the time. And so speaking anything, of winnings, ironically, last year, we had a large poster version of what I covered one of the games on the Coco, one of the original 1980 launch titles. Yeah. Called Dino Wars, and there was a wedding party going through the hotel at the same time, and now all the groomsmen and stuff came over and kind of peeked in the, into the hall, and they saw this huge thing. That, That's pretty cool. What is that? And then they asked for their picture to be taken. So the whole <laughs> wedding party's got a picture against this backdrop. Nice. Standing in the That's game brilliant. box. <laughs> um, shall I explain a little bit of context about how I Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, actually, yeah, no, this yeah. Ages ago. yeah, Ian and Ron and Tom both actually, I'd like to know like how you guys kind of joined and then what you're like, your writers, uh, Paul's the editor. So, what is your role? Do you come up with the stories yourselves? Does Paul suggest them as a combination of both? Um, shall I go first? Go, or go for Tom. I okay, um, so basically, I'm going to try and condense this now into a very short amount of time and space. So, 
Uh, I uh, basically I run a, a YouTube tech channel called Wi-Fi Sheep, which you might have. That's a different story in itself. But uh, I've got about 5000 subscribers now. I've been doing it for about eight years. And uh, so I have a sort of small following, etc. And I also at the time, uh, a few years ago, was actually doing contract work for other IT and the computer firms, um, some sort of cottage industry, some mainstream. Um, and one of the projects I was doing was I was heavily involved with the what was left of the Acorn, British Acorn computer scene uh, that wasn't the BBC Micro. So this was the first generation ARM stuff. A ARM, for mm. those you don't know. Um, like the Adam and a few things like that? Uh, yeah, but it was a bit <laughs> later than that. It was RIS RISC PC. Okay. Right. And the Acorn RISC machine yeah. ARM. Uh, and basically I was working with uh, an operating system called RISC OS, which was the first GUI for the ARM architecture that sat on top of the bbc micro os anyway long story short this operating system had actually been ported over to run natively on earlier versions of the raspberry pi and for a time it ran uh, circles around the much slower linux that really dragged along on the original pies risk OS came along and ran super fast and super efficiently uh, but it wasn't marketed very well so i kind of went off my own back and was doing a project for the youtube channel around risk os and actually built my own distribution called the Wi-Fi Sheet uh, Risk OS distribution. And it picked up quite a lot of interest and traction. So much so that Risk OS actually changed hands at this time. And the new parent company got in touch with me and said they'd like me to come and work for them. And they took over my unofficial distribution and made it their official distro. And I was lead architect on the project. I was paid for this. Uh, so we created something called Risk OS Direct for the Raspberry Pi. And I then created a video tutorial series to introduce new users to the platform. It's all about trying to get new users onto this aging, creaking Acorn platform. And one of the things the new uh, owners did is they actually created uh, micro SD cards for the Pi uh, with the labels and graphics and things, sent them to me. And I was then exhibiting at one of the Cambridge shows. And there they had uh, some representatives from the Meager Addicts. And I had my orders from uh, the parent company to go around and give it out to, you know, journalists and anyone here might be interested. So I kind of thought, oh, what the hell? I'll, I'll go and talk to Amiga Addicts. I had no idea Pixel Addicts was happening, by the way. Mm -hmm. So I go up to them and I say, look, hi, you know, I'm Tom and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I kind of said something along the lines of, I know you're technically the rivals, because obviously, you know, the Amiga camp and the Acorn group and, you know, oh, no, can't, can't, have, can't have that. I said, I know you're technically the rivals, but can I just give you this free promotional uh micro sd card and you know see what you think and i didn't think anything of it because i thought they probably wouldn't be interested the next thing i know and i'm just going to switch to uh this camera now i didn't even know this had happened so this was issue one and right in the back find it of issue one was an entire two uh page piece about risk os direct including uh, all like the artwork and stuff which I've done for the OS. Now, I'm not mentioned, it's not my article, um, but I was actually really kind of surprised uh, <laughs> that they'd actually gone and covered it. Uh, and this was in the very first issue, and this is the first time I knew about Pixel Addict magazine happening. So I reached out and I said, you know, uh, explained who I was and what I did in relation to that. And I believe it was Joma originally, and then it switched over yeah. to Paul quite quickly. Uh, so yeah. I said, well have you got any well would you like to write for us and i said well yes so i've done a, i've done a few things um and some very small publications before and some other stuff not related to tech i've been in national print before but for other things um and i said yes okay um so we started working on this idea for an article uh which is going to be about bbc micro which is my you know retro love and I started developing this article. And I think it, it kind of spanned three spanned three editions in the end didn't it it was like three it was, pages i think it was yeah. three three or four pages no. so it was a good eight sorry, eight nine page spread by the time we'd finished that's um, the type of thing when you when kurt's mentioned going do you ever have like ongoing series those are the sort of three like dlsl three is a magic number anything more than that unless it's an actual programming guide i never like to go over three parts i think it can you know sometimes oversets its welcome sorry go on tom that's all right so um before that um Paul said, well, could we have a, a, a sort of an introduction piece about who you are for those who don't know? So, well, okay, fair enough. Mm. Um, so this was actually, this is uh, issue 10. 
And this was the that's first a, one. Yeah, that's the Silicon Graphics one I mentioned. Silicon Graphics issue. And I actually had a very, very kind of you, by the way, to have a, a two-page spread. This was my first piece uh, that got published. Uh, and it was actually sort of introducing myself and also the Wi-Fi Sheet Tech channel. So it was a very, very kind effort for my YouTube channel. And it talks about sort of the things that I'm interested in and also the kind of things I want to be or hopefully will be talking about in future issues of the magazine. Um, so that was that. And we did the BBC Micro article. We did mm -hmm. uh, we did a filler piece on HiQ OS. And yeah. this was the last issue, which I've currently been in, which was issue 15. And I can't remember quite where it was now. Uh, here we are. I actually did a piece on um, Apple HyperCard, which yes. was something I grew up with. Um, and so I sort of did a piece about HyperCard, its relation to how the original Myst game was created, the Mac in HyperCard. And then we had a few things about how you could play online and sort of HyperCard stacks and uh, things like that online at the end so that was the last piece i did and the reason for that was that um i actually uh, ended up um getting a proper job and uh so i'm still technically a youtuber i'm still doing contract stuff but we're so uh, proud of him yeah <laughs> uh well actually there so i actually now work as a engineering assistant for a, a university uh here in shropshire england and i didn't wasn't expecting that job, but basically I got that job because I was invited by, I know I had a friend who was a lecturer there and he invited me to go and make a YouTube video for the channel. And um, basically I went there for twice in a, uh, a week. And by the second day, I was actually in the head of the department's office and he got wind of the things I was doing on YouTube. And he kind of said, you know, we like what you do. Would you like to come and work here at the university? I went, yes, please. Uh, when I came back a couple of weeks later, now, Paul, I don't think you know about this. Uh, I went for a kind of informal interview. They'd already made the decision they were hiring me, but I came mm. back. And one of the questions I was asked was, are you actually um, in any, you know, are you published at the moment at all? I think they meant in kind of academic texts. Yeah. And I said, same um, thing. Uh, yes, yes, I am actually. And I'm, I'm currently in, in issue so and so of Pixel Addict magazine, which is a national print publication. And they were like, oh, right. I think they were trying to catch me out. And I went, oh, no, I'm, I'm in a magazine. And so, um, yeah, so since then, I've been uh, working uh, for Harper Adams University as an engineer in the sort of technical, what, what we call mechatronics, which is uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, little link to uh, agriculture. And that's yeah. another thing we've been talking with Paul about actually doing an article about what I now do at the university, because there's a lot of very, very cool tech and robotics and AI and things uh, that we could sort of now kind of hopefully get into a package that could go into Pixel Addicts. So it's it all gone um, full circle. Yeah. No, no, I think that's just it, though, as well, because I, I don't know everything. None of us know everything. So therefore, when people mention things, so like even with that haiku, I knew nothing at all about that, but then I listened to this week's Retro Hour today, and they mentioned haiku, and I went, ooh, I know that now, you know, like dead proud of myself, but this is what I mean. So like when now different browsers and, you know, talk to Ravi, like whenever Ravi makes his, you know, pitch of what he's going to write about, I just go, not going to clue, but entertain me. And he always does. And we always say, and he won't mind us saying this, Ian, he's the worst person for keeping time and getting his stuff in. But when he gets it in, it's good. And you just go, my God, you just need to get it in a bit quicker. And this <laughs> month, it did. And he, I was like, thank you so much now. I don't need to nag you. You know? But, um, yeah, but that's what I mean. I, I'm learning all the time. So if I'm learning, hopefully other readers are as well, you know. And that's one thing, I, again, bringing it to the Tandy one where people are going, this is actually quite interesting. Because, again, in the UK, obviously, the first thing we think of, obviously, with Tandy is the shops. But mm, yeah, <laughs> we've also learned the other side. But when I go to things like the Northwest Compute Museum, um, they've got some machines. So they've got like an Apple Lisa there. And not many places have been told have got these in the UK. You know, so I go to Northwest Computer Museum now and like I show my son as well. So we're both learning at the same time you know, and stuff like that. I absolutely love it. And also anything that they've got software for, you can actually sit down and play on, you know, they'll set it up for you or they'll leave you to it if you actually know what you're doing and stuff. 
Um, and something else. very hands on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. And one thing I didn't know, um, they've got like a little junk corner, like um, of a couple of like metal shelving racks, well, shelving units, and with like faulty machines on, be it VCRs, uh, computers, consoles, and they just say, make us an offer. So, you know, if you want to, like, if again, if I had the time, I went, you know what, I'm going to try to fix this. You can try and do that. But then also Andrew, who writes for Pixel Addict, he took a machine to Northwest Computer Museum to get fixed, you know, paid him a bit of money to do it. And, you know, when I was there, this was January last, and he picked up his uh, machine and he was like, brilliant, we've done this for me. So obviously it's not just a museum, it's also that bit of hardware repair. And, you know, they've, they've invited schools to go and, you know, look at them. I'm not trying to turn this into an advert for them. It's just more... I'm learning by going to places like that. And obviously you guys over, you know, you'll have all your different computer museums. And we, we've talked about like the other week when you're going through all the events, Curtis, I was like, that's amazing. And you're like going, okay, so this event, this is going to be the big one. And then I was saying to Ian before, like our events are kicking off next Saturday. So we're like at the Birmingham video games market which can be a little hit and miss because it's in a weird place called the Custard Factory in Birmingham oh, gosh, on the outskirts. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, and Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. I hate driving to Birmingham. And because my train was cancelled because of drive uh, train strikes, I've now got to drive to Birmingham, the one thing I did not want to do. So it's a 5 a.m. get up, get to Birmingham, meet up with Ian, set up a stall, hopefully sell loads of things. But what I love is chatting People may have just realized that already. Um, and I just go, <laughs> no. come on, tell us about magazine. I know. Not a clue. I know. <laughs> this is why this is why I'm crap at sponsored silences. I think the record <laughs> is about three minutes. Um, but that seems a lot. then we've got other events. We've got we've got uh, like an event every at least one event every month going up to September. And then we've got September off, then we've got a big one in Blackpool, uh, which we'll no doubt be booking in soon um that play in october play. and we yeah. went last year yeah. and that's insane did you, say, in did you say port talbot no no no, no. um blackpool. <laughs> blackpool blackpool oh okay play <laughs> expo in blackpool which is one of the big kind of uh well, it's, it's retro gaming really it's, it's not, a bit of yeah. not yeah it's i mean it's i've never it's been to it as such but they they pitch it very much as a sort of video games arcade type show it's in an absolute is it still in the blooming um norbrecht castle yeah. Oh, right. It's that, lovely. It's it's Victoria, honest it's, to God. It's, yeah. <laughs> right. but legally, be careful what you say now. But the Norbrecht Castle, as <laughs> as a hotel in the United Kingdom, has a reputation. And yes. It it looks like its reputation as well, and that's all I'm going to say. But... <laughs> okay. 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 Right. Right. It's not going to turn into a bad mouth thing, but its nickname is its nickname is Castle Grace Skull because it's got big turrets and things like that. And it says it all. My dad is not into computers at all. And my dad used to be um, in the police years ago. Um, obviously not the band. Um, so <laughs> basically, um, he went, he goes, oh, God, Norbert Castle. He goes, did I ever tell you the time I went there? And then this happened. And, and I was like, yeah, that's the same venue. It's very, very warm and very tired. But it's all about the people you see there. It's about seeing friends, family. Yeah. And playing games and selling some stuff. And, get, and getting stuck to the floor. Yeah. No. Don't. Oh, honest <laughs> to God. Oh, it, no, 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 no. <laughs> or, or, and Ian will remember this, our friend Mark, who writes on Pixel Addict, <laughs> he, he booked a room in, the, in one of the suites. So this was like, oh, my God, I need to see what a suite looks like. <laughs> However, he queued up for an hour and a half. This is a quick story. I queued up for an hour and a half with him. He got his key card. And it's a dead old key card. We went up to the fifth floor. Key card wouldn't open. Okay. So we tried it different ways. Door still wouldn't open. Went all the way back down to reception. Again, queued up. And then bearing in mind, we had a, a meal booked. Me, Ian, and Mark to go out for something to eat. And we're like going, okay, we've got to do this quick. Anyway, he finally got into his room at quarter to 10 at night. Me and Ian were in the bar and we just went, forget this. We're not waiting around now. Just send us pictures of your room. You know, I, I, I'm not spending six hours of my day going up and down stairs. But why his key card wasn't working? Because they went, you're walking past 
the pinball machines and the arcade machines, and we think it's wiping the magnetism on the card. <laughs> and we were like, what? I mean, how old are these key cards? <laughs> right. It's like putting cards. your floppy disk back up on the fridge with a magnet. Yeah. Right? So. yeah. so anytime, anytime he was walking down the hall past the, the arcade room, he had to have his key card in the air, like, you know, away from as far as he can. And then he goes, finally, I've got in after four attempts. Quarter to 10 at night. He was trying to get in from quarter to four. Six hours. Granted, we went out for tea for an hour, but even so. Um, but yeah, the room looked okay compared to someone else's room that I saw pictures of. But I always stay down the road in a different B and B. Oh know. yeah, it's a, you, it's a you place don't stay to go. there. Yeah, you don't stay there. You, yeah. you stay I'm sorry, yeah. Curtis. I'm so sorry. I know you wouldn't have invited us on to talk about you know um, awful hotels in Blackpool. I just want to know. Hotel we, we have those here too. I've been trapped in an elevator at a Cocoa Fest. Put it that way. That, is, that is my big nightmare. Not just being just being talked to an elevator. I mean, I'm always scared of that. Sorry, Patrick. You were about to say. Oh, I was just wondering if you actually saw the sparks coming out of the pinball machine. <laughs> You know, <laughs> we don't have to put the bulbs back in. They they light themselves up. And, uh, well, yeah. do you know what? Like, um, you, you see things like who was it? Someone did a report for me um, at a Northeast Retro um, Expo up in uh, Newcastle, and they had the uh, Adams Family Pinball, the the deluxe one where you sit down and it's like an, an electric chair. And I was like, I think the caption I made was like, right. I hope that's not turned on, you know. Right. And I don't know. I like, I'm always wary about, like, I went to a, a place, arcade club the other day with my son. So my son is seven. And this time he showed interest in the metallic pinball. And I was like, go on, have a quick go and stuff. And I, my wife always goes to me, she goes, like, you're only taking Theo because you want to go on games yourself. And I went, no, no, no. When it, when he comes with me, I just watch to see what he goes on. So he always goes to the sit-down Star Wars cabinet from the 70s. And then he was playing, oh, what else? Obviously, things like Time Crisis, Outrun, you know, the big sit-down cabs and everything like that. But then, like, one of the games he absolutely loved was Rampage, the, um, you know, midway um smashy building one you yeah. know and then you know playing things like dig dug and stuff and it's it's great because i think you know when when you're young you just want to play games and you know it's like you'll have a yeah like the graphics and stuff don't matter it doesn't yeah. have to be top yeah. tier it's just if it's fun bang on you do Big it game. Yeah. yeah 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 you're explaining that a lot better than i could get my words <laughs> out then but yeah Oh, I just um I just think it's brilliant to see because again, that's his history as well, Curtis. So I want him in, I don't know, 10 years time to go, hey, do you remember when we used to play um Dig Dug and you know, things like all the old classics and stuff. Like now, uh, even at the computer museum, they've got a handful of cabinets, so we've got a Pac-Man there, uh, and then things like Space Invaders and Afterburner and I want him to go. I get it. I understand the history. So when he sees these old computers as well set up that he can go on if he wants to, you know, like I've still got my old big bulky CRT in my bedroom upstairs. And the other day I had on the uh, original Xbox. I went, okay, we're going to go back 20 years and we're just going to play that. And he's like, oh, can we try this game now? Can we try that one? And it's all about the history because I think... I can't pass on the technical side, but I can pass on the, you know, some knowledge. And then also I like the idea that I've now been making magazines for a couple of years that I can pass on. It's a big, big deal to me. You know, it, it really is. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just, better ask uh, a so, question. Tom, so, you mentioned that you have to go fairly soon. Yes. So yeah, there's a couple of things. I, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Carry on, Curtis. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say there's a couple of questions I'm going to ask all of you, but I'll ask you first here since uh, you have to go. Oh, um out of the stuff in, in Pixel Addict, and have you written for Media Addict as well, or just Pixel Addict? No, it's just point? Pixel Addict. Just Pixel okay. Addict, so, yeah. I was going to ask you, what is your favorite article that you've read in the magazine, and what is your favorite article that you've written? Oh wow! Um, mm. Oh, um, that's a good. A warning, well, Ian. I'll be asking you that too. So you might as well start thinking. I'm thinking. Well, I, I am. I'm. I'm particularly proud of the Haiku article. Uh, I actually think it's probably my one slightly in the, the last issue I wrote in 15, the one I showed you with the uh, slightly bemoaning of Apple HyperCard. 
because it came in as sort of it's a bittersweet one because hypercard as a child frustrated me right and i put them basically to paraphrase the article i wanted to make doom okay hypercard was not going to make doom however hard i tried to make it make doom right as an eight-year-old child so it was just this sort of huge ball of frustration in a pre-internet era right so um that's probably one of my favorite at the moment uh, that i put on um I actually will say probably from issue one, actually, that the uh, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates sort of relationship article, the very first sort of big piece they did, yeah. I think stood out as I, there was so much in issue one that really did stand out. And I really enjoyed uh, reading a lot of that. Uh, and I think, yeah, I'm going to say probably that original article, this cover piece, I think was probably one of my favorite. Uh, but to be honest, it's been so much, so many articles, so much stuff that other people have done. Uh, you mentioned Roy, um, Templeman or um, Loud Scots bloke, as he he's known mm -hmm. online, and uh, I know Roy. So yeah, Roy, you know, is very good at continuing to do the stuff he does. Um, I probably should just say nice things about all the people I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, but there's a lot of very very talented people, and it's so nice to have a mixed genre technical magazine that you we can have stuff about basic programming, we can have stuff about machine language. You are just not going to see this in any other print publication. At the same time, you have the pop culture. The stuff maybe it's less interesting to me personally, but I know is of interest to people. So the, the film, yeah, game related uh, cinema releases, mm. uh, retro gaming oh, type yes. stuff, which I appreciate why it's there. Personally, I mean, if it was me, I would have something more like Practical Electronics, but that wouldn't sell. So Paul yeah. strikes a really fine, he does a brilliant job at striking a fine balance between creating something that's going to interest a lot of people and keeping me happy. So, yeah. so and this is what I was talking about earlier, where you, you have to keep in the, the commercial side of things in your head. Yeah. At the same yeah. time, you're trying to do stuff that interests yourself. And well, you know, I, I totally appreciate readers. that if it was, if I, I couldn't do Paul's job because I would create something that I would think was like the greatest thing on earth and right. no one else would buy a copy because it'd be utterly boring to them. Right. Like trying to Geeks Monthly albums. or something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, and that's why I really, um, you know, and also yeah. Ian and what, you know, what you do across both magazines. And to create something of such a high professional quality and to let me write for it, uh, is, you know, is really, you know, it is, I think it is appreciated across the whole community and the readership. It's it's something very special, very different. And one last thing I will say, because I will have to go shortly, is it's been really exciting to, we've mentioned Deborah Smith, which uh, I don't know if a US equivalent, but a, a we have them in Canada. Okay. So uh, it's basically a, a national chain of quite large news agents that also double up as a bookshop type. Thing. he has a national chain and to go into my local store uh here in shrewsbury shropshire where i live uh, central england go into my local store and there it is on the shelf next to the retro gamers and the mac formats and what, what titles we've got left and to know i've actually got something in there in national yeah. print uh that novelty even though i've done several issues now and it's not the first magazine i've been published in but it, the novelty doesn't wear off and you just go oh wow and many a time i've gone and photographed it on the shelf and ne nearly been asked to <laughs> nearly been asked to leave, but I was just like, no, right. don't understand. This is important. Now, have you been asked to autograph an issue in the store because they recognize you from writing no, your articles? Not yet. Um, not yet. When I've been at the um, I mean, people don't know who I am, and that's that's fine. But, <laughs> Do you need a printed T-shirt? But but um, <laughs> what I have has happened to me occasionally when I've done things like the Cambridge show, not necessarily yeah. through Pixelatic. When I've done and exhibited as Wi-Fi Sheet YouTube Tech Channel at Cambridge. I've had a couple of people come up to me and people, oh, wow, it's you. I want to, you know, say hello. And I'm fine. I love talking to people. Uh, and there was one chap who came for his son and had we had a little chat. This was well, before COVID. So it must have been about 2019 exhibition. And he goes, oh, thank you so much for talking to us. I go, oh, no problem at all. And he goes, oh, you're the first celebrity I've ever met. Oh, could, like, <laughs> died. I was like, no, don't say that. <laughs> Obviously, you have low standards. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just don't feel like that, you know? Um, yeah. It's nice when people recognize or sort of recognize you for the work you do, which is which is lovely. But I can quite happily walk down the street and no one knows who I am and no one cares, and that's fine. So Yeah. And I now realize that that I'm literally about 15 miles away from Tom. So I, I'm going to see you for right. a Well, I'm over in Telford. So. <laughs> oh, you're Telford. Yeah, you're literally up the road. I work yeah, in yeah. Telford. So, yeah. Oh, there yeah. you go. So do I. Have you just had Google Maps open for the last all this call or something like that and pinpointing He's been planning his route. How far away from his <laughs> Oh, oh, thanks for coming on, Tom. Thanks for sticking around for the whole show oh, up to now, too. all right. Well, thank you so much. I for know. Me. I've been, I've been a, 
a huge fan of um, first of all Coco Talk and now Coco Nation. I've been watching you for more years than I should probably admit to. So it's been an absolute honour to actually be amongst you and to talk with you. And thank you so much. Yeah, I will get out to England sometime, but you guys are going to have to start coming over here to Coco Fest too. Do you know what? I would so. genuinely love to come over to the States. I do know a couple of people over there and I really should come and visit. And if I was going to come to the States, I should come for one of the shows. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I think that's the thing, you know. And like you mentioned, Boat Fest as well, Ian, and stuff like that in the past, you know. You just see us all in the background, Curtis, like in one week when we've all crashed at yours, hiding in your background. It's like, look, the new, uh, the new episode, it's like, who sat in the background of all here? A load of people from England. Just, hello. Hiya. <laughs> but no, um, Tom, good to see you in person for the first time. Yes. Well, we've, we we've, yes, well, we've never, I'm the thing sorry. is, Paul, we've I, never actually physically met, have we? I know. I know. So we, just we've spent message. many an hour on the phone talking <laughs> and well, I I taking direction from you. But no, we've never actually met in person. I know. And we've never been on a so video no, call. It's, it's been so, nice. Yeah. It's been nice. Yeah. He sent me a message going, can you get on a bit early? Because I have to. Yeah, we're dying out here. <laughs> and I, I just, that's, I just put Mark led. And I checked my phone. I'm like, oh, God. I went, I can't say yes. I'm, I'm here now because you can <laughs> see. And we've been talking. Anyway, it's been good. It's been nice. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Okay, no. I'm good enough to thanks for stopping by, Tom. Now, but thanks so much, okay. everyone. See you All later, Tom. Hey, Tom. This is just stuck with us. Sorry, everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> and Ian, I, oh, I guess no, the same question the, for you. Tom, what is your <laughs> what, what what is your favorite article that you've read in Pixel Addict or Amiga Addict, for that matter, or maybe both? And uh, what's the best one you think you've written? So oh, let me go back to this. So this is a uh, one of my favorite articles that I wrote for Amiga Addict. So. And I also took the photograph for the cover as well, which I was very proud of because it's it, it um the articles about um the company Dig Digital International who um were very popular on the Amiga for uh basically their office software. So so in the the equivalent of Works and the equivalent of Lotus One Two Three and and obviously Microsoft Office on the Amiga was things like Wordworth and um. And the the all the software that came with the, the, that software, I got in contact with some of the people that used to work for the company. Uh, I interviewed them, and and that was how I ended up with this article and this cover, which which was controversial at the time because people said, "Oh, it's just a just a white cover." <laughs> it's like, yes, but it, this is the this, you this is you spilled some ink. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this, this is what the the uh, box of the original Wordworth looked like. So, uh, it, people who knew mm -hmm. knew. Uh, oh, yeah. but not everyone did. Both who uh, didn't questioned. Yeah, yeah. But... Yeah, well, it's a monk and a quill and all that, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I was just so, going, what's this about? <laughs> so, yes. Um, so, yeah, I wrote the article about the company, how it, they got started, who was involved. Um, I spoke to the founder and uh, we went through all the different pieces of software like uh, um, Wordworth and TurboCalc and uh, Data Store and and all these uh, bits and pieces with respect to the chap who coded the original Wordworth and all that kind of stuff. So it was nice to have something which was very focused on some productivity software for a change. Obviously, we do a lot of stuff about games and and uh, yeah. and and but equally technical stuff about systems, but not a lot about actual the all the, the stuff I wrote all my projects for school on <laughs> things like that. Um, so it was nice to jump back into that. So so I really enjoyed writing that. It took it took quite a lot of effort to do, um, quite a lot of toing and froing. I was quite lucky because the the founder, who's still quite a um, a um, successful businessman, um, was here, there, and everywhere. The original the original coder was on holiday when I needed the answers to the questions back and he wrote the questions on the laptop from holiday and sent them back to me. I was extremely yeah. grateful. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed writing that. Um, in terms of my favorite article, actually, I kind of go back in uh, Amiga Addict. Um, and this is another one of our ones from uh, from certain Mr. Ravi Abbott. Um, in All the way back in issue two, we did a feature on uh, on DMA design. Um, they 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 have uh, of Lemmings and later Grand Theft Auto fame. Um, we spoke to people from from the company, people like Mike Daly, who coded Lemmings, uh, and we got a, a view of how the company got together uh, up in Dundee, Scotland. Um, how Lemmings was put together, obviously a, a very famous game on 
pretty much ever, anything that's had a chip in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and we went through a lot of that stuff as well. I really enjoyed uh, reading that um, because, and and this kind of goes back to what uh, Paul was saying before, um, but um, I've definitely absorbed a lot of knowledge <laughs> because I I proofread Amiga Addict uh, for, cover to cover every every uh, issue. Um, and it's amazing how much stuff you realize that just from reading to check and to edit, um, just by osmosis, just <laughs> sinks you into absorb your brain. It all, yeah. I just suddenly know all this stuff about all these different things that I didn't think I would know about. Um, and it's good. I mean, a lot of the challenge with the magazine is um, you'll quite often get people saying, why haven't you written about this? Uh, or, or this is a big part of the Amiga community, or this is a big system. Um, and it's like, great. Do you want to write about it? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because uh, it's, we can go and do the research and we can go and search things out, but you're always going to get the best results from people that have a background. Even if it's only a light background, you need to know where to start from and where to go to. So I can go and research about a game on the Amiga or a piece of software on the Amiga because I've got a strong Amiga background, but I couldn't go necessarily to um, the Auric one or something like that and write something that was of good enough quality to put in a magazine. So you, you really need someone to come along and go, I know. You need an enthusiast, stuff. like yes, somebody that yeah. knows the product too. Yeah. And also someone that can write. <laughs> so, but <laughs> yeah. that's almost slightly <laughs> secondary because uh, because we can we can edit things up a, a lot. To, so if someone's just an okay writer, we can polish it up well enough. But you, you want the the knowledge and the information, which again, speaking about uh, Ravi Abbott, uh, he has all he has such a wealth of knowledge across so many different systems and so many small stories from back in the day and things like that. That's that that's that's the that's the gold that you want to get in there and and uh, and, and spread through the, the articles it's uh, it's very good okay um i, I also want to just ask you to uh quickly here uh, a separate okay. question then we'll get back to paul and ask you what your favorite article okay. that you've read in the magazine is um do you guys today do you guys actually use period correct hardware not necessarily all of it like you disk drives and stuff you're probably using more modern stuff or do you guys use like misters and Pi's emulating stuff, or do you use emulators on PCs? What do you guys use for your your retro computer? Well, it's 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 a balance, really. Certainly, from a, the Amiga perspective, um, a lot of the stuff when I'm playing games, I'm emulating purely because that's an easier way to take screenshots of things as you're going that's along. That's what I do in our challenge too. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite good. But if I'm just playing on it, I mean, my my nice little uh. uh uh, magazine cam is is right on top of my Amiga six hundred. So <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, nice. uh, I I I do have some real hardware, um, and I do use it. And certainly when I go to to groups and to meets and things like that, I will um I'll definitely use real hardware. Um, and sometimes it makes sense to even if we end if even if I have to go back to the emulator to to take screenshots or whatever, um, it's a, it's sometimes it makes sense to go and test things on the actual hardware first, especially if it's a review, because you want to know it's going to work. <laughs> yeah. um, you don't want to go out and say, oh, it's fine. And uh, and go, well, I tried it in my actual 600 or in my, in my actual uh, Amiga uh, 1200, and it didn't work. <laughs> so uh, we definitely have to go through and do that side of things. But it's, it's yeah, no, no emulator hardware or software wise is perfect. It's what no, we've exactly. discovered, I think. No. Exactly. And when we've had... Um cover discs like adf files some of us uh we don't have a cover disc uh, uh, like a downloadable cover disc every issue over on a uh, amiga addict we tend to do one like every every other on average yeah. but sometimes um we'll have like a game sent to us so we had someone was working on a game that renegades one last summer mm -hmm. um and uh, a guy i know called wayne and some of us could run it straight away and we had this Discord chat going for just cover disc testing. And we we're just like, well, I've done exactly what you've done. Why is it not running on this? Can you try <laughs> to see if it runs on the um, Amiga Mini? Because obviously I can use that. Because again, with a limited tech skills, which are getting better, if I had a pound every time I said that, um, I can just go right ADF file onto the USB stick into my Amiga Mini, dead easy. However, I had no luck with this Renegades game 
everyone else did and be like, Paul, what are you doing wrong? I was like, I'm following your bloody instructions. I don't understand <laughs> what else I could be doing. And be like, well, have you tried formatting the USB stick again? Or have you started doing this? Or make sure this file's not included with it. And I'm like, oh, God. You know, I have very little patience. Well, you said it, you're and config.sys. You know, it's kind of... Well, it sound like and that. tech doesn't play ball with me when it says this plus this should do this. And when it doesn't, I go, okay, I'll try it again. I'll try it a third time and then no, forget it. I, 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 it's like toys out of the pram going, forget it, forget it. I'll go and do something else because I feel like there's always something else I could be doing on the magazine or something like that, <laughs> you know? So I'm like, right, I'm moving on. Good luck, guys. Sorry. I'm going yeah, to interesting because instead. sometimes you find as well um, with modern games and modern software, sometimes people have written them entirely in an emulated environment. <laughs> and then, and then uh, when it actually comes to play it on, a, on an actual piece of hardware, it doesn't actually <laughs> form in the same way that they were expecting yeah. it to. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you remember the early issues of um, Amiga Addict? Mm. Quite a bit was actually made on actual Amiga programs. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then eventually it got so so time consuming that was soon uh, kicked into the grass. Um, but yeah, it was a nice I mean, it was a nice sort of short lived uh, thing, really. You part, know, part of that is because it's because we we're working in a distributed fashion, so it's quite hard to yeah. do that with it. Uh, with, yeah. with the Amiga. Although I have, I say that uh, Jonah sent me a picture the other day, and he was reading through an article that we we were thinking of using on his Amiga. So oh yeah. <laughs> They yeah. definitely still get used for, for for those parts of the magazine, um, but um, but yeah, we don't lay it out as much on the magazine before. That no, was more no. when Jonah was doing the layout stuff, um, because he's got he's got some modern Amiga hardware, if such a thing is a is like vampires and stuff or what? No, it wasn't even that. It was a Amiga One uh, system from oh, from okay. like the the uh, the late nineties, early two thousands. So it's got kind of more modern resolutions and things like that, but it's still a, a an old Amiga at heart kind of thing. It okay. blows my mind. That's why I, I have one final question on Pixel Addict and and, and specific stuff, and then I have yeah. just some general questions about uh, the magazine itself, and then we'll kind of wrap it up there. So when yeah. you get back to my news segment, <laughs> I know I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I want time to go for that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so um. I'm assuming that both of you have read the Tandy article in the latest yes. slide at this point. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was wondering, uh, because Tandy was not such a huge name in the UK. In fact, you guys didn't even get the Coco 3. Um, what was the most fascinating or interesting thing that you found in the article about Tandy? Joe? It doesn't have to be Coco related. It can be anything Tandy, but I'm no, just kind of no. curious. Um, for, for, for me, um, and I always bang on about this, is how the company started out. Because obviously even in the UK via the shops. And obviously I know in Australia, you know, it had more of an impact than I'd say in the UK, but it's to see how the company started out where you're thinking these are actually, again, visionaries to go, well, it still blows my mind saying out loud to, stay, to start as a leather company, then buy Radio Shack to then obviously get into the sort of electronics and CB radio boom where you go, I understand all of that, I get it. But then I think having, just to be quite crude, having the balls for an employee to go, hang on a minute, you know what? We're going to go big here. I've got this idea. We're going to create a computer. It's going to sell for a lot more than what our usual products do. And remember, this is an age just before, you know, computers are really taking off. Yeah, And it just shows what a big player they were. And they don't, get that sort of recognition over here but it's such an important part of computing history so from my point of view now is like that my next trip to compute museum now i'm going to be a case of right let's get a bit more hands-on because i want to see why it's so important i've read about it but now i actually want to get more hands-on you know and that alone is the key for a good article you know um and then you think it's not really been around for that long because you think by, you know, late 90s, early noughties when things are fading away. But uh, again, just so, so important. So that's what I liked. I like to see that they, they took a risk on, a you know, the smallest initial order of, you know, a new machine. One per store, basically. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then to fly out 
and you see that demand and you just go, do you know what? You're pioneers. You're absolute pioneers of this. And you just go, that's sort of like the success story that makes you smile. And I know, fair enough, like, as some companies have gone on, because there's always some that fade away, you know, and you just go, I, I, I like seeing the sort of, not necessarily the fall, but you need to see the full picture and also that moment where things started either going wrong or, you know, because again, I've said this before, no one ever makes out, no one sets out to make any system a failure. They've all got the best intentions at heart. And just an example on the Amiga side, we did a special on the CD32. And when we got interview answers back from people who actually were engineering the machine, it was only through Commodore running out of money whether it's a case of let's cut corners, we need to do it cheaper, you know, and things like that. So again, like with, with Tandy, you've obviously got different models, some really expensive end of a business side, and then they're going, well, hang on, this model, it's going to cost quite a bit more, but it also now does this. So you can see that evolution, you know, and yeah. that, that to me is always going to interest me. And that's just it. It's the educational side. I mean, look, we go to school for years and we we told what we need to learn. And then now as adults, we can go, Do you know what? I'm going to learn something new today. I'm either going to learn a, an actual practical skill or I'm just going to read and learn something new about the history. You know, it, it's nice. Sorry, I know yeah. I'm being a bit part, smart. Part of, the, part of the difficulty of writing uh, these history articles for the magazine is they almost inevitably end with and then. <laughs> <laughs> and then everything stopped or... Yeah. Uh, that company was sold or they went bankrupt or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, well, T Tandy, I think the, the, the downfall port for me was when they sold off their computer manufacturing division. To, mm -hmm. I think it was AST or whatever it was. And then they they right. just started being a me too. We're going to sell cell phones and whatever generic computers. Yeah. And then they kind of lost you know, the fact of doing their own stuff. Yeah. Common. Quite, quite yeah. A bit. So, Ian, uh, what was your 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 takeaway on the Tandy? So, what would you... So this is the centerfold from the uh, from the article. Of course, centerfold was, has a nice TRS eighty on it. Um, but I was quite one awesome. <laughs> exactly. So I was quite interested, and it's a bit of a, an aside almost. But right in the top left box out here, this talks about the the partnership between Tandy and, and DC. DC Comics to make. The, I had no uh, idea TRS eighty computer whiz kids thing. It's like that's 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 a unique thing. <laughs> is, I still um, have some of those. Actually, I showed them on the show really? a few years back. Oh yeah. wow. That's 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 really cool because yeah I, I had no idea I mean I, I know if you ever want to pieces... dig those out again like uh, in a future episode just to go here you go Paul there's a picture <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... yeah there I was mean... two kinds there were separate issues that were actually Radio Shack used to hand them out for free to kids actually when you came in the store and then they also oh. had inserts in the regular DC magazine little sixteen page insert where they would show off and they'd have the tier the Wiz kids doing a tier setting model of honor at Coco or whatever and it's Superman and Wonder Woman and Lex Luthor and whatever else you know type thing. Yeah, I, I had no idea. I mean, I, I know bits and pieces about the about the Coco and a lot a lot of my knowledge of the Coco comes from from a from Boat and Air and over at uh, Amigos and um, since I'm I do quite a lot of stuff with them um so a lot of my knowledge comes from there and from just talking to to yourself Curtis on a on <laughs> ICC and things like that so uh, yeah we'll see you on the 20th so that's it that's it so um so so it's, it's, it was interesting to read something a bit more comprehensive um about the whole thing and I haven't got through the whole thing yet because this magazine literally arrived in a box for me today so literally oh yeah today. yeah so you that was, got it today uh, yeah because you're one of the shipping people right you have to well no it all gets shipped from Jonah um oh, for but, Jonah? Okay. but i end up with stacks of boxes because i tend to be the one that goes to the shows so uh yes so, so, yes. so I've the whole room in the house is full of magazines Ian, ian's poor car and yeah. then also both our poor backs and yeah i was gonna say magazines and i don't know about i don't know about the car yeah. car can cope uh, but and it starts again possible future future uh vertebrae issues i'm not sure but uh, about those comics so when when huxley sent me the article I always, you know, Huxley, he always writes so much. So if I say 650 words, six pages, so that's roughly 4,000 words at the most, please, Huxley. He'll go, I've gone a bit over it, 6,000. And I go, God damn it. Okay, well, I want to use it because I know it's not going to be pointless. You know, you vote this stuff for a reason. And he's covered things like things like the Neo Geo Color Pocket and stuff like that. So whatever he writes, I trust him. And then I look at the pictures. So I've got the 
um, Word document, and then I'm flicking through the pictures that he sent, and sometimes he'll send hundreds. You know, I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know where to start. And I always say to him, you choose. So when I saw these comic book ones, I was like, what the hell is this? You know, it's like, what's, why are these here? Is this an error? And then when I was reading through it, I was like, oh, God, that's just like genius marketing. You know, it's like we're talking like, you know, comic book characters that people know with yeah. computing. It's that sort of the crossover that I love, you know, really, really do. It's, I mean, uh, yeah. The it's interesting good. thing, I think, for Tandy from a UK perspective is, I mean, I went in, in uh, the Tandy shops a lot when I was when I was younger um, and they didn't really feel like a sort of US brand in a in a I'm UK so sorry. I will hurry up in a UK uh, setting it felt like a British shop um the way they'd laid it out and the way it was, things were pre presented and the way the staff uh, were in the shop felt like a British computer shop so um it's interesting to to know that it's got that US heritage behind it um I mean a lot of my first experiences with uh the the Nintendo Entertainment System, which wasn't a huge system in the UK, were in were just playing on a on a on a uh, demo machine in in the Tandy shop in in Kidderminster, which is near me. That's um, where I started. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, so so it, it, there's for a lot of people that see this magazine in the UK, they'll associate it with the electronics side mm. of things, and they, but so they'll learn a lot just by get, just by reading through. Oh, they'll yeah. learn. They will learn. We'll make them learn. <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, it definitely uh, it definitely helps getting that additional size uh, yeah. of things as well. I, I am okay. gonna I'm gonna cover more Tandy stuff in the magazine. You know, we've we, it's had the odd name drop when he's done other articles beyond like you know when we've say like looked at Palm Pilots and like you know uh, PDAs and that sort of thing. You know, the odd name drops happened, but. There's a lot I want to learn, and this is what I mean. I'm not again saying it because I'm here, but yeah. And when um, done it, yeah, let, let us know when when if you guys have a follow up article on Tandy or no, even no, Dragon we'll or do. whatever, then we'll we'll do that. Yeah. Um, last last questions I want to do here, just uh, briefly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering what is the average size of an issue of Pixel Attic? I don't even know how many pages it normally is. Uh, Sixty pages, uh, A4 That's size, and it's um, published every six weeks. Yeah, every That's six right, weeks. Yeah. There are probably about, including in-house ads, about seven pages of ads, because obviously you need to have a few. Uh, yeah. um, but, you you know, we try to, you know, not go overboard. No. You know, it's, uh, and that, yeah. that's something that people have said to us, is uh, when I compare it to to a 80s or 90s magazine, when you really actually go through it, it's like half of this is average. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Right. remember Computer Shopper? That was its premise. It was pretty well exactly. nothing yeah. but average with a couple of columns. Pages of ads. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> mail order, mail order, mail order. Uh, <laughs> so, so it it actually it works out quite well for us in a way because because they go, oh, it's great you don't have that many adverts in there, um, but equally we can't get there. <laughs> there's not that many people who would want to advertise because those companies don't exist anymore yeah well the, uh, the whole system has changed too because i mean back then mail order was basically how a lot of people could get stuff out especially smaller companies they couldn't afford yeah. to put stuff in computer stores or sell overseas or anything like that so it was all mail order you had to put the ads and we look forward to the ads like what new games are coming up from spectral this week oh, yeah well that's that's the irony as well we do get people that saying I love seeing that you actually have adverts in your magazine because I find that as nostalgic as the articles yeah. themselves, kind of thing. That was um, the product announcement, you know. I mean, full page in, ad. In the latest Amiga Addict, we've got a full page advert for 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 a, a new Amiga game uh, by um, by Hoffman um, called uh, Seekanoid. Um, so it's a full page advert for a game. You know? <laughs> you don't see that at all uh, for for systems of that age anymore. So it's uh, people love that as well. So it's There's nice to get that there. different aspect, yeah. 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 And then the final question, of course, is um, where where do people go if they're interested in getting Pixel Addict or Amiga Addict? Uh, where do they go to get it? And where do um, they go to get it if they want electronic or a okay. physical magazine? If they go, if you went to, oh, fuck, I believe it's uh, spelling it for now, but www. or just amigoaddict.media. Ami uh, so no, God, addict.media would do it. Sorry. I'm fluffing my own lines. So if it's just a <laughs> www.addict.media, 
and that shows everything, including our first and only so far one-off special of Amstrad Addict. There will be more special. So you all these specials basically dedicated to one system or one topic that will be one-off. So you will see at some point Atari, Spectrum, um, C64, you know, and things like that. So, yeah, there will be more. I'll be pushing for the Dragon one. (laughs) <laughs> again when we spoke the other week you know I, I, yeah i'm not saying necessarily that's gonna happen but then that's something like you know now in my head to go that's that's a market i need to cover a bit more because if we yeah. have, like, for example if someone's not being uh, mentioned in issue two and we're now on issue 20 it needs something new you know it needs an update and things like that yeah and you've got several uh, Dragon users from Europe and the UK in the chat right now that actually can help you out with some stuff like that, some history uh, stuff. Anyway, sorry. But I should wait. It's really not to wait. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm well overthinking this. No, uh, listen, I'm sorry for just talking for so long because I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I am felt, obviously, in the message as well, I feel awful. So, guys, everyone here, I'm sorry for talking about magazines for so long when, obviously, you're here to talk about Tandy stuff. Thank you, Henry. I feel a little bit better now. You're um, fine. <laughs> I mean, the, the magazine... The actually, magazine it stuff. works out okay, because this was a slightly less filled news week, so I can just catch it up next week. That's yeah. not a problem. <laughs> we'll just go another six hours next week for just, yeah. just the news. That's all. I was going to say, yeah. I, I, I thought we talked for a bit too long with the Modus Apparando for uh, for Coco Talk and Coco Nation anyway. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When, you, when you went to six hours, I was like, oh, yeah, God, that's kind of a theme. Went, <laughs> yeah. really. Oh man! That's but good. no, uh, like I say, um, I I want to hang around and uh, listen in as a listener now for a bit and have a little yeah. square up at the top. But if oh. you guys if you guys want to, and, and the cost isn't too much, uh, you know, coming up with the Coco Fest here in a month, I don't. But it's enough time. I but if you want, just want to ship a few issues but... that we can. Oh yeah, sell at the show or something like that. Wait a bit for us. <laughs> the the well, like issue say, in particular. It could, yeah. it could be worth mentioning that to Jonah actually because yeah. I think. Um, I think, you know, run that by him, you know. And then I I don't know. I just think I'm just going to keep looking out for interesting content, you know, because I know not everything like over like in the States is going to be popular over here. But I think if you've got the right writer who knows his stuff, I think everyone gets something from it. But yeah, I've, I've banged that drum too much tonight. So I apologize. <laughs> all this morning, all this afternoon. And we are British, so there we have to apologize too much. So, yeah, that's oh, a I Canadian tradition, on... too. I, I was, I was going to say a load of Brits and a load of Canadians, it's just, just going to be constant apologies, isn't it? So, it's a sorry off. <laughs> 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 No, All right, thank, sorry, thanks for being our guests. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it did go a bit long, but Uh-oh. I don't mind. There's obviously an I'm enthusiasm sorry. for the I'm magazine sorry. here. I'd like, just if you get me talking about Nitrous Nine, I'll go even longer than that. So, <laughs> but if you have an enthusiasm for it, you you you're vested in it. You want to talk about it, so yeah, I understand. Yeah, right. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let you carry on then, Curtis. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you again so much, yeah. guys. Thank you. Listen to us. Witter on for. I think about 15 minutes, I think that was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And thanks to Tom, of course, who had to leave a little bit earlier. Yes. Here. Of course, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, any quiet. questions from people on the panel uh, for the two of them? Just real quick one, because I was wondering about this. Um, the, the, the question of, like, what kind of circulation do you have? And kind of related to that is, how did you manage to get your printing costs low with what I would imagine is a low circulation? Right. Okay. We only know a little bit of this, mainly because Jonah, our boss, deals with it all. Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So again, I'm quite limited. I'm not. I'm not trying to be like, oh, can't say. we, we intentionally like don't know. Time. To be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, that makes sense. Play. You've but... got. You, you've got. I know that both magazines need to be printed at the same time because obviously we use similar layouts, so that does mm-hmm. help. So, for example it wouldn't be cost beneficial to run them one, two weeks later and things like that. Because even if one magazine's finished before the other, um, I'm not trying to like, you know, be the um, wizard behind the curtain, a la Wizard of Oz. Yeah, exactly. Um, But um, like, so I've only got limited knowledge on that anyway. But then in regards to the Amiga one, that's obviously been going longer. And again, that's, a lot more laser focused on one particular subject so people know what it is whereas pixel addict is a little bit of a harder sell at times 
yep. because I've got to make sure that the cover story and I'd say the secondary story be say like a four pager is interesting enough. So the longer we've been going, I've started speaking to, you know, like I've been to games events and seen Charles Cecil from uh, like Revolution Software um, at events. And I was like, oh, hello again, Paul and stuff. So now I'm building up those relationships to get more well-known names involved or the odd game review code and things if we ever do any like you know game reviews semi-regularly because i don't want to fill the magazine just reviewing games i want to see the magazine as a sort of like a a history computing guide in a way you know um that's one reason why i started doing the podcasts interviewing the x games journalists because as time goes on, we're losing a lot of things. So I want to make sure there's like some sort of um, actual physical history there. One of the issues I did was on preservation, uh, be it digital preservation, paper preservation, and yeah, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's it is a tough one, but mm-hmm. yeah. The, yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the, the print side of things. Um, it all gets printed at uh, printers local to our uh, editor Jonah up in York. Um, they get so, delivered so, to his house. So, yeah, they get delivered on a big pallet to his house. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh-huh. uh, so, 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 there's. I guess there must be some amount of saving from 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 it, it being a local company and uh, and them not having to ship it too far as well. <laughs> so, uh, because we, uh, we we looked into, um, but the cost. The, I, I know for a fact the cost is a lot for this. You know when and I know Curtis when we spoke the other week. Yeah. Uh, people said in regards to helping out in other countries, if you had a printer over in the US to obviously print for you, but you'd need you'd be needing a really, really big number, I think, to make that worthwhile to go or, where we've got a UK threshold. printer. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. I just did a quick look. I just did a quick look online and um you're talking for small batch runs somewhere along the lines for the size of the magazine you're look, looking at somewhere along the lines of like five bucks to six bucks per unit assuming mm. that you can get 500 units printed yeah, yeah it's definitely more than five i know for a fact there's like more than 500 i don't know how much we, i was gonna say i don't like know how much that. we print now i mean when we, when some we did, go to the shops as well yeah when we did the first uh amiga addicts we we printed i think a thousand um mm-hmm. um uh, and now because we we also sell in shops we have to print x number for to to uh to mail out and x number to to get sent directly to stores so uh, and that's part of the balance as well because we mm. don't see once they've gone to stores we never see them again i know because it it's not work, sale or return sadly which is what see. how it used to work back in the day at least in the uk was anything that didn't sell got sent back to the publisher yeah now, yeah now they all just get, now they all just get recycled or or, or just in a skip. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know exactly. They should hold happens. on them for 20 years. They become retro. They're worth more. Well, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So I, I don't know the exact uh, costs and, and I'm happy not to, to be honest. Because I think oh, I would, know. I think my head would explode. I, honestly, I, I, I see how stressful it is for Jonas. <laughs> Very <laughs> I, depressing. I don't want any of that. <laughs> I know. But, um, oh. but yeah. So, so yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Mm-hmm. Any other questions on the panel? I haven't seen any in the chat here. Except that Tom Eric Gunderson, who's from uh, Europe, mentions a combined dragon cocoa attic, maybe. Cover them both at once. Maybe. Maybe. Mm-hmm. All right. The whole family. Throwing an MC10 and Alice in there, too. Oh, my question. It's something like that you could probably do because, right, it follows the same 60 page structure, the Amstrad addict. And that featured, again, a little bit of what had gone on previously and then also uh, any new projects from, say, the last few years on either games or hardware. And there was also an interview with uh, Alan Sugar as well, um, which was amazing, you know, that when, when I saw that because uh, David, a guy called David Crooks, pulled that one together. So you never know. I think... Um, by by coming on and seeing things like this, you see how big the scene actually is, mm. you know. And like you say, with by choosing maybe a couple of systems, you know, and like, but obviously it linked as a family of systems. That's like yeah. one of the options. 
you know. But that's just it. I think you've always got to be looking forward and how can you be better? Because otherwise, it it's just so easy in anything, isn't it? If you make a couple of bad choices, you know, you can easily really screw everything up and stuff like that, you know. Um, and again, like I say, when I'm choosing a cover story, I don't want to just do the stories people know because people are going to go, I'm not going to read eight pages on, I don't know, Street Fighter 2 because all the stories being told, for example, you know. But for example, like, I've got, um, we're doing a new Broken Sword remaster and like, there's only going to be so many new questions you can answer on that, but it still gets my interest, you know. So it's like, oh, wow, uh, uh, you know, a remaster of a favourite game. So there's, it, it's just loads going on, you know, guys. Really, really um, is. As as Frank says in the chat as well, um, advertisers do help too, and uh, there's there's a retro rewind <laughs> in, well, the, in the latest Amiga Addicts. Just, that, to, that, yeah, just to sign that in. He's one of our sponsors too, and also a Coco Fest sponsor. So. <laughs> that that Stuntman Good. Seymour, Good. Um, that was an unreleased Amiga game. We were down at a Spectrum show last November, and... Um, the, the, we did a page interview with this guy called uh, Ash Hogg, who was a programmer. And he came to, he went over to a guy called Frank Gasking, who does Games That Weren't, which has got a fantastic book and website. And he's always uncovering um, unreleased games. And Ash goes up to him with this three and a half inch floppy. He just goes like into his coat. There you go. This is for you. And I am, um, me being a nosy git, just went, whoa, 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 what's that? He goes, it's the game I worked on back in the 90s and it never came out. I went, oh, you've got to show it us. Can we take a picture of the disc? Just saying Stuntman <laughs> Seymour. And then when um, when the game was obviously released, you know, just as a free download, Ian goes, I'm going to interview, uh, I'm going to review it. I went, right, I'm going to interview Ash. I want to do um, a quick interview and give some insight into what why it didn't come out and things like that. And then also I spoke to Frank, who was kind enough to let us use some of his uh, pictures from his website as well. Um, and then also on Pixel Addict this month, there was a game Stunt um, Stunt Race uh, Stunt Racer Pro. If anyone remembers the uh, Stunt Racer Jeff Crammon uh, game. Stunt oh, Racer Pro was due to come out on PS2 and original Xbox, but it was canned. And um that gets a brief uh brief mention. So again yeah. we, we we've had a few of those too. We've actually had games that were lost. The old, the author only had a videotape of it playing for his kids. And he lost the code, so he rewrote it from scratch and sold it. Oh wow. So. See, that's a good story. That's yeah. what you want. It's like I'm it's... telling you, a Tandy Coco issue. That'd be awesome. That's a, we could fill it up. I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Oh no, no. <laughs> Something and then, anyway. And then we'd have to ship it over as a massive bulk. Collab. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, bulk buy yeah. a you know a few hundred for the show here. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> hmm. I wonder if that's possible for next year. Anyway, sorry. I've got yeah, like. Thinking. Thank you, honestly, everyone, for questions and stuff. As you okay. can see, I don't have any more questions. Does anybody else have any questions? I didn't see any in the chat, really. Besides the one I mentioned already. What's that one? Can they can they shut up now? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Mark, you're muted. He's fine. He's been here for a bit. Talking to my wife. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. I thought you were talking to us. No problem. Oh. All okay, right, so we'll postpone the news till next week because. Uh, I would probably go for hours on that. So <laughs> <laughs> now we've skipped the news. Hounds, we've skipped the news interviews before. That's not a big deal. Who invited the you know British guys on just to chat? I'm so well, sorry. it's it's also the fact that if you have more than one interview guest on at once, ten they tend to go longer because everybody needs to say something, right? So we've had sometimes yeah. where like the image producers, I think, was a fairly long one, and the dragon special, we're interviewing a bunch of dragon people. That was a six-hour show by itself, and we skipped everything else. It was just talking to them for six hours. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. I feel better so, now. There. <laughs> Thank you. Feel better. I'm not going to go home. I'm not going to go to bed in a couple of hours and just go, well, God, I feel so bad. You well, know, well, no, well, last week we had a six hour show and we did not have a guest. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Not a thing I can remember. Six hours. <laughs> did you guys already do your show and tell? Stuff like I say, show yeah, and tell, we did that at the beginning. Projects. We did that. We did the yeah. game challenge. We did gaming news. We did uh, at least a little bit of news, but uh, 
I'll save yeah. the hardware and software stuff. I was listening to that I'm, while I was I'm walking gonna, around I'm the gonna, local um, grocery store. <laughs> probably in the next couple of nights, I'll rewatch the um, projects and stuff. You know, I, I'm I, I'm a fan of that already. Definitely. Yeah. And I'll plug right. for Ian and me. We're gonna both be on. I'm assuming you're still you're on the Amigos uh, ICC this next. Uh, uh, I think Run. so, unless I'm at some event that of selling magazines. I don't know. <laughs> I can never keep which, track. Which date? <laughs> 22nd? 20th, I think, of April, isn't it? 20th of April. You're not doing Oxford, are you? We, 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 no. I think Jonah's so. doing Oxford and James. If he can make it. He, yeah, but that's, he, that's might, he might have double booked himself. <laughs> Oxford market. And, You're and not it doing like, it. I know that. And it looks like you already have one advertiser committed for the uh, Tandy Addict. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, yeah, Fra that. Frank oh, from yeah. Retro Rewind. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Ooh, Three sales. Good. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, that's just it. Now you got us like thinking. This is like when you you mentioned the dragon the other day. I'm like, uh Yeah, the like, dragon. Anyway, I mean, the dragon was one of the best selling computers in the UK during its first full year, really. And make yeah. 82, 83. It was up there with the C64, the Spectrum. They were trading places for first. If you look through the old year computer charts. So what 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 went wrong? Like, was it just a case of then Commodore and Sinclair just going, no, like we've had enough and really pumping money into it or something? Or? Um, I think there was some of that. There was also the fact they kind of Osborne themselves because after the Dragon 64 or after the Dragon 32 sold so well, they decided to keep manufacturing it at Christmas levels and then announced the Dragon 64, Ooh. which was a few months later. So it kind of, I'm Karen and them could probably give me a lot better, uh, you know, details of it. Cause of course they were there when this all happened, but from reading about it afterwards. Hmm. But between the two, I mean, the, the Dragon 32, the Dragon 64, and the Dragon 200, when your heart in Spain took it over, they sold over half a million. So, you know, mm. it's not bad for the 82 to 84 time period. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Then there's the Tano Dragons, too. Mark Siegel yeah, said sort of the year about the Deluxe, Nightmare. Coco. <laughs> yeah, that's what we've been delving into a lot because uh, a prototype showed up with advanced Microsoft, advanced color basic ROMs that nobody had seen before since 84 type thing. So we've been covering that a fair bit lately, and I'm one of the guys helping to assemble the ROMs, so. See, so we're going back 40 years and learning new stuff and seeing things for the first time. See, this is yep. why it's right. so important and exciting. Yep. Some of the games on my game site are stuff that authors have said, like I've, I've got a hold of them. I did a little you know, email in with them 20 years ago. And I said, do you have any of these games? There's a couple of years I'm missing in my unpowered collection here that you know I, I don't have. <laughs> and then they go, actually, I've got a few really unreleased ones. I submitted them to publishers and they didn't want it. So I've got a few of those that you want too. So sure. <laughs> and then, mm. you know, there's a few that have been published, you know, for free since then by the original authors. Even source code for some of the games I've gotten that I put up on the website. So it's good. I mean, look, you know, you what well, well, like 40s, 50s, you know, uh, uh, maybe 60s. I don't know. It's like and these new things and it gets you so giddy to see something brand new and if you're not into this scene at all you know you turn like the average man on the street or whatever and just go oh my god this is being released i found and we'll be like what are you on about but then <laughs> this is why i like <laughs> the you know retro computing retro gaming chats because obviously when you're with like you know the, the fellow collectors and you know tinkerers and you're like Oh my God! You found what? Oh, it's it's so exciting. But then yep. you still get people who go, "Bloody hell! You still use computers? Why are you doing that?" You know. I think it's good to do everything on your phone. It's, it's and I know, but a, a lot of a lot of the interesting stuff from a from a, a computing perspective is is where people are taking, especially people as a lot of us are techie people that have gone right. Here's 40 years of uh, development in coding standards and and uh, and electronic standards and, and how we put things together. Now let's go back and apply that to the 40 year old technology and and uh, and make something great. Um, I, I think um, it's it's not just it's not just going back and saying, oh, here's a thing I found from 40 years ago. <laughs> it's being able to go. Let's use what we've learned in the meantime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Make something new. That, I'll, that I'll give you an example. Like Henry, who's stuff. only recently joined our show as a regular panelist, is actually working on a project on his YouTube channel, uh, The Brick Key, where he's basically programming a new ROM for the Coco that will contain the fourth language, if you remember, the Jupiter Ace. Yep. Uh, that's going to be built okay. in, but using more modern programming techniques and stuff too. So that'll be the native language if you boot up with this ROM. 
Nice. Right. Language oh, slash right. operating system. It's it's just the, all the things that oh, you can wow. do like this. Right. And I have the Coco Ethernet card, so that's oh, there you go. That's something you wouldn't have seen on a Coco. Exactly. And and that's that's the amazing thing about the retro community, I think, in, in general. Yeah. Just no, but yeah. we've said it before with the Amiga, you know, people are like looking at new bits of kit to expand, you know, what it can do and everything. And it's just, it's amazing. But I, again, I know I said it earlier, but there's so much talent out there. There really, really is. And that helps us bring the magazines. That helps us bring our YouTube channels, podcasts, whatever. There's there's information to share. And all it's going to take is a few people to obviously latch on to that to whatever projects are going on, just go, do you know what? This is actually quite interesting. Because again, I'm learning stuff all the time. Yeah. That, that's what keeps us in this hobby, I think, is you're constantly learning stuff. It yeah. can be learning stuff that you wish you'd learned years ago that applies to stuff back then. It's stuff you've learned now and can apply to the, the technology, et cetera. So it's... Well, it's uh, if you're time. not doing a hobby you to to learn something or to, you know, you know, sell Sorry. this part of it too, but, you know, like, why, why bother? You know, type yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, I sadly I don't have room for my games room anymore since Child Two came along, you know, a few <laughs> years ago. It's not so right. hence just doing this in front room tonight. But I, I, it ten years ago, when I was just getting back into the retro scene, but it was more on the console gaming. If it had gone straight back onto the Amiga, say ten years ago, I think then pre uh, pre children, yeah, pre kids even, um, you know, I'd be probably going. Well, let's just try something new and tinker with this and try and you know i don't know get into all the different ways of you know running the software on a actual amiga hardware because i've got an amiga 500 you know with um the um oh god we covered it anyway you know with like an sd card in i can't remember yeah. what which uh version yeah. it is our cool sdc is like the that kind of thing, thing. Yeah, yeah yeah you know but you still got the original shell and stuff and then, like I say, we have to see things like via Go Drive and stuff that we featured. I could go, yeah, I know how to do this now because I listen to people like Ian most days and don't stuff. Listen to me. No, don't listen to you. Okay. <laughs> oh no. So that's why the house burnt down. Um, you, got, you got things like uh, this is a, a flip box for the Amiga and and other yeah, systems, we I believe, that, didn't we? A for bit for uh, a little bit, yeah. For um, yeah, we've your... been covering the blue SCSI and stuff there too, because that applies yeah. to maybe the SCSI controllers on the Coco or the MM1, some of the sequels to the yeah. Coco that came out back in the night. Was 90s. that last week? I'm sure that rings a bell. Uh, last uh, week and this week, we talked about it a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm uh, even, oh God, if it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but last week someone was asking, going, like, what's that little hole for? It's like, oh, so it's just so you can just obviously get your screw in and then you've got the connector here, there, everywhere. And I went, Again, like I said before, going, ah, I understand that. And I can picture roughly where it'd go. Because <laughs> now when you start seeing some systems open, you go, oh, yeah, I, you know, it's making sense slowly. But yeah. I don't know. I, I just need to go to a compute museum now. But I've got too many games events coming up to uh, to sell at and stuff like yeah, that. So I can't get too many, <laughs> um, you know, uh, weekend passes, we'll say. <laughs> <laughs> That reminds me, I copied those uh, links that Tom sent before they lose it if they the call in. <laughs> so I got them quick here. Oh, I'm glad Tom was on. It's it's crazy, though. I've spoke to him on the phone so many times for so many hours, as you can no doubt imagine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's just great. It really is. Curtis, did you see uh, Did you see Sixie's comment about uh, Dragon coverage? Uh, which chat. one? Uh, to be honest, dragon coverage fell away when the dragon user went surprise subs only. But a journal oh, wow. used my okay. lack of knowledge and opinion to publish their own idea of what happened to dragon. I might see um, over again. Uh, it's going to sound like an advert again for Northwest Compute Museum. But one thing that I love, and they've got like a ton of um, donated magazines. So I've seen things like loads of Amiga format, loads of bike magazines, input and stuff like that. So I think next time I'm there, because you've got a little cafe area, so I can go, right, I'm going to go and get a magazine and have a flick through, you know, because you've got just thousands, you know. Um, there was also, but like this was going about six months ago, there was a guy who, called Cliff Ramshaw, he worked um, on Amiga Shopper. Now, he's been at Pixar working there for years and quite high up. 
and um, he wrote this programming book for, I think, the Commodore 64 back in about 83 with his brother, 83, 84. And I took a picture of it. I went, Cliff, is this your book? He went, Jesus, yeah, I was like 17, 18 when I wrote that. <laughs> and I was like, that's insane that I've just found it on the shelf, you know. So like the shelving behind you, Curtis, is just full of magazines and books. And I just go in there and go, brilliant. And if you want to, you can buy them, you know. And they just say, like, make us an offer, a couple of quid an issue or whatever. But I've no more. Yeah, that's cool. Most most people here will hoard their magazines, including me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, I like it. But no, I'm going to look out for some of that Dragon User magazine. Because I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, I got that... one now. Actually, one of the Amigos guys actually brought down to me at the last Load Fest, which I think I showed you in the, oh, yeah. the private tool. Yeah. I actually have an issue of Dragon User. Most of my stuff's Rainbow, Hot Cocoa, Color Computer Magazine, yeah, yeah. Color Computer yeah. News, Metamorphosis. There's a whole bunch of them. Yeah. See, I like that, though, when you can just go, right, I've got my main collection, main focus. So I was like, my Super Nintendo magazines, and now I've branched out to a lot more Amiga. But then every so often, I still pick up the odd magazine I've never heard of. So, like, I picked up this one called Video Games Shopper. It lasted about three issues. So this is 1993, and on the cover, Video Game Wars, the Jaguar versus 3DO. And it was that weird time, the games consoles, where so many failed. But as a gamer, we were like, uh, as a teenager back then as well, you were like going, I need to see what the next technology jump's going to be. Who's going to win? Is it the CDI? Is it the 3DO? Is it the Jaguar? You know, is it the PlayStation when Sony enter, you know, the arena and the Saturn? And it was such an exciting time. So I've got this morbid curiosity reading magazines back from what 30 years ago now just to see we know how the history you know went but some of the stories and some of the articles are so positive and again going back to like the cd32 when you go it could have been so much more you know but if the companies run out of money so like um oh god who was it when you said um, the salt? Yeah, you, when you mentioned Tandy before, as soon as you get, you know, you close down part of your business and you're no longer actually manufacturing things yourself and you're outsourcing it and just looking at saving cash, it's almost, you know, the first big blow. You know, you're just knocking out a massive pillar of your company, you know, yeah. or giving a big slice of a cake to someone else to uh, look after the cake for you. And then they drop the cake on the floor and they you've not got any cake. Sorry, I, this <laughs> just descended to madness. I am. I, um, um, I had a great moment just the other day, actually. A, a chap contacted us via our Facebook, um, and it was not related to what the post was about at all. But he was um, looking for an issue of a magazine that his brother, who had recently passed away, did the cover art for, um, and he described it. it says it's got a, uh, it's digital art, and it's got a woman. Uh, with a yellow hat and yellow dress, and that was all he had. And it was maybe about he gave gave us some years, which turned out to be wrong. <laughs> but I thought, <laughs> right, this is a challenge. I can do this, and it transpired. It was it was an issue of a programming magazine called Transactor for the Amiga, which was originally a Commodore eight bit machine be uh, magazine mm -hmm. before that, and it was like volume three, issue one, or something like that. And I said, here it is. Here's a picture of it. Here's where you can go and get a PDF of it. And he was so grateful. And it's like, I have done my good deed for the day. <laughs> it, it was just I the way it came up. It, found it. It's just the way it came. It's like, I can definitely find this. I'm sure I can. So uh, so I did. And it was good. And, and plus, that was a US magazine as well. It yeah, wasn't it's even a Canadian, Canadian magazine, I believe, actually. Yeah. Uh, actually, speaking of PDFs, uh, there's a from uh, Grant Casey chasing it from YouTube in the chat here. It says, I just subscribed to your magazine. I can't wait to get the PDF. Okay, right. Right. well, <laughs> in the next couple of days, well, next day or so, I'm going to tell Jonah someone signed up to it because he <laughs> manually um, sends over PDFs. Yeah. So every, I'd probably say day, day and a half, he does basically just kick them through. Bit by bit, we are getting a bit more modern. Like we've just added rolling monthly subscriptions now because before we do a subscription, say for a year, or 12 issues, but we'd never really send out much of a reminder. There'd be like a line in the email going, oh, by the way, this is your last issue. <laughs> and I don't think we were 
not pushy. Um, that's probably the wrong language. But I think we we just went, oh, if people want to subscribe again, they will do. But then so many people went, oh, I wonder why I'm not adding issue for four or five, you know, because. Yeah, if you have busy lives with kids and stuff, you just forget that kind of stuff. Yeah. We've been too polite. You know? <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. But yeah, so that should well, get to you yeah. in the next couple of days. It is it is a holiday yeah. weekend over here at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Here in it's Canada. Easter. Yeah. Is it? Oh, excellent. Yeah. Oh. Well, it is Easter, I suppose. So yeah. It's probably holiday yeah. in a lot of places. Easter but, uh, but yeah. everywhere. Not but that yeah, Jonah ever holidays. takes holidays, so so he's probably yeah. he probably still find time to send it out. I know, there we go. And the clock's changing two hours over yeah, here. Yeah, you guys just changed tonight, I think. And oh, yeah, then, yeah, yeah, it's we all switched get... a few weeks ago. Two hours and nine minutes. And then, uh, yeah, we lose an hour of sleep. It, it'll change, like... I'm in the smart promise that doesn't change at all, so... Is it 1 a.m.? Uh, maybe. To be honest, if we're still on here at that point. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, God. Everyone, <laughs> everyone now on the panel is now crying. Um, please, God. <laughs> But no, it's 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 been nice coming on here. Sorry, that's good. Uh, it's, uh, what what do you cover now? No, no, I think we'll wrap the show up here. Actually, at the end of the interview, I'll just make it a double news issue uh, next next uh, cool. show. I'm okay. so sorry. Everyone. We ready for the outro then? No, no, no. Like I said, that's that's we've we've skipped the news before for uh, interviews. So, sorry, Mark. What was that? Ready for the outro? Yeah, I think so. Thank thanks to our guests for being on. Uh, definitely check out Pixel yes. Addict. The uh, issue nineteen is the Tanty issue. Yes, issue 19 is handy issue. It came out. And if you hit the website, week. Uh, you can order the PDF electronic version. If you want to pay a ton in shipping, you can actually order the physical magazine too. So <laughs> it is, I think, 10 pages so. on um, the Tandy. God, it's in there. Oh, there we go. I think it's 10 pages on it. So it's quite <laughs> it's quite a long article. And then well, it's a long history. I mean, kick- from being one of the Holy Trinity on till the 90s. Yeah, yeah. So. Definitely. Yeah, it's, it's nine pages. And then you've also got. History of 40 Years of King's Quest in there as well, um, which was quite a good piece. And then, yeah, you've also got like a little bit of computing stuff like what I mentioned before with uh, Roy. And then also a quick hardware review of the Atari 2600 Plus. And yeah, I've got to stop plugging. And other things. <laughs> But yeah, and, yeah. Much, and much, much more is what we're supposed yes, to say. Yes, as yeah. I meant to say. Yeah, you gotta leave that teaser in there. Don't don't give all I the know, right? Just much don't blow your load in all in one go. Otherwise, <laughs> we'll just get a dramatic reading of the entire issue. <laughs> don't. <laughs> don't tempt okay, me. Mark. Now I think I'm ready for an outro. <laughs> this concludes another episode of The Coco Nation, the world's leading live interactive talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. For all things The Coco Nation, visit us on the web at thecoconation.com. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback suggestions, even segments via email to show at thecoconation.com. The Coco Nation show would not exist without the community and its cast and crew. The Coco Nation theme song copyright 2022, D. Bruce Moore, mixed, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore. The Coco Nation is over. Join us on the Coco Discord server. Coco forever. Okay, uh, it's done. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I feel awful. Gosh, I just finished making them not feel guilty, and there you go, Mark. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Grind it oh. in. Yeah, in jokes. No, it's wow, the uh... Tuesday already. Oh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. as, we get, as we get older, the time gets uh, shorter. Yeah. Right. So, over in the audience, you can look forward to a double news segment next week. Oh, yes. yay, Curtis. Oh, yes, we want that <laughs> Another six-hour show. <laughs> yeah. Stay all? Listen, anyone who did stay all of my waffling, thank you. You know, I do appreciate it, you know. So thank you for having me on, seriously, Curtis. I really, really enjoyed it. It's been fun. Yeah, no, it was great having you guys on. I mean, it's it's rare to see physical computer magazines coming out at all anymore. Like I said, the newsstands here, there's just a few for the Mac and the PC, and that's it. Yeah. Right. But I can yeah. see. Maybe there's a few Linux ones still around, too. But uh, everything's kind of faded away. So it's really cool yeah. that you guys have actually made a success and said it's still going. And you've got two magazines now. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. crazy. I mean, back in, in the 90s, from a perspective, 
you could walk into a UK news agent and there would be eight different Amiga magazines right. to buy, which is you could support eight different magazines, which was just insane. insane. So it's it's just such a contrast between then and now. Yeah, so, we had I think five professionally, you know, glossy page ones in eighty three at the same time, plus some that were done on more plain paper because there was more small scale stuff, but still like hundred page magazines. There was yeah. several more of those. We were probably up around eight or nine at one point too. Yeah, yeah. I'm so, gonna have so. a look on um Internet Archive and see what um Coco stuff's on there. Oh, well. you if you want color, go to the Color Computer Archive. Their Internet yeah. Archive only has a partial snapshot. The Color Computer Archive has. It won't, not everything is find me the link in our chat if that's okay um, sure and then i won't lose it either sorry i know i sound like i'm bossing you around because there's scans of magazines in there and all kinds of stuff uh, yeah no no that's what i mean i'm it, it's got me interest you know yeah, he's, he's looking for some more magazines to fill his house, house up with so brilliant thank <laughs> you so much <laughs> i know fire hazard as yeah. my wife calls it right right <laughs> yeah if she only right. knew Okay, I am going to let you guys carry on. I'll say goodbye to yourselves. I'm going to go to bed, and tomorrow it's a bank holiday, and I'm not in work, which is good. Oh, Indeed. Of Dragon Archive as well. Okay. Oh. Yeah, there's a Dragon Archive. Uh, it's uh, hosted probably in the UK. It's the, a lot of the Dragon stuff. Yeah, they even so. have a forum there if you want to ask questions and stuff too. Huh? Like I said, there's link someone link. on Twitter called Here Be Dragons, and I know that he does some That's... stuff. I can't think of his real name, but he's wrote in issue one or issue two of a Pixel Addict as well. You know, what's Dragon? Oh, yeah, I did. I even covered that at the time. What the heck was his name? I don't care. I'm not going to issue one next to me at the moment. But yeah, I'm sure it's in one or two anyway. You know, but yeah, I've, <laughs> this, this is why we do it. We want to learn new stuff. I've said that, I know, but yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. All right. How about uh, I don't. I'm going to stop apologizing. I'm going to go and get a beer, and then I'm going to go to bed and lose an hour's sleep. But it means yeah. spring is here. It's coming. The sunny days. We can go out hopefully, and it's going to stop raining. Like it's I was going to say, in Britain there are no sunny days. I know. I know. <laughs> Right, and we will be obviously in Birmingham, and we can tell people that we need to get the Tandy issue, you know, in in Birmingham, and then we'll go. Is it all about the shop? And we'll say no, but read the interview, and uh, you know, all about it. Right. Anyway, thank you guys. Oh, Tom just said it was uh, Tony. So Tony Jewell, I'm guessing, is the person. Yes. About the... Yes, that's it. Yeah. yeah. There you go. He's he's active in the uh, Dragon Facebook group, which actually yeah. is a pretty booming group. So. Yeah. So okay, it, how you? about we say we'll see you all next week? Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.